Wednesday, November 27th, 1901. I was supposed to go hunting today. I had my satchel packed last night and plenty of spare ammunition waiting by my boots at the door. But when I awoke at dawn today, I couldn't find Duke or Nemo anywhere. When I say they're the best dogs money can buy, I'm not exaggerating by any margin. So when they didn't come for my call, my curiosity was piqued to say the least, and more accurately, I was worried. I'll be damned if I'm going to lose a small fortune on a couple of beasts. Herbert, I shouted. My boots echoed on the hard wood as I paced impatiently through the upper floor of the manor. Herbert, you find my dogs now or it's your hide. The dogs are just at the forest, Mr. Piercy. What? I stopped at the bottom of the staircase, looking out the bay window over the steep drop at the roof and into the dusty orange tree line where the sun was just starting to rise. There they were, just as Herbert promised, hovering over what looked like an injured doe. They were nuzzling it, lying next to it, keeping it warm. What were two bull mastiffs doing keeping a sick doe warm? Why are you standing around? Fetch my dogs now! Mr. Piercy, every time I've gotten near them this morning, they've started baring their fangs, and if you don't mind me saying, I'd like to keep all my fingers. Maybe it's best if you go try them. Maybe it's best if you're out of a job by Christmas, I shouted, stomping down the stairs. I grumbled to myself, making me do the work of a frickin' stable hand. I slammed the door behind me as I walked outside into the dewy morning. My breath formed a small, warm cloud that hovered just over my lips as I walked the half mile to the tree line. As I approached the dogs, they didn't stir. Not Duke, not Nemo, not even the frail little creature they were protecting. They were protecting it, weren't they? The closer I got, the stranger the lump beneath my dogs began to look. The fur melted into the pile of golden leaves, as if it was just a pelt blanket and the body filled a perfect knot in the roots of the tree. My breath caught in my throat as I saw that it was a young woman and that my dogs had been licking blood off of her face. Had she been dead? No, probably not. Nemo would surely be eating her by now, wouldn't he? After wetting his appetite with all that blood? She was beautiful, absolutely beautiful, and naked as far as I could tell. I knelt down in the leaves next to her, wrapping one arm around Duke to steady myself and pulling the pelt down over her breasts. Indeed, she was naked. I stared at her chest for a bit, only to see if she was still breathing, or to see if her skin puckered at the stimulation of the crisp November air. Nothing else, of course. I didn't touch her. I just watched. The only way I could finally tell that she was breathing was the way the nest of her tawny hair pulsed around her open lips. I brushed the hair from her face and still, she didn't move. She didn't even flutter her eyes. I don't know what color her eyes even were. She was out cold and I wondered how long she had been in my woods. Does she live on my property illegally? Does she poach on my property illegally? Does she just walk here sometimes? Naked? At night? That can't be right. Does she have a father? A husband that I should be worried about? Herbert! I shouted as loudly as I could. I hoped my voice echoed into Mr. Frickin' Elwood's property. Herbert, get your crippled A down here with the wheelbarrow! I didn't hear the uneven hobble of his lame legs running yet. 
I have an unconscious girl at the edge of my woods. I wrapped the pelt tight around the girl's fragile body and carefully cradled her in my arms. She was so light, lighter than either of my dogs, and I carried her to the house. The dogs followed underfoot and barked as Herbert greeted us with the wheelbarrow at the front door. I needed that for the yard, you lazy son of a bee, not to carry her up the stairs. Took me some time to locate it, Mr. Piercy. Only Mrs. Lenore ever cared about the garden and landscaping. Are you just going to stand there or are you going to help me out? Go draw a bath or something. At that, Herbert dropped the wheelbarrow and rushed upstairs. I heard the creak of the water tank as I took the girl upstairs and into the grand bathroom. I, I don't know if this is proper, Herbert murmured, averting his eyes, as I slipped her naked body into the water that was filling the space around her, the brass of the tub coloring a slightly more copper as the blood rinsed off. We should leave this to someone more equipped. Who, Mrs. Eleanor? I don't think she's coming back from the dead just for this, Herbert. And the doctor is three days' journey from here. So if this is wounding your beau mund decorum, just frickin' leave the room. I don't know some of the words that you just said, Mr. Piercy, but I perceive they were meant to ruffle me. Just get some towels, I growled. And he left the room. I picked up the fur pelt that had been discarded on the floor and investigated it as the bath filled. It looked like an ancient fox fur. At least I think it was fox. The pattern didn't match any game I had seen in my woods perfectly, but looked familiar all the same. There were patches where the hair no longer clung to the leather, as if it had been worn for years at a time. I leaned over the tub, the water line, lining just the center of her chest, dipping my hand into the water. At first, I created ripples, splashing against her skin, seeing if she would stir. She didn't. I cradled her neck in my hand, keeping her mouth from submerging. I ran my other hand down the length of her body. There had been so much blood, I had to check for wounds. I slowly let her head sink under the water. She's slipping! Herbert threw the towels on the ground as he ran into the room. Duke followed closely behind, barking. I'm washing the sticks out of her hair, you lunatic! I propped her head back onto the lip of the tub. Look at you! You've spoiled the towels! Herbert kept a close eye on her for the rest of the day taking her to Eleanor's room and locking it from the outside. Of course I have a house key, but I'll let the girl rest for now. Besides, Duke had been growling at me every time I even linger outside the door. Sunday, December 1st, 1901. She opened her eyes for the first time today, and it turns out they are a gilded shade of amber. This morning, my dogs have been reduced to whimpering haunches and crying heaps in front of the door to her room. I took my key and I creaked open the door and Duke sieged the opening with his great square skull, thrusting his way into the room and jumping onto the foot of the bed. That's when I saw the girl's eyes flutter open and her eyes were amber. I walked over to the bedside and looked down at her. Her eyes seemed to register me while they flitted about the room. My pelt. Her eyes closed again, but her voice had been in a drowsy panic. I looked down to see her fist was balled around Duke's ear and Duke curled into the girl's side, letting a loud huffing sound as if he was sighing with relief. I sat down on the other side of the girl and brushed my knuckles across her cheek. She pulled away in her fever dream and her lips quivered ever so slightly. Her face was flushed and her forehead had accumulated sweat from the days of bed rest. She smelled like pine trees and woman, 
I raked my hand down her throat, stopping to examine if the superficial scrapes had been healing, reading the valleys of the scabs like braille as I moved my hands down her chest. I rolled the duvet down to her waist, careful not to disturb Duke, who lay lethargically by her side. She was wearing Eleanor's nightgown. Good one, Eleanor, I thought to myself. Even after death, you still managed to have my cock under lock and key. I wrapped my hand around her pretty little throat. I could do it with one hand. Not like that fat woman, Eleanor. My other hand moved to unfasten my trousers, but there was a knock at the door. I would have jumped had I not known it was just Herbert. Mr. Piercy, Mr. Elward was wanting you to accompany him to the churchyard. I'll be down in a minute, Herbert. I'll tell him. I stood up, straightened my vest, and locked the door from the outside. Thursday. December 12th, 1901. Alone in the room, making my way towards her, I reached the bed. Then, to my surprise, her two golden eyes stared up at me with utter disgust. What's your name then? Alice. I heard her breath hitch and watched as her body lurched forward. This was going to be fun. Alice... That's a pretty name. You should really let me go. For the first time since I had met her, she stood up. She wasn't as short as I had expected, but her shoulders were still quite narrow. I think she was trying to be intimidating. They will come looking for me. Who will? Because it's been a fortnight and no one's come looking for you. They haven't noticed I'm missing yet. They'll notice soon. Of course, I shrugged, adjusting my suspenders on my shoulders. Well, while they're busy noticing, I'm sure as hell enjoying having you around. I took three quick steps to her and smiled. I pulled on her tongue like I do to Nemo when he's misbehaving. As I pressed my fingers against her teeth, she recoiled, pulling her head back and slightly pushing my hand away. I can't fight back. Oh, come on. You could do better than that. I mimicked her, pawing my hand away. Fight me, I growled. Use your teeth and your claws to fight me. You might even enjoy it. I tried to goad her, but she just stared at me with dead eyes and mumbled to herself. Hell for one night or a lifetime if I fight. I grabbed her by the throat my fingers overlapping the bruises I had been leaving. What the F does that mean? She said nothing. I asked you a question. What the F does that mean? I tossed her towards the dresser and her face ricocheted back. I could hear my dogs barking from outside the windows. You should let me go. She smiled, blood trickling onto her teeth in a river from her nose. I promise you, nothing good will come if you keep me here. She spat some of the blood onto her palm and wiped it on the balding patches of her pelt. Crazy whore. Tuesday, December 24th, 1901. I'm sitting here, hauled up in my study, everything brandy in hand to ring in Christmas and looking at your portrait. I can't help but think this shit is your fault, Eleanor. You fat cow. You didn't even look pretty in that painting. I paid for a frickin' painter from Spain and you still look like a hag. Alice is stranger than I had originally assessed. Or at least, she's very clever. Or there's a conspiracy against me. I don't know, really. But I'm looking at you and I can't help but think this is all your fault. Do you know what she said to me this morning? She said that she could smell the strychnine all over the bed sheets. You understand why that's strange? It's odorless. That's sort of the entire point. So first, she poaches on my land. 
Then she turns my expensive hunting dogs into fat, lazy lap dogs. And finally, she accuses me of murdering my wife and tells me she could smell the poison. We have a very grateful house guest. Merry Christmas, love. The clock just struck midnight. I guess they don't have a white Christmas in hell, but know that it's lovely here. The woods look beautiful. Of course, you being absent makes the view all the more splendid, but let's not fight. Mr. Piercy. I heard a whisper from the hallway as the snow dampened every sound in the way that only snow can. I took a deep swig of my brandy and carefully placed the glass back on my desk. I moved to the door quietly and deadbolted the lock, throwing a chair in front of the handles, bracing them from swaying inward. Alice? I asked. My lips brushing the crack between the doors where a silver of golden light trickled out. How did you get out? Mr. Herbert let me out, she mumbled. I watched her as her silhouette seemed to drunkenly stumble down the hallway towards me. When she slammed her body against the doors, they shuddered, and I saw that she was once again naked. It turns out he doesn't like you very much. I laughed, pulling away from the door sharply and pacing back to my brandy. Maybe that's why he used to mess with my wife. I spat the words up at Eleanor's portrait and raised my glass again. Alice whimpered from behind the door as she rolled her body across the wooden surface. Maybe, she cooed. It may have nothing to do with another man. Let me guess. I kicked my boots up on the desk in rhythm with the clock striking the final chime of midnight. You could smell that in my bed sheets too? As a matter of fact, I can. I could hear that she was smiling. It was the way her voice stretched. You can't smell hate, I snarled through clenched teeth. And you can't smell strychnine either. The crap never even got onto the bed. I don't know how you know about any of this, but it never touched the bed, I repeated. I hit it with my gunpowder. I waited for a plague to come to this town. I waited for years for the people to start dropping from brain fevers and the muscle spasms. Years, I shouted. And do you know what I did? I soaked her pretty little handkerchief in it so when she dried her delicate frickin' eyes at church. I stared again at Eleanor's painting, brow kirked into a cocky smile. The same horrible illness befell my poor wife. I took another sip of brandy and heard my dogs began to bark downstairs. Of course... I continued. The groundskeeper also fell victim to the same disease. I alone remained healthy. It was a miracle, you understand. I laughed, pouring myself another glass. Another miracle that Herbert survived the frickin' poison. Defiant a little prick can't even die right. He lived through it. Sure, he's a little worse for wear now. He's dumb and his legs don't work, but a perfectly timed epidemic isn't an excuse you get to use twice. So I'm stuck with a simple-minded, crippled, cock manservant. At this point, my voice was raised as I tried to combat the volume of my dogs downstairs. I guess Herbert knows all of this though, right? That's how he told you? That's why you've been tormenting me? I heard a low, throaty giggle and a rhythmic tapping of fingernails on the door. Herbert doesn't know. Like I said, I could smell the strychnine. I paused and turned towards my window. I could hear Duke howling now. We're very intimate with that scent of strychnine, Alice said, scraping her nails against the door. Especially in these woods. The coyotes hunt the hare. So you poison the coyotes. You've been poisoning the meat, Mr. Piercy, and I can't say we're very pleased. The hair on the back of my neck began to stand up straight and my chest felt heavy. I tried to laugh the feeling away. Is this the same we who is supposed to rescue you? Yes. 
The voice that came through the other side of the study doors was not a voice, but a deep, rickety growl. My dogs fell silent, and their barks were replaced with the sounds of, like, splintering bones. I jumped up to look out the window, and saw shadows moving in the tree line. Shadows silhouetted by a moon recently risen over the snowy horizon. What are you going to do, Mr. Piercy? She asked in a gravely snarl. Are you going to jump out the window? You'll slip and fall. You can't go into the woods. We're all out there. You'll never outrun them on broken ankles. I could hear her pacing on the other side like an animal. You could fight me. You could use your teeth and your claws and fight me. You might even enjoy it. She was mocking me as I had mocked her, and she began throwing her weight up into the door. She sounded heavier. You know why I didn't fight back, she asked, clawing through the wood, the door slowly fracturing under the crashing of her body. If I bite you, she said, if I claw you, you'll be one of us. The hallway was still dark, but a crack in the door was forming. She was breaking it down. I caught a glimpse of what looked like her pelt, but remembered she had been naked just moments before. I heard more howling coming from outside. Here I am, in my study, with the portrait of my dead wife watching me. I'm going to die on Christmas, aren't I? I freaking hate Christmas. Of all the ways I thought I was going to die, being mauled by werewolves on Christmas morning was not one of them. Living in Colorado as an avid snowboarder, you would probably think everything is nice for me being around some of the best resorts on the planet. My main problem I hated those places. They're overcrowded, overpriced, and frankly, not very fun. I always preferred the mid-sized ski areas that are a bit more off the average person's radar. These places with better value, crowds, and in my opinion, terrain, can be a hidden gem amongst the competition. Other times, there's more to the story about why these places are left more undisturbed. It was 2011. The snowfall we had that season was quite mediocre. None of the ski areas anywhere seemed to be getting snow. The base depth at all of them were less than two feet, and it was already December. Browsing through some snow reports one day, I found an interesting little ski area that had nearly twice the snow versus everywhere else. A little place called Wolf Creek. It was astounding. Everyone else had less than two feet, and here was the ski area with over four feet of snow. I naturally got a bit excited and decided to look a bit more into the ski area. The trail maps I found on the website looked promising. It was small, but it seemed to have a lot of different terrain. The area seemed to be split down the middle in terms of what it offered. The northern half all had the basic runs, and the southern half was almost more of a backcountry style area, with just one chair and a majority of the runs requiring a decent hike. Overall, it looked quite promising and would be a fun place to visit. I asked my roommate Dalton if he wanted to come with me over the weekend. No way, man. Not going there. Why not? I asked. You want to have fun with the wolf man? Go ahead. Quit trying to scare me and tell me why you don't like it. My friend went there a few years back and swore he saw this massive black creature lumbering through the trees off one of the runs. You know, I think I've seen them too. They're called bears. I laughed back. No, he said it was definitely not a bear. He claimed it almost looked like some sort of... It's hard to explain. 
What, a werewolf? I joked. It's not really that. He just called it a wolfman because of where he was. I won't go, and that's final. Not wanting to go to Wolf Creek by myself. I'm not scared. It's just more entertaining with the group. I decided to call up my friends Spencer and Christian. They empathetically said yes before I even finished asking. That Friday, I loaded my gear into my truck, picked up Spencer and Christian, and drove down south to Wolf Creek. It was a bit out of the way, four hours away from where we lived, not near any really major towns, off the highway a bit in a desolate area. Slightly unnerving, but nothing major. Most of these desolate places are a bit away from civilization. We got our lift tickets and began messing around the northern half. The other parts could wait a bit. We breezed through a lot of the runs in about two hours thanks to the low crowds. I split off from Christian and Spencer for a bit to play around on one of the shorter runs. Just a little blue run called Ka that met up with the original trail further down. It was an undulating run with a lot of dips. Executed correctly, most of these bumps could yield a little air. Naturally, I was enjoying these jumps and almost didn't see the mess in the trees near the end of the run. I only noticed because some of the snow where I landed was a pinkish tone that got darker as it moved into the trees. A rabbit's remains was messily strewn about several feet off the run. It was quite freaky, but I brushed it off. There are quite a few predators out here, so I assumed it was just a fox. That was until I looked a bit closer. All the meat from the rabbit had still been present. The rabbit had not been hunted for food. Something just eviscerated it for the sake of killing it. Maybe the fox had rabies and was starting to go insane. Or maybe it was... No, I won't go there. I didn't tell Spencer or Christian about the rabbit after we met back up. What would I tell them anyways? Hey guys, I just found this really creepy, disgusting thing in the woods that might be a sign of something really screwed up. Want to go back for another run? After messing around for a few hours, we decided to hit up the other half, the more extreme areas with the trees, cliffs, and whatnot. Not only that, less patrol and ski area atmosphere. I will say this area had some of the best ski area terrain I had ever experienced. The cliff drops were exhilarating. The tree runs were fantastic. One of the moments I truly felt alive. And then I found another one. This time, it was a skunk. Whereas the last one seemed like a fox or rather an animal had done it, this seemed like there was intent to it. The skunk's head was smashed in and it was sliced down the middle with its organs spilling from the cut. Christian and Spencer were with me this time, and they were truly disgusted. Only then did I tell them about the rabbit I'd found earlier. Okay, that's really twisted. What the hell do you think is doing this? Spencer asked. Christian began to reply with, Maybe it's the wolf ma- No, I shouted. We're not falling for this cryptology crap. Something's just messing with us. I told a few people I'd be here today. Maybe they're just trying to perpetuate this bull. I definitely didn't convince them, and I'm not quite sure I couldn't convince myself this was the truth. Christian offered a solution to try to get the skunk and rabbit from our minds. How about another run? He said he wanted to go to one of the most remote parts of the ski area, Horseshoe Bowl, which required a 45-minute hike from the chair. Spencer and I reluctantly agreed to go with him. The access gates to the terrain closed a few minutes after we got through, leaving us with about an hour or so of sunlight. We had to hike fast to get there before the sun set. Plus, with the crap we had been seeing today, I wouldn't want to be stuck here at night. 
While great on the board, I'm terribly slow at hiking, especially in deep snow and high altitude. Thus, the estimate 45-minute hike turned into an hour. The bowl was great, but I couldn't really appreciate it under the constraints we were facing. With the sunlight fading fast, we decided to try and cut through the trees at the bottom of the bowl to save some time. Naturally, we got a bit turned around in the trees. We had essentially lost our race with the sun, and our brilliant little shortcut totally backfired when we were plunged into near total darkness. The temperatures dropped way low, the winds started to pick up, almost howling. There was no other option, we had to find our way out before we froze to death. And let you tell me, trying to snowboard through the trees essentially blind becomes a lot more terrifying when it's a choice between that or dying. Christian was ahead when we saw him vanish. Well, I guess the darkness began playing illusions because he just went off a small cliff. Then Christian screamed. Strained, horrified, and blood-curdling. He was obviously terrified at something, but what? Spencer and I found Christian with his leg snapped. Guess he broke it from going off the cliff natural reaction to such an injury. But it was what I saw afterwards that made me realize why he was screaming so much. A deer, completely skinned, hanging from a branch, with its entrails removed and neatly lined up at the base of the cliff. Blood was smeared out onto the rock face, but the darkness prevented me from seeing if it was actual writing. I would have tried to analyze it more if the saplings nearby hadn't started shaking. We tried to calm Christian after we had heard the rustling. Whatever was out there, we couldn't afford to give it our location. The rustling got louder, and Christian began hyperventilating more and more. Fortunately, it was just a squirrel scampering around the trees. No big deal thought it would have been more like along the lines of. Snow began crunching. Heavy breathing became more audible. Whatever had been doing this had found us. We unstrapped our boards and tried to hustle down the hill. Carrying Christian while running for our lives in deep snow was a real burden, and the noises behind us started gaining. Closer and closer with every step, until I could feel it breathing down my neck. It struck with full force. A massive, deformed hand reached between me and Christian and flew me off my friends. The darkness prevented me from seeing the thing's details. So I can't really tell you about its appearance, other than it being massive, at least ten feet tall, roughly shaped like a disproportionate person mixed with who knows what kind of animal. I had to try to get it off my friends, so I hastily made a snowball and pegged the creature in the head. It wrenched its head around and stared at me with the most grotesque grin spreading across its face. Its face coming closer and closer to me until I could smell its wretched breath. I had gotten the creature's attention off my friends, but now it was fixed on me. Really wish I'd planned it through more. I tried inching back, but that set off the beast. It let out an insane cackle roar and attacked. I saw its massive fangs within inches of my face as its massive hand smashed onto my face. And then I woke up in a hospital bed, hooked up to all sorts of machinery. I guess the thing knocked me out, as I have no idea what happened after the blow. The doctors came in and told me what happened. Ski Patrol heard screams from the mountain and found you at the bottom of a cliff with a fractured skull and deep lacerations. They brought you here and we wasted no time. You've just come out of a massive reconstruction surgery to rebuild your skull. With the damage we repaired, it's extremely lucky you're alive. What happened to Spencer and Christian? I asked. 
Who? Ski Patrol only found you up there. There were no signs of anyone else in the area. What about the deer and the blood on the cliff? What about that thing? Calm yourself. Delusions can be a side effect of the anesthesia you're coming off of. With that, the doctor left. I still bear the scars from the surgery on my forehead, and I still have three cuts going diagonally across my abdomen. Spencer and Christian haven't been heard from, and repeated searches of the area have constantly yielded no promising results or leads. I can't think of my sacrifices in vain, and I can't give up on them. Whatever this wolfman is, it's probably still out there, and it's waiting for a new quarry. Keep track of yourself when you're in these places. You never know what's watching you. Howdy, y'all. Name's Earl. And I reckon it's about time I shared some truths that might just set your city folk minds a-spinning. Somebody's gotta do it eventually, so I figure why not have it be me. I'm a farmer. Born into it. Just like my pa and his pa before him. Now, his pa. Well, that no-good scoundrel was a sorry excuse for a man more interested in swigging booze and rolling them dice than any honest work. Lucky for us, my great-grand showed him the door, booted him right out to the curb, and kept this old farm plowing ahead till her last breath. Her hands, calloused and weathered from years of toil, had a tendency to whack my noggin whenever I dared to grumble while hunched over those fields, hoe in hand. Yet, I surely do miss that ordinary lady. I surely do. Our humble farms nestled right near the cusp of the great old forest, which stretches and stretches till it unravels into a swamp the further you venture in. Them science folk, they'll yap about how it's a unique stomping ground, untouched by man's paw for centuries. Well, I reckon they've done their fancy studying and all, so they are likely right. But let me tell you this. There's a whole lot of touching going on in them woods. And that's a bonafide fact. Yes, sir. I've even got a fair share of stories about getting cozy with the wild in them woods. Some that'll have your eyebrows shooting sky high. But that ain't what I'm aiming to put front and center in this piece of writing. Nah, sir. I'm here to crack open your noggin and pour in some honest-to-goodness truth. You know them stories floating round about them peculiar critters and oddities dwelling in the swamps and forests of our mighty fine country? Yeah, them ones. Well, I'm here to vouch they're as true as grits on a breakfast plate. I've laid eyes on them, except for Bigfoot, mind ya. That was just old Bob's buddy wrapped up in a fancy suit. And don't you dare call me a liar, cause I ain't one. Neither is my pa or my grandpa. They too laid eyes on them critters slipping around. My great grandpa, well, he's another story altogether. Folks say he spied something too, but more likely it was that sweet bourbon clouding his vision. Now, enough about that. Let's get to the nitty-gritty of what the heck's been brewing up around these parts. So get ready to be taken on a long journey through the pages of history. And for the sake of this tale, well, it is one Grandpa spun back when I was knee-high to a grasshopper, hanging on his shoulder as we strolled the farm checking the animals and fields. I can't give you the precise date, but what I do recall is that it was autumn. Cause earlier that day, we had been tending to the pumpkin patch, seeing them prize winners puffing up like champions just waiting to be plucked. We were moving towards the livestock, 
getting close to the goat's pen when a foul smell hit my nose. I tell ya, if it wasn't for the terror of my great-grandmother's fiery temper, I might have lost my lunch right onto my granddad's bald noggin. She was particularly nasty about wasting food, you see. Granddad must have caught a whiff of it too, no doubt, cause I remember him jerking to a halt, plopping me off his shoulders and onto the ground in a hurry. Before you start jumping to conclusions, let me tell you that I could vouch with all my heart that what hit my nose wasn't no stink of manure or siri. And before you start doubting my memory, let me tell you more. I could carry that smell in my mind like it's been branded there. So yeah, I know what I'm talking about. Picture this. You ever left a ripe melon out to bake under the sun till it splits wide open? That overpowering sweet stench enough to turn your stomach? Now imagine that, but with an undertone of death, like something rotting in the gutters. That's what was out there pestering my nose. We carried on slow and steady towards that pen, my granddad leading the way, his hand stretched out like a roadblock, signaling me to hold my horses. He was quieter than a mouse in church, not his usual self at all. I could have sworn I saw big fat beads of sweat clinging to his shiny noggin, glinting in the sun's gaze. We must have been just a handful of paces from the pen when he put the brakes on and told me to hang back and keep hush as a mute. He then continued towards that fence like a cat on the prowl, glanced over it, and let loose a stream of words that if my great ma heard, Lord help him, he'd be sitting on a hard seat for a good month. Then he swung his gaze my way, motioned me closer, and dropped down to my level. Earl, there's evil things roaming these cursed woods. You might be a youngin, but this land's gonna be yours one day. You'd best square up to that reality, he told me, his voice colder than a frozen pond, gripped tight on my shoulders. I didn't rightly know what to say, so I just gave a nod, my throat dry like a dust bowl, feeling the weight of it all on my shoulders like I had just been handed the keys to the kingdom. Put this round your mug, son. You don't want to be sucking in that air yonder. It's turned sour by now, he advised, pulling a red checkered scarf from his back pocket. Like the good, obedient boy I was, I did just that, hustling alongside my granddad as we slipped into that pen. But oh boy, even with that scarf clamped over my mug, that putrid stench knocked me for a loop, and a wave of bile surged right up my throat. Hush, Earl, it's gonna be all right. Granddad patted my back as I heaved my guts out. Please don't go telling Grandma, I begged, and that drew a chuckle from my grandpa. Still feeling my stomach doing somersaults, I took stock of the pen, and let me tell you, it was a pure nightmare. Every last goat in there had keeled over, dried to the bone like all their juices had been sucked right out of them. You got an inkling as to what might have done this boy? My grandpa asked, his eyes locked on me with steely seriousness that sent shivers down my spine. I of course didn't have the foggiest notion. So I just gave my head a little shake and got a gentle pat on the noggin for my trouble. Well, have you ever heard tell of them vampires? He asked, his voice turning all serious. It's something like that, but it ain't after folks. It just goes after critters. He explained in a solemn tone. Things like this crop up from time to time, but usually we don't lay eyes on them. Except I did once, about 30 years back. Back then, we didn't have no name for it. And even now, we can't be rightly sure what it is. It all went down on the final night of that year's summer. 
I was out on the porch taking a drag from my smoke when all of a sudden it got quiet as a grave. I thought it peculiar, but nothing to be fretting over. Until I saw something skipping across the grazing field. I didn't get a really good look at it, just that it was a big one. I mean real big, the size of a calf, and it moved faster than a scared cat on hot coals. It glided across that field, not making a peep, like it was floating above them blades of grass. Fetch me the rifle, woman! I hollered, jumping to my feet, my heart drumming in my chest as I traced through the critter's path, trying to figure out where the heck it was headed. Your grandma, she sprang up right beside me, handing me the rifle without so much as asking what it was for. I reckon she must have seen the color drain from my face. Because soon, as I had the rifle in hand, she scurried right back inside without uttering a word. It was one of them colossal moonlit nights. The kind you could see just about everything as clear as day. So, I could make out that the creature had sauntered right over to the cow barn. As I drew closer, a foul whiff hit my nostrils. The very same sickening smell we've got lingering here. I followed the stench, but it grew so potent, so quick, that I had to stuff a wad of tobacco up my nose just to keep from hurling my supper. I reckon that's how the critter incapacitates its prey. That musk, it must send them poor critters' minds drifting off into a fog while it goes about its nasty business. The barn door stood wide open, as it usually did on hot nights, to let some cool breeze in, you know? Nowadays, we used nets to keep the air flowing and the critters at bay, but back then, we didn't have such worries. We only started locking things up once this fiend began rearing its ugly head. Anyhow, I crept closer to that door, moving as quiet as a cat stalking its prey. Beyond it, there is nothing but pitch black darkness. I wasn't too keen on stepping inside, not when I couldn't see a blessed thing. So I grabbed a handful of straw, bundled it up, and set it ablaze to make myself a torch. At first glance, apart from that stomach churning stench, everything seemed normal. Darcy was standing there with her hind end towards me, not showing any sign of trouble. I let out a sigh of relief and started getting closer to the cow, just in case, you know. But as soon as I got a single step forward, two gleaming yellow eyes appeared right beside Darcy. I recoiled, stumbling backward, and landed square on my behind, dropping that makeshift torch of mine. Lucky for us, I cleaned the barn floor earlier that afternoon, cause otherwise, I reckon we would have been wrestling a big ol' fire. Still sitting there on the floor, I fumbled to aim the rifle at them malevolent eyes. My hands, however, were shaking like young saplings in a storm, so I couldn't get a clear aim. But desperation coursed through me, and desperate the blurry shot, I let it fly. Thank the stars I missed Darcy, but alas, I also missed that sinister critter, striking the barn wall behind it instead. Moonlight poured in, unveiling the evil malice that had been lurking in the shadows. It looked like a wolf, but bigger. A whole lot bigger. On its back, there sprouted a mane made of quills, black as night. Its mouth now, it had no teeth to speak of. Just two monstrous canines that reached clearly down to its chest. In that split second, it raised its head, unhinged its jaw wide open, wider than any regular creature oughta, like it could swallow you whole. I squeezed off another shot, and once again, I missed, but this time, that beast took off. At first, it dashed straight at me. And in that moment, I figured I was a goner. I tried to lift the rifle, but my hands were shaking something fierce. But the critter didn't pounce on me. No, sir. 
It darted right past me into the night, leaving me all alone, shivering and whimpering. Took me a spell to collect myself, to muster up enough gumption to haul myself back to my feet and go check on Darcy. That poor critter was still in a daze from what had gone down, her neck all crimson with blood spilling from two holes in her jugular. Sadly, the poor thing didn't make it through the night. She just keeled over, dead as a doornail, a couple of minutes after that critter took off. For about a month after that night, every other day, we'd find our livestock dead, every last one of them dry bone with two holes in their necks, spaced about five inches apart. And I'll bet you, if we were to check every single one of them goats, we'd find that same mark on all of them. We took the call in the critter, Quill Hound, and since then, no one else has laid eyes on it. But its presence, as you could plainly see, still hangs heavily around these parts. My grandfather said, giving my head another pat as he straightened himself up. He then got to work hauling all them dead goats into a pile, which he later set on fire. Them flames shot up quick as a wink like he had struck a match to some paper. And just as fast as they rose, they disappeared, leaving nothing behind but a few whispers of ash floating on the breeze. For the rest of the month, I remember watching my grandpa light them fires every so often, well aware of the reason behind it. At night, I'd perch to my bedroom window staring out at the field, hoping to lay eyes on that devilish fiend but luck never did favor me in that regard. After that, it happened again sporadically, sometimes with spans of over five years between, and other times just a few months apart. Heck, the last time it reared its head was about a good six years ago, so I figured the quill hound must be working up a powerful appetite. Any day now, it might just come a-knockin'. Any day now, you'll see. Now, my dear friends, don't you dare thinkin' we're done. Oh, no, sir. There ain't just the quill hound lurkin' around these parts. There's a whole mess of these cryptid creatures roamin' these lands, and I got a mind full of tales about them, so allow me to share another nugget with ya. The next tale I'm sharing with y'all today happened to my pa when he was about 15 years old. Now, earlier that day, he had had the audacity to roll his eyes at his grandma, and that had landed him a one-way ticket to cleaning out the drain hitch all by his lonesome. And let me tell you, that meant clearing out all them weeds, yanking out all the muck, widening the ditch, whatever needed, and even adding or replacing gravel for a ditch that stretched over a mile. This was during the scorching heat of summer, mind you and he didn't even have a mule to lend a hand hauling the tools and gravel around. That's a filthy job, one usually tackled by three folks, and as expected, after the sunset, he was still out there toiling away in the dirt. Thankfully, it was a well-lit night, not a single cloud in the sky, and the moon was shining brightly, even though it wasn't quite full yet. He made it to the last stretch of the ditch, the one leading to the edge of the forest, just beyond the grazing fields, when he heard a sound echoing from deep within them trees, like something whistling. It gave him a good start, it did, but he shook it off, deciding to put it in the back of his mind and get back to the job at hand. It was probably just some bird trying to get lucky, is what he thought. But then it happened again. This time, though, that whistling had a more melodic tone to it, something like a lullaby. You better quit your joking right now, I'm telling y'all, he hollered, dropping his shovel and crossing his arms over his chest. Now, his buddies knew he had got himself in hot water earlier that day. And you know how boys can be, always ready to pull a prank on each other. So my pa figured it was either his pal Jeb or Willie trying to give him a scare. 
but them woods. They stayed as silent as a grave, not giving a lick about my pa's demands. So reckoning he wasn't getting nowhere with it. He bent down to pick up the shovel and get back to work. As his fingers brushed the handle, that whistle sang its eerie lullaby again. Half spooked and half irritated, instead of grabbing the shovel, he scooped up a rock from the ground and hurled it into the black depths of the forest. But as soon as that stone disappeared into them trees, it came right back at him, smacking him square in the shoulder. That did it though. He was all fire and brimstone now. With a swift move, he snatched up the shovel from the ground and bolted into the woods, ready to give whoever was playing these tricks a good thrashing. As he passed through them trees into the heart of the forest, that whistle came back, its source just a few steps deeper into the woods, but too far away for him to make out who might be making that eerie tune. Fueled by anger, he charged after that sound. Just as he was about to reach that spot where he had last heard it, the sound shifted, moving deeper into them woods. Now this ought to have set off some alarms in his noggin, but my pa, bless his heart, unlike his son, was always more brawn than brains. So before he knew it, he was in deep, deeper than you ever want to be in them woods after sundown. That whistle, it came again, but it had changed into something different, a wicked sort of laughter. Finally, a light bulb lit up in my pa's head, but by then, things were looking downright grim. Regretting his poor choices, he turned tail and bolted back towards the farm. But that whistling, it came again, this time in front of him. So he swerved to go around it, but it came again and again, blocking his path. I'm a goner, he blurted out feeling sweat pouring from every pore in his body, making that shovel in his grip as slippery as a greased pig. He was plumb out of options, so he did what any fellow would have done in his shoes. He made a run for that whistling, shovel in hand, ready to swing at whatever came his way. But he didn't get too far, because out of nowhere, something hit him hard in the gut, and then again on the noggin, sending him tumbling towards the forest floor. By then, he was wailing like a newborn calling out for their mama. Through his blurred vision, he saw something approaching, taller than a man, standing upright on two legs, with arms so long they almost touched the ground. The creature whistled again, that same eerie lullaby, as if it was mocking my pa for his foolishness. My pa's hands scrambled in the dirt, his body itching away from the creature on pure instinct, his eyes wide with terror as he fought to put distance between himself and the nightmare that had him in its grasp. But that creature's freakishly long arms shot out towards him, grabbing him by the shoulder. A searing pain exploded in my pa's right shoulder as them creature's claws sank deep into his flesh. He howled like a cornered wolf. The creature's eerie whistle laugh echoed through the dark woods, sending shivers down his spine. Panic coursed through my pa's mind as his eyes finally focused on the creature's face and form. Its skin was dried and wrinkled, more like tree bark than any animal hide. On its face, there was a wide gash opening up to reveal row upon row of needle-like teeth. It had no eyes, no nose, no hair, nothing but them creases in its bark-like skin. My pa wailed. He begged for help, but none was coming, or so he thought. Thundering through the night, a loud bang exploded behind my pa, and the creature let out a grueling howl, instantly letting him go. Another bang followed, a shot, 
my father realized as he swiftly turned to see who was doing the shooting. There stood my granddad, silent as a tomb, not saying a word, his hands steady as he cocked another bullet into his rifle. The creature screeched and skittered back into the night, leaving them both behind. Are you all right, boy? Can you stand? My grandfather asked, not taking his eyes away from the forest ahead of him. What in God's earth was that thing? My father blurted as he rose to his feet, brushing off his pants and shirt. Tree man, my grandfather revealed, jerking the rifle, signaling to my father to move. After snatching up the shovel from the ground, my father hustled past my granddad. With my granddad close on his heels, they dashed through them trees, not stopping, not uttering a word, until they reached the grazing field, putting a good 15 feet between them and the edge of them woods. You were lucky, boy. My granddad started taking a deep breath and finally uncocking the rifle. If your grandma had noticed you were gone from the field, no one would have ever seen a single speck of you again. How could you be such a fool? Don't you know about them things that prowl in these dang woods? Why'd you go and jump headfirst into it? My granddad demanded, fixing my father with a stern glare that demanded an answer. I thought it was Jeb messing about, he replied, sinking his chin into his chest. What's a tree man anyway, he muttered. People say it's a demon or something of the sort, my granddad began. But I think it's just a beast, no different from a bear or a wolf. It lures its prey into the woods, mimicking sounds it heard over its lifetime. They're shifty creatures, you know. Folks say they could climb up them trees, jumping from one to another, messing with your head before they pounce. My father's pal Jeremy used to spin tales about nabbing one back in his youth, but most folks thought he was talking pure hogwash. These creatures do their hunting at night, so never, and I mean never, go tracking the sound you hear amongst them trees after the sun's gone down. I heard they could even mimic people's voices. So if you ever hear one, don't you dare stick around. Just hightail it out of there and don't utter a sound. I sure as shooting don't want you filling up that thing's arsenal. My dad nodded, then hurried towards home. There'd be no more toiling that night. He had rather taken a switch in from his grandma, he had told me. The tree man's trick it still happens every now and then, but we folks here, we know better than to chase it. Regrettably, most of them tourists tend to treat this story like a tall tale. So some of them, they venture out yonder into those cursed woods when they hear something out of the ordinary. And more often than not, we never lay eyes on them again. They call it a mysterious tragedy, but we know the truth. And we tell them, but they won't heed our words. I'm hoping y'all are listening, though. What I'm sharing with you, to open your minds to a peculiar and sinister that lingers in our world. I've got more tales to spin, but let this be the first installment, a kind of introduction, if you could catch my drift. So, with no more dilly-dallying, I bid y'all farewell until my return. And remember... Never go into them woods alone, especially after the sun dips below the horizon. The branches of the tall pines and maples swayed back and forth in the powerful wind. They reached out over the water, leaving a nice shadow for us to park our little fishing boat under. Damn it, almost had him, Jerry shouted aloud. That's the third bite you had today, yet you still can't catch anything. I laughed in response, pulling my rod back before whipping it forward to send the bait flying. 
It was a nice and sunny afternoon, aside from the dark towering clouds rising over the horizon. We only had one bass in the cooler in the middle of the boat, one I had caught about 40 minutes earlier. The wind was growing more and more powerful, making it hard to cast and making the waves rock the boat. Thunder rumbled in the distance, and Jerry turned to me with a frown. We better get back to the cabin. We don't want to get stuck out here in a bad thunderstorm, he said to me, his shaggy brown hair waving around like a flag. I laughed at the sight and nodded my head in agreement as Jerry started up the trolling motor. We were decently far from his house, so it took about 15 minutes to get there from our fishing spot. It was sunny in the direction we were heading, but behind us, darkness loomed. Once we arrived, I saw Jerry's brother Robert relaxing on the porch in front of the cabin reading a book. This surprised me, as I had always known Robert as the less intelligent one and not one to read books. He set it down and came to help us dock the small vessel in a little slip. Any luck? He asked. The only bite I had was a nice bass. Your brother, on the other hand, had three bites but couldn't reel one in. I responded. Oh well, we could still skin and fry that bass for some food tonight. We got off the boat, and Jerry and Rob headed up the stairs into the porch, while I stayed down on the porch to clean the bass. As I worked, I watched the almost black storm grow and take over the blue sky. The storm moved quickly and seemed to come out of nowhere. That morning, there hadn't been a cloud in the sky. I had never seen anything like it before, and it felt unnatural. I hurriedly finished and headed back into the cabin. The cabin was old and small and a little dirty inside. It was red bricked with a brown wooden roof. The red on the bricks had faded into a more brown color, which made the cabin really blend in with the environment around it. It was hard to see from away. Jerry and Rob were in the kitchen cleaning up, and our other friend Sal and his girlfriend Olivia were on the couch watching a funny television show. We had insisted on Sal not bringing his girlfriend, telling him it was going to be a guy's trip, but he brought her anyways, saying he hardly got to spend any vacation time with her like this. None of us really liked her, as we thought she was too controlling on Sal's life, but we wanted to hang out with Sal and he wouldn't come without her. Jerry had a little weather alert radio on the kitchen counter, and he was playing it now. The National Weather Service has issued a severe thunderstorm warning for the following counties. It named almost every county in the state, and then followed to say the storm was also in a multitude of other states nearby. Be prepared for strong winds, heavy rain, flooding, and lightning. There is also a slight chance of hail and tornadoes. Jesus, we are going to get slammed. Jerry's eyes had widened as he listened. Yeah, it looks like the damn apocalypse is coming out there. I laughed. We debated driving back to town, but decided not to, as we would probably get caught by the storm in the long ride back. More and more thunder rumbled, and I stepped out onto the porch to watch the dark clouds engulf the sky above us. Lightning flashed around the cabin, and it started to rain now. The wind was making the boat bounce back and forth between the sides of the dock. I just hoped our knots would keep it attached. The slanted rain began to shoot the screen covering of the porch, soaking me and the furniture. The wind pushed it hard and it was painful getting hit by it. It felt like little pricks or airsoft bullets. I headed back inside, with little red dots on my arms and face. The wind was so violent, it began to shake even the thick oaks surrounding the land around us. 
this lake and the area around the cabin were heavily wooded with big trees. Now all of them shaking, and I was afraid one would come crashing down on us in any second. The rain grew so heavy that I couldn't even see past the porch. Sal and Olivia were cuddled up on the couch, and me, Rob, and Jerry were discussing the storm in the kitchen. I've never seen anything like this before. This could cause some serious damage to the house. Hell, the dock is probably broken off by now. Dad is going to be pissed. Jerry laughed. His laugh was interrupted by a bright flash and loud clap of thunder. The flow of lightning and torrential rain continued throughout the day. The power would flicker constantly, but never entirely going out. The weather radio just continued to repeat itself, updating with new tornado alerts for new counties every now and then. It showed no signs of slowing down, so we just put on a funny movie and all sat down to enjoy it. It was hard to hear over the thunder and wind, and we would be constantly interrupted by the power outages. By the time we finished, it was around 10 at night, and we all decided to go to sleep. There were only three rooms, so Jerry had been sleeping out on the couch. The noise of the storm made it easier for me to drift off to sleep easily. I awoke to sunlight beaming through the windows. Huh. The storm must have worn off overnight, I thought to myself as I climbed out of bed. I flicked the light switch, but the light didn't come on. Power must have gotten knocked out by the storm. I walked out into the living room, seeing Robert down on the dock, observing the damage. I went out to meet him. A huge pine had fallen into the lake, and another one was leaning on an oak tree. If that oak hadn't been there, it would have crushed the cabin. Luckily, the dock was hardly damaged, and the boat was still attached. I might as well call Dad and tell him we're alright. Let me see your phone. Robert spoke. I had the best carrier out of everyone here, so my phone was the only one with barely enough data to call anyone. I handed him my phone and he turned it on. That's weird. It says you have no bars. He handed it back to me. Yeah, maybe something happened from the storm. I'm going to make some breakfast. Rob suggested going back home, but we decided to wait and see if my service came back. It never did. I turned on the weather radio to listen to any updates, but I just heard static. I thought it may have been something wrong with the equipment itself. Sal and Olivia decided to fish the rest of the day, while the rest of us set up some targets out in the field to practice shooting. Throughout the day, we saw several military jets fly over, but Jerry said he had seen that before, so we didn't pay much attention to it. We were running out of actual targets to shoot, and so we set up some bottles. Between Jerry and Rob, I was the worst shot out of all of them. This was a given, as I used guns the least, but it didn't stop them from laughing when I missed. The day crept on, and eventually we decided to head back late afternoon. Sal and Olivia had caught four fish, and Sal claimed Olivia had caught almost all of them. Naturally, we didn't believe him, but we just let it slide. Jerry was probably beginning to regret inviting either of them for the trip, as Sal was just spending most of his time with Olivia anyway. I was walking out of the restroom when I heard the two of them speaking in the room next door. I put my ear to the door to hear the conversation better. Dude, you're forgetting I'm the one who invited you here, not your clingy girlfriend. She's not clingy, alright? I'm sorry she just wants to spend time with me. You don't understand, I know you've never had a girlfriend. All I'm asking is that you just spend a little bit more time with us. Fine, whatever, man. 
I heard footsteps coming my way and stepped back as the door flung open and Sal came storming out. Jerry followed slowly behind him. He stopped when he saw me and turned to talk to me. Now I'm beginning to think we shouldn't have brought him. It would have been much more fun with just the three of us. Nothing too weird happened for the rest of the day. The power never came back on. I never regained service, and we saw a few more jets flying over us. Jerry figured his dad would have come up to the cabin by now if he was really worried about us. Sal did some time with us to go on a walk through the woods. Oddly, Olivia seemed fine with it, and stayed at the cabin to read the book that she had brought up. The sky became streaked with waves of purple and orange as the sun began the set, and we all knew it was time to head back to the cabin. Luckily, Jerry and Rob had a few candles up there, and we of course had a few flashlights, so we wouldn't be in total pitch black. We were cleaning up for dinner when Sal called us down to the dock. Come take a look at this, guys. We all headed down except for Rob, who wanted to finish hand washing the dishes. I immediately knew what he was talking about when I stepped outside on the porch. The moon, which hadn't risen that high in the sky at this point, had turned into the color of blood. I had seen that phenomenon before, but usually it had more of an orangish tint to it. This was straight red. Its reflection in the rippling water made the water look like blood too. We all stared at it for a while, but eventually went back inside. Jerry had a battery-operated radio in the closet, and pulled it out in hopes that we would know what's going on with the outside world. But as he turned the knob, flipping through the channels, our eyes widened with shock. The only noise coming out of the radio speakers was static. We have to go back. We have no idea what's going on out there. Rob was sitting on the couch and frantically looking around at all of us. You're right, but I'm not sure we should all go. It could be dangerous. We could be invaded by another country or something crazy, Sal said. Invaded? I laughed. I'll go back, I... No, it's me and Rob's cabin, and our father owns it. One of us will go back. Jerry interrupted. Jerry... I have the most powerful truck. After that storm, you have no idea what kind of wreckage is out there. I could just drive your truck. Dude, it's not a big deal, man. Plus, you know I never let anyone else drive my truck. Sal kissed Olivia goodbye and headed out, taking nothing with him but a wallet, his phone, and a hat. Not to our surprise, the radio once again only played static after he started up the truck. We told him to call us when he got back to our city, but we never received a call from him. We never saw Sal again. Fish. Fish again? All we ever eat is fish. I was twirling my food around my plate with a fork. It was true. We had fish for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. We had only just ran out of food in the pantry two days ago. I had only brought enough up for the trip. We still had a few granola bars, but I tried to save those, as I had no idea how long we would be there. Dude, it could be worse. Do you really want to risk driving out and going to get something? Sal was supposed to be back three days ago, and we never even got a call from him. Jerry responded. That doesn't sound like a bad idea. There's a sandwich restaurant and gas station about 30 or so miles away from here. I'm sure we wouldn't be in danger just going for that. This cabin is surrounded by miles and miles of woods, and the only road out of here is a small, windy dirt one. The only reason whatever happened to the rest of society hasn't happened to us is because we are so isolated in the middle of nowhere. Let's keep it that way. I sighed and got up to watch the setting sun from the glass door, which led to the porch from the living room. 
Olivia was lying on the couch, just staring off into the wall. She hadn't taken Sal's disappearance well. We had tried to talk to her, but she just told us to be quiet. The only thing we could do now was wait until her grief left. The days passed slowly for us. There was nothing for us to do besides ride the storm out. Jerry was right. The chances of us being found out here were very slim. We all had our different theories of what was going on, but we mostly agreed it had to be an invasion of some sorts. We originally thought it was just a really bad storm, but by now surely the power would have came back on or someone would have came back out here and found us. And then there was the moon. Each night, it was still as crimson as blood. We thought it may have been caused by a gas or something. Our opinion soon changed that night. Robert had brought up s'mores, and we had yet to cook them. We were all tired of eating fish that night, and Rob suggested bringing them out and making them over a small fire. We made it in the back of the cabin, in the small driveway, which was at the bottom of a hill leading into the woods. Hey, Olivia, we're making s'mores outside. You want to join us? I cautiously asked. Why would y'all want me to join you? She replied with a snarky tone. Why would you say that? I know you all hate me. I've seen the looks you give me. We don't hate you. The truth is, I never forced Sal to take me up here. I never forced him to do anything. Go hang out with your friends, I tell him. He insists on spending all his time with me. I was shocked at this revelation. All these years, he had blamed her. Olivia, I'm sorry. Hey, are y'all coming out? The fire is ready now. Jerry had stepped inside. Olivia began to slowly get off the couch. Yeah, we'll be right there. I shouted back. Nah, nah, nah. Hey, do y'all remember the time that Rob flicked peanut butter on Sydney's shirt at lunch? And Sydney turned around and punched the crap out of him? We all erupted in laughter. I even saw Olivia giggle a little, which made me smile. And then Rob got up and... Jerry was interrupted by a long and loud screech coming from the woods. This was followed by a chorus of yapping and growling. Our smiles faded away. I've heard coyotes before, and this did not sound like them. Plus, the coyotes had gone silent since the moon turned red. What is that? Olivia asked aloud. Jerry and Rob started frantically trying to put out the fire, dumping their waters all over it. The chorus was getting closer and sounding more and more angry. After putting it out, we all quickly ran inside, locking the door behind us. I went and locked the other two doors in the cabin, and Rob went to go get the shotgun. He came back with the pump-action 12-gauge just as the noises were nearing the cabin. The noises were right outside the cabin now, and whatever was making them was scratching the door now. Rob raised the gun. Jerry responded by shaking his head and mouthing no. We moved to the master bedroom of the cabin and waited in there. The scratching lasted around 15 minutes before the pack of whatever was making that noise went away. Rob finally set the gun down. What the hell was that? I turned to Jerry. I've never heard a pack of coyotes or wild hogs sound like that. Honestly, I don't know. We kept the doors locked that night and kept the candles blown out. I brought a pistol with me to sleep. Something had found us now. Things only got weirder the next following days. The morning I decided to get up early and go turkey hunting. A nice turkey would be a refreshing change of pace from fish. 
I was armed with a very powerful shotgun, so I wasn't really scared of being alone in the woods. I made sure to walk very far away from the cabin, past the edge of the property. A gunshot would be loud, and I didn't want any more things to be attracted to our location. I found a good tree in front of a large field and sat down to wait. Being alone allowed me to think freely without any interruptions. I was worried. Worried about my family. Worried about Sal and the rest of the world. None of us had talked about it last night, but we were all thinking it. What if this wasn't some sort of other country's invasion? What if it was aliens? Or monsters? I drifted off to sleep thinking all the possible reasons. Whispers. My eyes shot open. The sun was now hanging high in the middle of the sky. I had been laying on the grassy ground and so had my gun. I heard whispers coming from all around me. I thought that I was dreaming and tried to shake my head, then pinching myself, but the whispers remained. I felt chills run down my spine as I quickly jumped up and began to run across the field, back in the direction of the cabin. As I ran, I glanced back over my shoulder and saw something that made me stop dead in my footsteps. My mother, my father, and my sister were all standing at the edge of the trillion on the other side of the field. They were waving, and then beckoning me to come over to them. They all had smiles on their faces, but like the storm, they looked unnatural and fake. I took off into a full sprint now. My adrenaline kept me going. I didn't stop sprinting until I had reached our own property, and even then I only slowed to a jog. By the time I reached the cabin, I was panting, my chest hurt, and I was covered in sweat. That's the last time I go into the woods alone, I thought to myself as I stepped into the cabin. Olivia was messing with the radio in the kitchen. Her eyes widened as she looked up at me. Wh what happened to you? She asked. Uh, I saw something in the woods. I responded bluntly. What was it? This sounds crazy, but I think I saw my family. They were smiling and waving at me. Maybe you just miss them a lot. It's okay. I miss my family too. What about Sal? Dang it. Why would I ask that? I thought to myself as I waited for a response. I miss him, sure, and I hope he's alright, but not as much as my family. Our relationship was having lots of trouble. I think him taking me here was a last-ditch effort to save it. There was a few seconds of awkward silence in response before I broke the ice again. How's the radio going? I asked. It's mostly been static, but earlier I heard a voice. A voice? It sounded like a man's. And it was asking for help, saying they were coming for him. Before I could respond, Jerry and Rob stepped in through the glass door carrying three skinned bass with them. What happened to you, dude? Jerry asked. There was something weird I saw in the woods. I'm not ever going out in them alone again, I told him. The sudden realization hit me that whatever saw me could have followed me back. What was in the woods? Jerry asked. I... I don't... I'm not sure what I saw. I told him. Maybe we are all just a little stressed out. We need some relaxation, Olivia said. Huh, that's a good idea. We don't have any more alcohol up here, but we could still have some fun. I'll be back. Jerry ran into the master bedroom and came back out holding a Monopoly box. Anyone down to get their butts kicked? He grinned. 
as I was stepping out of the bathroom when Rob grabbed my shoulder and pulled me aside. It was 11 at night, and the moon had once again remained its oddly crimson color. I know what you saw in the woods. Robin spoke in a hushed tone. I don't think it was really anything, Rob. I was just seeing things. I see it too. When I go off alone, when I go fishing, I see my father. He waves for me to come to him. I also hear whispers telling me to do things. Have you talked to Olivia or Jerry about this yet too? No, I don't think they've seen what we have. They aren't like us. Are you okay, man? How much sleep have you been getting recently? Not a lot. I've been staying up, keeping watch on us. Something could break in at any time, and we have no idea what's out there. I nodded my head in agreement, but couldn't help that there was something off about Rob. But considering we could be sitting in the middle of an apocalypse, I couldn't really blame him. You know, I've heard of stuff like this before. Rob called out to me as I was walking away. What do you mean? I asked. Ever seen Batman? Scarecrow uses this gas that makes people hallucinate and they see their nightmares. This isn't some fantasy movie, Rob. No, but I've seen documentaries on the History Channel. Armies before have tried to create something similar. Some sort of chemical or gas that drives someone crazy, making them see things. It would be perfect in a war. Let's hope that's not the case, I said and continued walking. But what he said made me think. Using some sort of gas to drive a population insane would make an invasion or worse, an extermination, all that much easier. But I hadn't seen any gas in the air at all. And so far, me and Rob were the only ones having the problems. I shook my head and tried to get this off my mind. Things didn't get any better as more and more time went by. I asked Olivia and Jerry if they had been seeing things too. Jerry gave off a firm, what are you talking about? But Olivia responded with an anxious, no, why would I be having some weird visions going on in my head? Do you think I'm going crazy or something? She tried to hide it, but she wasn't a good liar. I decided to have a conversation alone with Jerry one night about it. I invited him out to the porch. We each sat in two old wooden rockers Jerry and his dad had made when he was a kid. We waited in silence for a minute or two, just staring out onto serene bright water and the crimson moon perched just above it. We were both shivering and my teeth chattered for a little bit. It was early fall in the south, yet ever since the storm, the temperature had been dropping significantly each day. At one point, I almost jumped when a little brown spider crawled over my foot. I relaxed when I saw it was just a spider, but freaked out even more when I saw the brown fiddle on its back and recognized it as a brown lacluse. I stepped on it quickly, thankful it had not bitten me. I started to open my mouth, but Jerry blurted, Have you ever read the book of Revelations before? I was startled by this, as I didn't really know Jerry as a religious man. I mean, I've skimmed through it, but I've never really sat down and read it. There's a verse, 612. It talks about the opening of the sixth seal and the moon becoming as red as blood. I remained silent. What if the storm was a rapture? We never heard from anyone else after it. What if we were the ones left behind? I turned around to tell him how ridiculous that sounded, but I could see how nervous he was in his eyes. Listen, man, I don't think the world is ending. It's probably just some biological weapon from another country or something. We've been out here for weeks, Jay. We have to see someone, go check on something, even if it's just our neighbors. 
I thought of many reasons why that would be a bad idea, but I too was eager to discover the fate of the rest of civilization. For all we knew, we could be the last people on Earth. Alright, tomorrow we'll head to the convenience store area. If other people are still out there, there's bound to be someone there. I think the two of us are the only ones that should also go. Olivia's a girl and your brother could stay and watch her in the house. Jerry opened his mouth to respond, but was interrupted by a long screech coming from the woods, which was followed by more howls and growls. We started hearing noises like this around a week ago, and they had become more and more frequent each night. The same as other nights before, Jerry once said again. It's just bobcats and wild dogs. I was sitting at a long wooden table, my family surrounding me. On top of the table, there was a surplus of food. Food I hadn't seen in weeks. Turkey, bread, beans, salad. We were out in an open, sunny field. My family was all smiling as they passed the food around. You could be with us, Jay. You could be happy. A loud rumbling noise filled the atmosphere and the sky turned red. Now my family's faces were distorted and inhuman. I jumped up and squeezed my eyes shut. When I reopened them, I was looking up at a dark wooden ceiling and was sweating. I jumped up out of my bed and looked around the dark room, but saw nothing. I heard thuds on the wooden floor quickly coming towards my room. I grabbed the revolver that was on the nightstand and waited. The door flung open and Jerry stepped in. I breathed a sigh of relief. Jesus, dude, you gotta say something before you just barge in. I almost shot you. I laughed a little. It's Olivia. She's gone. All my laughter left me as Jerry and I stepped out into the hallway. The room to Olivia's door was flung wide open, and her sheets were flung out onto the floor. But that wasn't the disturbing part. There was a trail of scratches and blood leading out from her room to the open door of the cabin. And directly behind the door and across the driveway were the thick, pitch black and strangely silent woods. We gotta go get her. I urged to Jerry. Now? In the dark? That's suicide. Just wait until daylight. I tried to calm down and not let my emotions control me, but it was hard. Where the hell was Rob? He's supposed to keep watch. Jerry's face gave off an oh crap expression as he began to frantically look around the cabin. I ran to the kitchen and then the porch. What the hell? I thought as I stepped out onto it. Rob was sitting at the edge of the dock, just holding the shotgun and looking up into the sky. Rob! I shouted as I ran down to him. Isn't it beautiful? He responded as I ran up next to him. What? What are you talking about? I shouted. The stars the moon. He responded almost joyfully. You were supposed to be watching the cabin. Olivia's gone now because of you. His facial expression changed immediately, most like he snapped out of some daze. He quickly ran back up to the cabin, swinging around the shotgun as he went. I followed him back up. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm so sorry. He buried his face in his hands. None of us went back to sleep for the rest of the night. The moment dawn broke, we headed out into the forest, all armed. We made sure not to split up, although Rob would often straggle behind. We saw no trace of Olivia anywhere. No blood, no torn clothing, no nothing. We only shouted out a few times, for fear that something else would hear us. After a few hours, we gave up our search and headed back towards the cabin. I was scared, not just for Olivia, but for all of us as well. We were no longer hidden, 
and whatever had found her was dangerous. It broke in and took her without a sound. Me and Jerry decided to keep our promise of going out and seeing if we could find anyone. We almost had to at this point. Jerry came up to me while I was putting on a thick jacket. Listen, Jay, I think you should take Rob with you instead. Why? I'm worried about him lately. He's been acting strange. I think he has really bad cabin fever. I didn't mention the visions or whispers to him. You're right. That sounds like a good idea. But are you going to be okay here all by yourself? I could see that he was gripping a Bible tightly in his right hand. Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to go down and do some fishing, you know? Well, we'll be back in a few hours. Just be careful, buddy. I patted him on the shoulder before heading out the Rob's truck. Me and Rob were silent as we drove down the dirt road and then the highway. The only thing we saw were a couple of mutilated deer and empty cars. I sat staring out the window, only able to think about Olivia and Sal. I feel really bad for Olivia, you know? I finally broke the silence. Why? Rob asked with a tone that suggested his mind was on other things. We always talked about how much she controlled Sal's life and how bad she was. You know, I think it was the opposite now, I said. Why do you think? Rob sounded a little bit more interested now. She told me about it all before she went missing, man. She told me how Sal always made her do things with him, even when she insisted that he should just go out with us. I spoke sympathetically. Well, if we see them ever again, I'll tell her I'm sorry, Rob responded. I felt like he was drifting off again, back into his own mind and somewhere far away from here. I don't think we're ever going to see either one of them again, Rob, I said softly and went back to staring out the window. Rob remained quiet. The farther away from the cabin we went, the more uneasy I felt. We reached the convenience store by the afternoon. Rob and I both stepped out of the car armed and ready for anything to come at us, but nothing did. There was a good number of empty cars in the parking lot and road here. We had yet to see another person, so I'd pretty much come to the conclusion that the rest of the world was just in bad a shape as us. Go check out those cars. I'm going to go into the stores, Rob said to me quietly. I nodded and we split off. I noticed the air had gotten so cold I could see my breath now. I immediately noticed one of the cars had its doors ripped off, and on my way over to that one, I winced a little when I looked inside. The interior was covered all with blood. I looked back over to the car next to it, and noticed that it too was covered with blood. Jay! Jay! I heard Rob scream and quickly ran over to the store. I stepped in with my gun raised, but Rob was completely fine. What are you doing screaming like that? I shouted angrily. Look! He pointed at the floor. I looked down and jumped back. The floor was covered with dried blood too. As I looked around, I noticed the entire store was a mess. There were shelves knocked over and glass cracked and shattered. I even noticed a few shells on the floor. But like the cars, I didn't see any bodies. We moved on to the restaurant next door and were met with the same results. There was no sign of anyone anywhere. I tried the phones at the stores, but they didn't work. We silently headed back out to the car, me in the lead. My jaw dropped when it came into sight. The tires, all four of them, were flat. What the F? I heard come from behind me. What the F? Rob screamed. Can you be quiet? I sneered back at him. Listen. We could still drive with flat tires, at least slowly, 
but we don't have time to check anywhere else now. We gotta get back to your brother. He's all alone. I said to Rob. Rob nodded, but I could see he was very angry. We drove back slowly. The screechy noise made from the wheels on cement was awful and loud. I tried not to think about it, but I knew that anyone and anything within a mile could probably hear us. We only made it ten minutes before the truck came to a grinding halt. Rob cursed as he got out of the car. Oh no! I heard a mumble. My heart dropped when I saw what he was worried about. There was a trail of gas behind the truck. Now we are stuck out here, damn it! Rob kicked the side of his truck. Well, it would help if you would be quiet. Just calm down, Rob. We hid for weeks from those turds, and now they are too scared to face us? Come on, bitches! I covered my ears as Rob raised his shotgun high and fired into the sky. I'm right here! You want to fight? Come get one! I wasn't going to let him get us both killed. Without hesitation, I drew my fist back and then socked him in the mouth. He fell to the ground, dropping the shotgun. Listen, Robert, you may have a death wish, but I don't. Those things out there will kill you, and our only chance is to make it back on foot before sunset, unless you want to end up like the deer over there. Are you with me? Rob nodded. Once again, it seemed like he had been broken out of a trance. He reached for the shotgun, but I grabbed it before he could. I'm going to keep this with me for now. Fine. He mumbled. We walked again in complete silence. There were empty cars every now and then on the side of the road, but neither of us knew how to hotwire. As the sun lowered in the sky, I grew more and more nervous, and when I began to see the horizon turning orange and our shadows grow tall, I began to panic. We hadn't even hit the dirt road yet. Every now and then I thought I would hear rustling in the woods around us. I wasn't sure if it was just a harmless animal, but I knew we were being hunted. We're going to die out here, Robert said bluntly as the sky turned the purple. Don't say that. We're nowhere near the cabin, and it's going to be dark any minute now. I heard a growl not too far off in the woods. I began to think of my family and my other friends. I missed them deeply and wondered where they all were right now and if they were in a better place. We could hide in some house or a car or something. I anxiously said as I watched the blood moon rise in the night sky. Jay, you know they are watching us, following us, waiting for the right moment to pounce. Robert said to me. I didn't respond, but kept walking. Jay! He grabbed my shoulder. I turned around to face him. My eyes were wide and my face was pale, but Rob's was calm. He grabbed the shotgun out of my hand. I want you to protect my little brother for me. I realized what he was doing. No, you can't. I'm losing it, Jay. I see things and hear things. I'm a liability. I'll get you both killed if I'm around. I'll do my best to try to hold them back, but you need to run as fast as you can. He cocked the shotgun. I heard more and more growls and roars coming from the woods. They were close and loud now. I stood motionless as Rob turned around to face them. Go now, he shouted. I took off, running faster than I ever had before. I heard a screech and gunshots, but did not turn around to check. I ran until my feet burned and my chest stung. My adrenaline kept me going, but I had to slow down. I was finally on the dirt road. I didn't take much time on it before I realized how dangerous it was out here in the open like that. On the right side of the road out in the field, I could barely make out an old broken down cabin. I made way quickly inside. 
There was broken down walls and piles of junk everywhere. It seemed like a good place to hide. I had decided to wait out the rest of my night here. It seemed like my best option for survival. I went inside what I presumed used to be the bathroom and sat down in there. I was safe in there for a few hours. I couldn't sleep, so I just kind of sat there in a frightened daze. A low growl nearby snapped me out of it. I almost jumped up and screamed when I heard it. The growl had been right outside the house. After a few moments of silence, I heard the floorboards creak, and I knew I was not alone in the cabin anymore. I felt fear like I never had before. I felt cold throughout my body and deep down. I tried to control my breathing, but it just got louder. The creaking was getting closer to my hiding spot. I tried to move my leg and bumped a nearby rock. An idea popped in my head. I slowly reached towards the stone and picked it up. I didn't waste any time and chucked it as hard as I could into the darkness. I heard a loud thud on the other side of the cabin. The creaking changed direction. This is my chance, I thought as I slowly crept out, still crouching. It was almost pitch black and I couldn't make out anything else in the cabin. I felt relief run through my veins once I stepped outside of the cabin. I sped up my creeping, trying to move as fast away from the cabin as I could while still being stealthy. I spent the rest of the night creeping through the woods, moving towards the direction of the cabin and hiding in brush every time I heard a noise. I didn't think I was going to make it back. The night felt like a million but eventually I saw daylight on the horizon. I almost broke into a cry when the cabin came into view. I bursted through the door, frantically looking for Jerry. He was on his knees praying. Jerry! He turned around. Hey, where's Rob? He, um, he, uh, I'm sorry, Jerry. What? No. Jerry threw his Bible across the room and turned around and kicked the couch. There was no chance both of us were going to make it. Without him, none of us would be back. Jerry wasn't listening. He was throwing things around and kicking furniture. It didn't take long for the rage to leave him. He laid down on his knees, face buried in his palms, just like Rob had been after Olivia died. I went over and tried to comfort him, but he just stormed into his room, slamming the door shut behind him. We spent the next few days in complete silence. Jerry hardly moved, just mopped around and read his Bible. But he told me an event that had happened while we were gone. He had gotten on the fishing boat and decided to patrol around the lake to see if he could make out anyone else on the other cabins around. While he was going slowly by the shoreline, he heard whispers and thought it was another human. As he steered the boat to the dock, he saw his father staring at him. He began to speed up, but stopped when he saw other people were with him, including people he knew were dead, like Olivia. We had a long conversation after about the visions and how I thought this was making us go crazy. There was one other lake house on the lake, one we hadn't checked out yet. I told Jerry I was going to go check it out, to see if there was anyone in there. We both already knew the answer to that, but I really just wanted to get away from the cabin for a while. I loaded up on the boat, and brought the usual gun and flashlight with me. I left early in the morning, so I would have most of the day to be there. I didn't want to stay past sunset and have to deal with those things in the woods that came out at night. I took the boat slowly over there, watching the still water and trying to keep my mind off of things. The dock had an empty spot and I tied up the boat and headed in to investigate. 
I wasn't sure what I expected to be inside, but it was painted red with blood. In the kitchen was the most gruesome things I had ever seen. Two headless bodies crawling with maggots and a shotgun lying on the floor. I almost wanted the vomit. I looked around, but there was no suicide note or anything. I checked the kitchen and found some other canned food. I put it in my bag, but felt very disgusted about taking it from this house now. It didn't take long for me to start hearing the whispers again. I felt the paranoia overcome me and began to develop a massive headache too. Screw it! I shouted aloud to no one and left the cabin with half the day left. While I was untying the boat, I heard something that made me want to stop for a second. At first it was a low hum and thought it was just from my headache, but then it got louder. But not cover your ears loud, more like a rumbling. It seemed to come from the sky and sounded like someone was playing a low, far off trumpet. It only lasted about six seconds, but it was enough to deeply unnerve me. I felt a deep sense of unease come over me and hurriedly untied the boat. I jumped in and sped off. What was I thinking, going off alone again, especially after what happened with me and Rob? I scolded myself as I got further away. But I felt an urge, a longing, and couldn't help but turn to look back one last time at the cabin I left behind. What I saw sent chills down my spine. Black silhouettes of people in the windows, watching me. I turned back around quickly and didn't look back again. Going fast on open water with already cold wind was miserable, but I didn't care. When I got home, I saw Jerry standing by the side of the cabin, staring off into the woods. I tied up the boat and walked up to him. I didn't see anything in the cabin. It was empty. What are you doing? I asked, deeply concerned with him. I was just, uh, I don't know. He shook his head and walked back to the cabin. Wait, did you hear a sort of trumpet noise in the sky? I asked. Jerry simply turned around and nodded his head before going back in. To my surprise, nothing ever came back to our cabin and tried to break in. We had agreed that our best chance at survival would be to stay in this cabin and ride the storm out. The days crept by slowly, and we were filled with sorrow and misery. I noticed one day a dead crow was in front of our door. I asked Jerry about it, and he said he had seen lots of dead birds laying on the ground recently too. I ached for some sense of light, some sense of hope. My prayers were answered, but not in the form neither me or Jerry wanted. It had been a week since Rob's death, and Jerry and I were eating dinner quietly at the table when we heard frantic knocking at the front door. I reached for a nearby pistol and slowly walked towards the door, keeping it ready. Jerry remained in his seat watching. Please, help me somebody. I heard a plea come from the other side of the door. After a bit of hesitation, I slowly opened the door. An old bloody man came stumbling in, collapsing on the floor. One of his arms was mangled beyond any use. His makeshift cast didn't cover it that well, as I could still see white bone and rotting flesh over it. Who the hell are you? I questioned, keeping the gun up. Please don't shoot. I barely made it here. You can't put me back out there. They'll get me. They killed everyone I know. They killed my children. My wife. All right, all right, all right. I beckoned Jerry to get him some water, and he complied. We sat the man down on the couch and began questioning him. We asked who he was, where he came from, and everything else. My name's Daniel. 
I've been out on the run for weeks, moving from one broken down house to another. You're the first people I've seen still alive in God knows how long. I came from Atlanta. Previously to the storm, there was a lot of weird going on. A lot of military vehicles were seen everywhere. Nobody knew what was going on. They thought it was just because of terrorism or something. Then it hit. The storm. It seemed to come out of nowhere. Everyone was trying to leave the city after it happened. It was almost impossible to get out. We were trying to reach my wife's family in Arkansas, but we never made it. We only took the back roads and saw less and less people as we went. One night, we were parked on the side of the road while trying to sleep. I awoke to screams, and then I was yanked out of the car and dragged out into the night. That thing had my arm and lockjaw grip. I had to put all six shots in my revolver into it before it let me go. Then I just took off running and didn't look back. Well, what's causing this? What are those things out there? I call them Nightwalkers. I've yet to see what one looks like, but I know they are very dangerous and smart. They're most, they mostly come out at night too, and are quiet while they sneak up on you. They are like lions, terrifying predators. So, do you know if they're aliens or something? I continued. Like I said, no idea. Whatever they are, the military couldn't do jack crap. There are rumors that they bombed the cities to stop something. We also heard that the military bases became safe houses. And then we heard that that became chaotic. That everyone began killing each other there. So we completely avoided them. But they were all just rumors we heard from other people on the road. Dang. Well, we could always use more company. And I'm good with you staying here, but I'm not sure about my friend over there. I flicked my head towards Jerry, who responded by letting out a low mumbled, He could stay. Daniel started to get up, but I stopped him. Have you seen any sign of safety out there? Any other groups of people? We can't stay here much longer. At some point, we are going to be caught. We tried to avoid any towns, only take the back roads. But I wouldn't be sure about other groups. Whatever's going on is weird, and I don't understand it at all. Those things are just a small part of it. The temperature hasn't stopped dropping in forever, and it's going to hit zero at some point. And sometimes, I hear things. Voices, and my head starts to spin. My mind becomes clustered with hundreds of thoughts. It's like this whole event is beyond our basic perception and understanding, and it's driving us crazy. We saw some other people completely going off the edge. They acted out just like animals, killing each other, tearing each other apart. And even the actual animals, like dogs, went batshit crazy. Luckily, I had the revolver with me, and a lot of ammo, because people still go down in one shot. Too bad I dropped that damn thing on the run. It's alright. We have guns here. Jerry responded. His eyes widened. Can I see them? Hold your horses. We just met. I think you should be worried about cleaning off what's left of your arm. We got him in the shower and wrapped up his arm with actual bandages. But I would be surprised if it didn't get infected at some point anyway. Having Daniel around went well for a couple days even though we had to keep watch on him most of the time. He cooperated and helped us make food and fish, which I had absolutely developed a hate for the taste of by now. It all ran smoothly until the third night. I awoke to the sound of shouting and ran into the living room. Daniel was holding Jerry at gunpoint. Easy, Daniel. Just put the gun down. Jerry spoke softly. It's not you I want to hurt. He responded bitterly and pointed the gun at his chin instead. Well, what are you doing, man? If you fire that thing, every night crawler within a mile is going to hear it. We have food, shelter, and a nice hiding spot here. You don't have to do this. 
You don't understand. I lied earlier. We did go through every town we could, and they were all dead or crazy. There is nothing out there but death, and we are going to die too. It's better to go out this way than whatever is going to happen if the Nightwalkers get you. He aimed the gun back to Jerry. Trust me, I'll be doing you a favor. I took this chance to rush at Daniel, knocking him down to the ground while he fired. The bullet hit a nearby candle and knocked it off the table. Daniel was bigger than me and kicked me off him, still holding the gun. You don't have to do this. There is still something out there. There is still hope. No, there isn't. Daniel put the gun up to his chin and squeezed the trigger. Just as I was reaching towards him, there was a loud gunshot and I was covered in blood. I didn't say a word, just stood there frozen in shock. Oh my God, was all that could escape my lips. We both stood motionless for God knows how long. Seeing people already dead was one thing, but witnessing it happen right in front of me was something entirely different and much worse. We both stood motionless until I felt heat at my back. My senses came back to me and I jumped about three feet away when I noticed there was a fire behind me. It had broken out from the candle that fell on the carpet and was spreading. Jerry was still standing motionless in shock. Dude, come out of it! Dude, come on, we gotta get this fire out! I began to shake him. He shook his head and blinked, almost like coming back into consciousness. I ran into the kitchen and began filling up a cup of water, Jerry right behind me. We frantically attempted to set out the fire by dumping the water on it, but it had little to no effect of the ever-growing flames. I also began to hear screeches coming from the woods and heard them getting closer as we worked. Once the fire almost fully engulfed the living room, I knew it was time to give up. We gotta get out of here. Grab the guns. I'll pack a few supplies. Get your keys and we're taking your truck. I grabbed his shoulder and shouted in his face. He nodded and ran off into his room. I grabbed a few granola bars before heading into my room and packing jackets and whatever I could see into a bag. The smoke stung my eyes and made it hard to breathe. I didn't want to die in here waiting for Jerry, so I ran out, leaving the front door open behind me. Normally I would have turned my attention to watch the fire, but I focused instead on the dark rustling trees and the noises coming from within them. I grew nervous and fearful that I would be stuck alone out here without any weapon and anywhere to go and be left to a horrible fate. My hope was rekindled when I heard coughing and turned around to see Jerry stumble out of the burning cabin, carrying a shotgun in each hand. We acted quickly throwing what we could into the bed and we started up the truck. We drove off in silence. I stared out the back window, watching the flames reach towards the stairs and the walls collapsing. As we drove down the dirt road, the dread of what had just happened hit me. We had limited gas, limited supplies, and nowhere to go. It's been little over a week since the cabin burnt down, and we had hardly had any rest at all. We spent almost all of our time on the road taking turns driving. The only stops we made were for gas. We can't risk staying out for too long, knowing what's out there. Every time we drove to a new town or stop at a new gas station, I hope to see another human being. But it's even rare if we see a body. And each time we do, the light of hope that runs inside me dwindles. Sometimes I feel like I want to rip my brain out of my head. The voices constantly tell me to stop, pull over, and join them. I see people I know on the side of the road. People like Rob and Olivia. People I know are long gone. And now I have a constant agonizing headache. Every time we go to get gas, I have to get a whole new bottle of aspirin. 
I try to tell myself that there is something, someone else out there, but I hardly believe it anymore. I look into Jerry's eyes and I can see it too. He has nearly given up. He doesn't read from his Bible anymore, pray, or even really speak. He just stares out of the window. I always keep an eye on him to make sure he doesn't walk off with his shotgun and do what Daniel did. Sometimes I want to do it too, just to end this constant sense of fear. We had heard less and less Nightwalkers, but even more weird stuff has begun to happen. We don't even hear really any animals at night anymore. And one day, while we were driving, all the remaining birds began to drop dead out of the sky. And now we hear the loud trumpet noise every day. Sometimes it's only five seconds, other times it'll last 15. Luckily for us, the temperature hit around 10 degrees Fahrenheit and came to a standstill. I gave up on trying to decipher what was happening around us a long time ago. For all I know, we could be the last two people on Earth. I just hope that we could find some shelter out there, or some other people. I just hope that we will find some peace under a blood red moon. Fontaine, how long have you been doing this? I shift and press the accelerator, surging the 67 Impala forward. The enormous redwoods lining the sides of Route 101 whip by in a blur. Depends when you start counting. Don't be a wise-ass, Morgana. I shot a glance at the linebacker of a man sitting in the passenger seat. A long time ago, a nasty supernatural experience gave me low-level telepathy. But I didn't need to read his mind to know that he's using my full name just to get under my skin. Hell, I don't know, Maurice. About five years? He nods in agreement. And in that time, have I ever steered you wrong? Grudgingly, I shake my head. Exactly. He crossed his arms to acknowledge his victory. So believe me, you don't F around with the Wolfman. Which is exactly what we're about to do. He shifts uncomfortably. Probably, yes. You scared? Terrified. His coffee-colored face is deadly serious. You should be, too. I rolled my eyes. Wolfman, why don't you call it a werewolf like normal people? He shrugs. Different things. Pretty wide variety of werewolves. Everything from Indian skinwalkers to idiots who sell their souls to the right demon for a belt or ring. But what's the difference between that and a wolfman? Maurice stared ahead, but his mind is far away. Everything. Werewolves gain a wolf's instincts, but keep their human mind. They could change back and forth, easy as taking off the magic doodad. Wolfmen are a different animal completely. They look like humans most of the time, but they aren't. He turns to me, expression grave. Wolfmen are where the full moon comes in. Three nights a month, their human part is torn away, and what's left is the closest thing to death incarnate you're gonna find. Silver's the only thing that can hurt them, and even that barely. Try getting a kill shot with 800 pounds of fur, claw, and fangs trying to rip your throat out. He shudders. I've known guys torn to shreds trying to take down a wolfman. Close casket funerals, every one. But the worst is if you somehow manage to survive an attack. Maurice shook his head. The stories have that part right too. You get bit, scratched, it gets passed to you. Happened to a guy I partnered with a couple of times. Name of Pat Campbell. 
found out, put a silver bullet through his skull not long after. Seems a little dramatic to me. Yeah? He raised his eyebrows. Fontaine, wolfmen are a danger to everyone around them. The beast puts a rage in them, a bloodlust. Whole lot of battered spouses out there thanks to the mutts they're shacking up with. And that's when the moon ain't full. When it is, there's always the chance their loved ones accidentally stumble on them in wolf mode. Imagine waking up to find the people you most care about torn to bloody pieces by your own hands. Pat had a wife, three kids. He knew what would happen, one way or another. Figured it'd be less painful for everyone if he just ended things before it did. Maurice shook his head. That what you call dramatic? My only response is to edge the speedometer needle further to the right, the afternoon sun beginning its low descent towards the horizon. Maurice falls silent and leans back in his seat, point made. It's getting on towards six o'clock when I finally feel the mental tickle I've been waiting for. Here. Maurice sits up as I guide the car to the off-ramp onto the broken asphalt of a local road. Maurice says nothing, experienced enough with my clairvoyance to trust my judgment. The redwoods seem even taller as we continue, their gargantuan height blocking out the waning sun and trapping us in a kind of artificial twilight. After a couple of miles, a worn single-story building appears around the bend, a weather-beaten sign out front naming it Lou's Place. My telepathic pings flare, so I pull into the gravel lot and kill the ignition. I close my eyes and concentrate, reading what I can from the structure. A blood-red cloud engulfs my vision as the sweet scent of prey clings to my nostrils. An orb of brilliant silver shines bright overhead. It calls to me, and I drown in its song. Yeah, this is the place to start. We sure there isn't a history around here, Maurice? Nah, Morg, not much of one at least. Past few years, they've had a few unexplained deaths around the time of the full moon, but no pattern. Not like the last six months, anyway. A rash of killings have attracted us out west. Over the last half year, every full moon has brought more bodies. Every one horrifically flayed, mauled, partially eaten, violated. Mostly 50 spread over as many square miles of Humboldt County. The local authorities don't know what to think, but Maurice and I have a pretty good idea. Well... Let's see what Lou can tell us. I step out of the car, my heavy boots crunching in the gravel, dark hair rippling in the light breeze that carries the invitingly earthy smell of the surrounding forest. Maurice follows close behind, his large frame and imposing presence. I didn't need him, but it's nice to have backup when the going gets crazy. Maurice placed a hand on my arm as I reached out to touch the door. Remember, Morgan, no matter what we get here, tonight is strictly recon. It's a full moon, and if it is a wolfman, anything more'd be suicide. Got it, you big baby. Now stop worrying and let's get the work. I shove past him and push my way inside. The tap room is as dingy as I expect, and completely lifeless save for the old man tendering the bar, absently wiping its chipped surface with a stained rag. I saunter up and perch onto one of the stools, Maurice lowering his bulk beside me. The bartender gives us a look, first a surprise, then concern, before quickly hiding it behind a mask of seeming nonchalance. What'll it be, darlin'? 
I resist the urge to roll my eyes and glance over the unimpressive line of half-empty bottles behind him. Bourbon, double on the rocks. Whatever's cheap. He nods. And you, big fella? Just seltzer. Lime if he got it. The man moves to fetch the drinks. He's nervous about something, anxiety practically sweating off of him. I lean into the bar. Lou, is it? He nods almost imperceptibly, ice clinging softly in the glass as he pours. Been here a while? Uh, yep, going on about 25 years now. Huh, long time. So, what do you know about Wolfman, Lou? I mentally pick up a shot of sheer panic ripped through the man an instant before the glass shatters on the floor. I'm actually surprised how well he keeps his composure as he turns back to us. You need to leave. I throw him a winning smile. Lou, my man, you leave all these ladies this unsatisfied? Get out! His face cracks, the fear behind his eyes pouring through. Please, you don't know what you're walking into, darling. I open my mouth to respond. Oh, I think I do. Come on. Marie stands and hauls me to my feet, pulling me towards the door. Hey! I awkwardly stumble outside. Even the pre-twilight intense after the dim recesses of the bar. What the F, Maurice? Real subtle, Morgana. Whatever, man. Get off me. I'm going back. He lets me go. Nah, I'm pulling seniority. What the F? Maurice shakes his head. No point. We know enough. The guy is obviously involved with whatever's going on. You picked that much up from your first vision, yeah? I nod reluctantly. Okay. Now, his reaction tells us that we're right about a wolfman. We stick here trying to get more info. He might give it to us, sure. Or... His eyes shift to the full moon slowly beginning to rise above the treetops. It could throw a wrench on things. So instead, we're going to ditch the car get loaded up, and come back to see what happens. If nothing goes down because you already messed it up, we could always question him later. His brow shifts. Any objections? I respond with a sneer, but stay silent. I know he's right. He smiles. Glad you're on board. We get to the Impala, and I crank the ignition. The car sends up a spray of gravel as I throw it in reverse and peel out onto the road. After about a quarter mile, I spot a worn deer trail and turn into the wood line. Wordlessly, I exit the car. Maurice joins me at the trunk and we go about readying our weapons. Two silver-coated knives clipped onto my belt, six inches long and carrying a serrated edge. I pull my long duster back to see to Smith & Wesson in the holster I'm wearing, the revolver loaded with 38 silver bullets I cast myself. Maurice had donned a custom leather bandolier. He situates a machete over one shoulder, the blade specifically treated with silver the same as my knives, and a double-barreled shotgun over the other. Extra silver slugs line the crossed belts wrapped across his chest. We exchange a nod and slip into the trees back towards Luz. Once we get inside to the building, we hunker down and wait for something interesting to happen. It doesn't take long. After maybe 20 minutes, an old junker screams down the road, pulls into the lot, and practically runs into the wall of the bar. An unremarkable looking man jumps out stopping briefly to untangle himself from the seatbelt before ducking inside. I close my eyes and extend my senses. 
It's hard to pick up any precise thoughts from the man. He's so blinded by fear and rage. I did manage to capture the image of a woman, blonde hair and snarls, face red and ugly from crying, but nothing more. The man stays inside for maybe three minutes, muffled sounds of shouting reaching us even as far away as we were, before he stumbles outside to the car and roars off, back the way he came. I raise my eyebrows at Maurice, who shrugs. Come on. I pulled my pistol free as we cautiously made our way to the bar entrance. Maurice rests his hands on the machete handle and steps inside as I follow close behind. Lewis sprawled on one of the bar stools, several of the formerly empty half bottles now completely drained and littered about him. I move to the old man. I never did get my bourbon. His quiet laugh does little to cover a sob. Sorry, darling. I went and drank it all. Knew the jig was up when you started asking questions. What's going on, Lou? Suppose it doesn't matter now. Reckon you were probably watching the place. Saw my buddy Larry. Tried to call him, tell him not to come. But he was already on his way here earlier on accounts of those bastards. He stops, finds a not-quite-empty bottle, taking a drink. Biker gang call themselves Sons of Romulus, operate out of an abandoned pot grow a bit north of here. Outlaws, no regret for anything. Always been a little off, but the last few months they've been downright sadistic, abducting people left and right. Everybody's too scared to do anything. Well, earlier today, they took Larry's ex-wife right out of her kitchen. Neighbors in her 70s, and she saw the whole thing, called Larry. Wish she hadn't. He takes another drink, kills the bottle, drops it. He came here hoping I'd help get her back. I feel for her. Lacey's a sweet gal, and God knows what those effers are doing to her, though I could probably imagine. Enough bodies been piling up. He sighs. But even if I wasn't so effed up, I still wouldn't go. The sons, they're unnatural. Got abilities. But even that ain't it. It's... He trails off, his eyes flickering to the pale moon shining brightly through the dirty bar window. The wolf? Maurice's voice is quiet, practically a whisper. Lou doesn't speak but the abject terror in his face is answer enough. Maurice moves to the door. Let's go. I rush to catch my partner as he steps outside. Hey! Lou calls after us. Hey, wait! I ignore the old man, Maurice's long strides practically forcing me to jog as he walks back towards the stashed car. What the hell are we doing, Maurice? Going to help that woman and this Larry guy, obviously. One of those bikers must be a wolfman, maybe more than one. We know the direction of their headquarters. With luck, your talent will be able to guide us in. Yeah, what happened to just recon tonight? Anything else is suicide, huh? Morgan. His look is pained. You know better than anyone what it's like to be helpless and trapped with a monster in the dark. Past terrors flash through my mind. Cold red eyes burn into my soul as I'm lost in a living fog. Memories shift, and I'm lying paralyzed in a room of white, the sounds of choked screams echoing nearby. Damn it. Fine. In and out, assuming Lacey isn't dead already. We get her and get gone. Agreed. And for the record, I think this is a stupid idea, and it's your fault if it blows up in our faces. You could say I told you so. That'll make me feel so much better when we're dead. Maurice smiles lightly. As long as you're happy. I only sneer in response. 
We reach the Impala and get back on the road in short order, moving in the direction we saw Larry fly off. We drive for a couple miles, just enough for me to start hoping my telepathy won't pick up anything. When I catch the barest whiff of the oily, mentally stench, I've come to associate with malignant, supernatural entities. With a curse under my breath, I shove down my better judgment and follow. Ten miles and several turns later, the scent is so strong it's nauseating. I pull to the side of the road and look to my partner. We're close. This is your circus, chum. What's the plan? Maurice paused for a moment, considering. Lou mentioned an old grow plant, which means structures. Let's get eyes on and go from there. I nod in agreement. We exit the car and move into the brush, continuing towards the source. The emissions are so overpowering, I'm forced to stop and collect my bearings more than once. God, it's like someone opened a doorway to hell. There's so much pain here. I think of the mutilated bodies that have been turning up in Shudder. We come to a break in the tree line, overlooking a clearing that houses two buildings, one significantly larger than the other. Huh. No signs of Larry. You get a read on anything, Morg? I shake my head. No. Too much negative energy from this far out. Maurice grunts, understanding. You up the search? I nod. Yeah, should be able to manage a basic mental cloak. Besides, if you found Lacey, she'd probably freak at your ugly mug. He smiles. Fair. I'll check the smaller one first. Looks like it's got a padlock. Might be where they keep captives. I closed my eyes and concentrated at the space in the center of my forehead, taking several long breaths. Is it working? Can barely see you, just a ripple in the air. Good, watch my back. Always. I move from the foliage and start cautiously towards the structures. The sons may not be able to see me, but who knows if they have alarms or booby traps rigged. To my surprise, I reach the smaller building without any sign of enemies. Maurice was right about it having a padlock. I got a set of picks I'm decently handy with, but those will take time. Better to determine if Lacey's inside before circumventing the lock. But even this close, I still can't get a good read on the damn thing. I move to the side of the building and spy a small dirt-encrusted window. Taking the corner of my coat sleeve, I wipe away some of the grime to peer inside and immediately wished I hadn't. The light of the full moon shined just enough to reveal the interior of the shed. Dozens of human skins, dried and hanging like leather. Damn it. Stifling the urge to vomit, I turned away, hands only shaking slightly, moving to the larger building that must have once been the grow house. Reaching it, I try the front door and find it unlocked. I pause to draw my pistol, taking a steadily breath, and softly push my way inside. The interior darkness swallows me alive, waves of malignant energy clutching and cloying. I take a moment to let my eyes adjust and my breath catch in my throat. The inside of the grow house is one large room. Bikers laid sprawled asleep seemingly everywhere on tables and chairs, and even passed out in the middle of the floor. The mixed stench of blood and sweat and booze combined with the hostile mental energy assaults me, and it's all I could do to not choke. Which one's the Wolfman? Shouldn't he have turned by now? Can't tell. Everyone here looks human, more or less. Count my blessings. Cautiously, ever so quietly, I pick my way through the drunken mass to the back of the grow house. There, 
Separated from the main area, I find another small room containing a large locked cage, five feet in all dimensions. The lone occupant, silently weeping in the corner, is a match for the image I pulled earlier from Larry's mind. Lacey. I set down my pistol and ease the picks from my pocket. Select one in a torque bar. So far, luck is with me. The lock is easy to trip and no one seems the wiser. I replace the tools and pick my gun back up, easing the door open. I grit my teeth at the slight squeak of metal, but the only response from any of the sons in the other room is a loud snore. Lacey sits up confused, and I can see she has been stripped naked. H who's there? Her voice drops to a terrified whisper. P please, don't hurt me anymore. I consider for a moment. Look, don't freak out. I drop my mental veil. To her credit, she manages only a stifled gasp as I shuck out of my duster. Lacey, my name is Morgan. My partner and I are here to help. I'm close enough to sense her emotions now. A silver of hope cutting through the stink of fear. Here. I pass her the coat and she wraps it around herself. Oh, thank God. They're monsters. They change. Shh. I know. Quiet. We aren't anywhere close to being out of here. Keeping one hand on Lacey, the other on my gun, I guide her out into the room of sleeping sons that seem to have somehow grown three sizes in length. This is going to be a miracle if we get out. No sooner has the thought passed that a biker rolls over in his sleep, tripping Lacey. With a shriek of surprise, she falls into a table, knocking several glass beakers to the ground, shattering. Pandemonium breaks loose. I grab Lacey by the arm and sprint her towards the door. The bikers rose from their drunken stupor more quickly than I would have hoped, hooting and hollering as they chase after us. A gorilla of a man steps into my path and I shoot him in the head, brain and bone exploding out of the back of his skull. I shift my aim and fire off two more shots, dropping a pair of suns. The group's mocking turns angry, and several pull rings from pockets and slip them onto fingers, their forms shifting. In moments, the men are replaced by snarling wolves the size of ponies. They flow in a pack formation around Lacey and I, yipping and barking as I waste the rest of my ammo trying to hit them. I drop the gun and draw my knife, crouching in a defense posture, doing my best to keep Lacey behind me. The wolves circle in, snapping and snarling. One of the still human bikers steps forward. Man, babe, you've killed some of my crew and you're going to pay for that. He grins. Hope y'all like doggy style. The others laugh and howl in approval. Hey! The spoken word is quiet and calm, but nevertheless reaches the whole room. All of us, human and wolf alike, look at the door. Whatever we expect to find there, it isn't Larry. His slight, naked frame standing in the entrance. That's my wife, you fudge sticks! Besides me, I feel fear explode from Lacey at the sight of her now ex-husband. The light of the full moon shining on him, the pieces suddenly falling into place. Oh, fudge. Where the werewolves changed seamlessly, Larry's transformation is the stuff of nightmares. He screams as bones crack and rearrange, his face elongated into a fang-filled cavern of razor-sharp teeth. We watch as one mouths agape as the change completes. The beast stands to his full height, towering over us, yellow eyes emitting nothing but hunger and rage. And then, the killing starts. 
the Wolfman flies into the bikers as they try to escape his claws opening flesh with every thrust of his massive paws. One of the werewolves leaps at the monster's throat, but Larry turns and catches the attacker's head in his enormous jaws, its skull popping like a grape. It's over in an instant. It takes me a moment to realize that, besides the bikers already dead and those quickly bleeding out, somehow Lacey and I are the only ones left with the creature. With a snarl, Larry leaps at us. Too stunned to move herself, I tackle Lacey to the ground in a panic. A glancing blow from the wolf sending us spinning across the floor. Desperately, I throw myself on top of her and try to pull a mental veil over us unsuccessfully. I scream in defiance, brandishing the knife I had managed to keep a hold of as Larry regains his balance and charges with a roar. The gun blast behind me is deafening, the silver slug punching through the wolfman's chest and dropping him to the ground with a whimper. The beast tries to regain his feet, but Maurice calmly steps past me, points the barrel at the monster's head, and puts a second round through his eye. I gingerly push myself to my feet, examine the carnage around me. Nice shot, I pause. Thanks. Maurice nods in acknowledgement as he reloads. I spy my dropped revolver and retrieve it, taking my partner's cue and reloading. Maurice moves to Lacey where she lies unconscious. I hear him inhale sharply. Morgan. I look where he's pointing, seeing the deep furrows ripping into her shoulder by Larry's claw. Sorrow, quickly followed by an icy rage, fills my chest. Dang it. I only consider a moment before taking my revolver and putting it in her limp hand. Morgan, what are you doing? I shrug. Giving her an option. I indicate the massacre around us. You didn't feel it? She was terrified, Maurice. It's like you said, you don't F around with the Wolfman. I stand and move to the door. Come on, let's get out of here before Lou finds the balls to call the cops and, uh... I look at my partner over my shoulder. I told you so, a-hole. Fighting bitter tears, I walk out into the night. The light of the full moon guiding my way. Anna and her father look down at the bloody goat carcass on their porch in silence. It was the third of their livestock to be slaughtered that month. The bodies always ended up in front of the house. This one was closer than the others. They stood there for some time, side by side. Anna was a thin girl of 13 with dark blonde hair that hung down over her shoulders in limp curtains. Had she lived a different life, she probably would have been almost beautiful. But her face was hard and perpetually determined in an unnerving sort of way. It mirrored her father's. Her eyes were large, round and grayish blue. They were alert, but flat and somewhat calculating. The few folks in town who had had the rare chance of conversing with her found that it was somewhat unnerving to have those cold eyes looking at you. They seemed to know just what they were hiding in your head. No pleasantries necessary with this young woman. Her disposition made a good farmer though, like her father. She was precise with her work and unbothered by the business of raising and slaughtering animals on the farm. Her eyes flicked up to her father. He, Jareth, a mostly silent but not unkind man, turned his eyes, which were not at all flat, but fiery and golden brown back at her. He nodded. They hauled the body to the back field together, 
although one of them could have moved it alone. It was not a large goat, and it was missing its head and innards, which lessened the weight significantly. That night, they burned the goat's body in a pit that had become the designated burning spot. They didn't want to use the contaminated and mangled meat, and they didn't want any animals coming in and sniffing around after it. Or maybe they didn't want whatever thing had been tearing up their livestock to come back. Either way, it felt like the right thing to do, and it had become a sort of ritual for them. One that each of them secretly felt was its own kind of ancient magic to ward off evil or bad luck. Or whatever it is that poor folks used to explain their misfortune. Anna's mother, Ellen, would watch from the window when they did this, her face a frozen mask of worry. She didn't like the woods and she didn't like the killing. She did the housework and had planned on doing the child rearing. But there had only been one child, Anna, and Anna took care of herself. So it was just Ellen, hiding inside, keeping her mind busy as Anna and Jareth did their duties every day, and now they're burning every night. That night, Anna had a dream. She dreamed she was wandering through the woods near their farm. But everything was bigger. The brush was so thick, she could barely push her way through. There was no path, just leaf-lined ground and trees so thick they blotted out the sunlight. She was frightened, and every noise made her pause and wait. She felt that something was stalking her. She could smell it. It smelled like the burning goat, burning flesh. Then the pain started. It ran up her legs to her hip bones. It felt like every bone was splintering and trying to push through her flesh. She felt her arm bones go hollow, like something was eating the marrow inside, sucking it out. Her body creaked like dry twigs and she screamed. She looked down to see her knees bending agonizingly backward and her collarbone jutting out against her tightening skin. She knew somehow that her bones were gone, replaced by animal bones, bird bones, light and brittle and sharp. She fell to the forest floor, the weight of the meat in her body crackling with her new frail skeleton. Her fingertips were bleeding and she saw the tips of sharp talons pushing through her nail beds. The pain was like fire, and she had wished she would die. Wished the darkening forest would take her fast so that the awful pain would stop. And then, it did. And it was dark. She heard a voice in the blackness coughing and wheezing out of the words, Killing Harvest. Harvest for the Blood Moon Child. Anna awoke in her bed crying hot tears, her throat throbbing from her choked screams. She looked at her fingers, wanting for some insane moment to see the sharp talons so that she might tear them down her face and rip her eyes out. And then, the reality of the cold room brought her dream-drenched brain back to normalcy. Her face changed back to its normal state so quickly, it was as if she had never stirred at all. She just sat there on her bed, staring blankly at the window across the room at the half moon that hung there, her hair clinging to the sweat on her forehead. Finally, she looked down at herself and saw that her underwear was drenched in blood. It was her first time. That morning, Anna grabbed her knapsack and her mother's grocery list from the kitchen and headed in the town. She hadn't said a word to her mother about her supposed induction to womanhood. She had simply cleaned herself up and scrubbed the evidence out of her sheets and underwear as best as she could. She wasn't surprised by the arrival of her first blood. She knew what it was all about but didn't seem like the kind of thing her mother would want to hear about. 
change often upset her. So off, Anna went with some tissue stuffed in her underwear, and her usual determination to get to work of the day finished. She walked down the dirt road leading to the farm, looking down at her battered old work boots as she kicked rocks and worked her way towards the main road. Suddenly, a bloody mass of fur came into her sightline. She stopped, her boot only six inches away from it. She stopped and stared down at it. It was a cat, or rather, it had been. Now it was hardly recognizable as anything at all. It was just a blob of black, blood-matted fur. She could only tell it was a cat because of the sharp teeth jutting out of the small, crunched head. One triangle ear still stood out on top. She felt ill at the sight of it. It wasn't a cat she had seen before, but its closeness to the farm made her uneasy. They were like psychotic gifts, left around the property for her and her family to find. Or maybe she was just falling too far into her father's psyche. For all the stoicism her father had on the outside, he had just as much superstition and paranoia about the world rolling around on the inside. At night, when they stood by the fire, if there was something to be burned that night, he would tell her his theories. He had many, and they were not full of the kind of magic that Anna would have liked to hear. They were dark and violent ideas about what the world was really made of. He was not the kind of father who would tell you not to fear monsters in the closet. He would look you directly in the eye and tell you to be wary of them, and maybe keep a knife under your pillow. Anna pulled her thoughts and her eyes away from the cat and moved on down the road. When she made it to town, she was reminded again of how secluded their lives on the farm were. She only came in the town maybe once a month. Mostly, they got on eating off the farm or had some things delivered. She looked around at the entertainment, a movie theater, a comic book store, a small wooden playground in the park. They all seemed odd to her. The only thing she really liked to do for fun was read. It didn't seem there was time for much else, and although she didn't know it, her mind was far more mature than most people her age. She had bigger thoughts in her head than watching a cartoon movie about talking dogs, or reading beauty magazines telling her how to get some models look with five simple tips. She felt like an alien whenever she came in the town. None of it made much sense to her. She went into the store to get her mother some soap and baking necessities. She got what she needed and briefly stopped in an aisle with feminine hygiene products, but didn't know where to begin to choose something or what to do with it if she did. She decided that she would use the tissue technique until she asked her mother about it. She supposed that was inevitable, and she would just have to deal with the awkwardness of that conversation. On her way out of the store, paper bag in hand, she nearly ran into a boy whose name she couldn't remember. She had seen him a few times when her mother used to take her to church. His parents owned one of the biggest white Victorian houses on Main Street. She supposed they were rich, but that didn't mean much to her, except that he and his mother and brothers probably didn't have daily work to do around the house, and they certainly didn't have to skip any meals. This boy was pale and soft, with little sunken eyes that darted around as he talked. He looked at her chest several times during their brief conversation. She noticed men did that now, and she barely had much to speak of in the way it curved yet. She somewhat felt they were checking the sea, or rather waiting to see when she would be ripe enough, to see if she had turned woman yet. She supposed now she had and wondered if this boy could smell it on her. Have you heard about all the dead animals? He said with a grin too wide for such a statement. Anna just stared at him. I said, have you heard about something killing all the animals? 
My daddy said there's a wolf or a bear or something roaming around out here in the woods. But my ma says it's the devil come to reap. Reap? She said, her eyes locking on this. Yeah, you know, take from us for our sins. Punishment for what we are. He listed off, obviously parroting everything his mother told him. And what are we? She said, feeling lightheaded and wanting to run away from his moony cottage cheese face. Humans, we're full of sin and lust. You know about what, right? My mom says girls are the most sinful, especially trashy little sluts like you. He said. He caressed one of her small, newly formed breasts and winked at her. He was laughing at her, sneering at her, perhaps thinking he was really doing a fine and dandy job of making conversation on this lovely afternoon. Oh wait, that's right. My friend Tim says you farm folk only screw animals, is that right? He actually laughed out loud at this. Her head felt like it was full of bees, and a veil of red fury flowed lower over her field of vision. She dropped her grocery bag, raising her arm up and brought it back down with the swiftness of a cat. Raking her nails across his cheek, it drew blood. The boy screamed and pushed her away. He clenched his bloody cheek and backed away from her. He tripped over the curb and into the street and landed on his cushioned ass. Anna walked over to him calmly, silently, and brought her foot up and down directly onto his genitals. He coughed out a dry scream, tears streaming down his face, rolling back and forth, crying. You, you, you witch! He was crying like an infant, his face as red as a tomato, writhing in the street. Anna stood over him, one leg on each of them, and leaned down into his face. He was silent immediately and looked up at her with eyes like saucers. She crouched down and looked at him, her nose only three inches from his. There wasn't a hint of anger on her face then, just cold, analytical curiosity. We don't screw animals, we slaughter them. She said, he whimpered. Do you know how to use a knife? No answer from him, just wide-eyed fear. I do, she said. She pulled a hunting knife out of her boot. I could bleed you dry with two cuts, here and here. She mimed, slitting his throat and his stomach with the edge of the knife. He closed his eyes and promptly peed his pants. She stood up and gathered her groceries. There were a few people standing on store stoops looking at her, looking at her like she was some kind of beast. She looked back indifferently and then turned and walked home. That night, Anna had another dream. In this dream, she was standing in the middle of her bedroom. The wooden floorboards and white walls were all silvery gray in the moonlight. She could hear scratching coming from the walls and the floor. The sound was light at first, and then it got louder, more desperate. She heard a low, mewling sound start from under her bed. It sounded like a cat in pain, but then it was screeching louder like a hawk, and the sound was everywhere. It was inside her head. She put her hands to her ears to try to block it out, but that only made it worse. Her back was against her windowsill now, and she heard the crying coming from outside. It was human crying. Her eyes snapped open and she could feel the cool air from the window, and she knew she was awake. She turned and looked out the window and saw her father shambling towards the pigsty. He was shouting to himself, crying, dry heaving, but still walking towards the animals. She slipped down the hall and passed her mother and father's room. The door was slightly ajar, and she could see her mother standing at their window in her nightgown watching him too. 
She turned towards her daughter and her face looked as white as the moon, as white as bone. She looked like a corpse. For a moment, Anna had a wild thought that it was a mannequin, something her mother had put up for sewing, but then it moved towards her. She walked towards the door, looking at Anna with nothing but pity and deep sadness and shut the door. She heard her mother drag a chair over and prop it underneath the door handle. Anna pulled herself away from the door and wandered down the hallway to the stairs. She wanted to go back to her room and lock her own door, but she couldn't. She was scared for herself, but more scared for her father. Something was wrong with him. Something had been wrong with him for a long time, but she felt that it was being kept from her. That secret. Her father seemed to disappear into himself around this time every year, and her mother warned her to keep some distance from him. She said it was the work, the harvest season that gave him stress. She left the house through the back screen door and stepped out into the cool night, her bare feet touching the damp grass as she walked towards the sound of squealing pigs. She approached the pin slowly and could see the pigs pushing towards the fencing. They were trying to get away from something and there was a clear circle in the center of the pin. Then a scream, high and human-like, cut through the night. The rest of the pigs went silent, but for that one dying animal in the center. Then, it went silent too. She moved closer, her legs trembling, threatening to give way, and she saw a figure rise up. It was her father, but he was changed his shoulders enormous and hulking, his mouth too big and dripping, his face long and pointing like a hyena. He was clutching half of the pig in fingers that looked like claws, gnarled and sharp and much too long. He was covered in blood that looked black in the moonlight. He looked up at the moon and cried out. He howled, an agonizing cry that made her moan with fear. Then he knelt again, and she could hear gurgling, ripping sounds. She tried to run, but her knees buckled and she knelt there, sobbing. She put her hand over her mouth to stop the sounds. She looked back towards the house and saw her mother's ghostly figure in the window, watching. The pig started to squeal again and she looked back and saw the beast standing in the center looking right at her, gore and flesh hanging from his mouth. His eyes were black sockets with flickers of sickly yellow light burning deep down, down through the tunnels that seemed miles long. He locked eyes with her, and she saw his body convulsing once, flinching at her presence and then going stiff as he assessed his prey. She screamed then, loud, and managed to make it to her feet. He made a lightning-fast move towards the fence to get to her, but stumbled on the circling, grunting pigs. She saw him go down. She ran towards the woods to try to cut to the road. All her mind could think was to get in the town, to get some help. She pushed through the trees and bushes, oblivious to the scratches that were opening up on her face and arms from the sharp bramble. She ran, her throat on fire and her body numb. She ran until she got to the clearing. It was so bright from the moonlight, she squinted against it. She saw the path that led to the road on the other side, but it was obstructed by a mound of dirt and debris in the center. She ran towards it, but as she got closer, she saw it wasn't a pile of dirt. It was a pile of bloodied animal carcasses. There must have been nearly a hundred dead animals piled high, their dead eyes staring dumbly this way and that. Suddenly, she was being hurled to the ground. The wind was knocked out of her, and before she could even try to take a shuddering breath, she felt her arms being pinned down. 
Something was on top of her. Then something hit her. She felt an explosion of pain on her right cheek as warm blood dripped down into her ear. She looked up dazed and saw that it was a boy. It was the boy from town. Two figures appeared on either side of him, his friends. Her eyes rolled back and forth between them trying to focus. Another hit to her eye and the pain jolted her back into reality. She looked into the eyes of the boy and could see the fury there. Got you, you dumb witch. He spat in her face. The other boys laughed. She realized the one to her left had a bat and the one on the right had a rope. The boy on top of her leaned down into her face. You're going to be nice now, right? I figured you might want to apologize to me. We're going to have a good time now. He was smiling. Anna whipped her head up and crushed his nose with her forehead. Fresh blood exploded out of his face and flooded her mouth. She coughed and spit. He screamed. Tie her up! He screamed. The other boys began to tie her arms and legs. I knew you and your family were a bunch of frickin' freaks. I knew it! They'll give me a damn medal for putting a stop to this evil shit. He looked at the pile of animals and then to the surrounding woods. She could see her fear being his anger. But first, we're going to have some fun, he said. He licked her face from chin to eyebrow. He looked at her, wanting to see her fear, her submission. She spat blood into his eyes. She had plenty in her mouth. He grunted and wiped his stinging eyes with his shirt sleeve. He looked at her with such hate that she knew he probably meant to kill her. He put his hands over her throat and started to squeeze. One of the boys laughed and howled like a wolf, but not like any real animal. They sounded small and foolish in the dark of the forest where the real monsters roamed. The boy was straddling her, holding her neck and smiling and then he sat up and howled at the moon as well. There was a whizzing sound and then a thud and his head was gone. Anna gulped in fresh air as his grip loosened and then fell away. His body slumped over and fell to the ground. The other boys were screaming, running. She rolled over on her side, gasping for breath, and saw her father, or what he had become, standing over her. He looked at her and then leapt over to the boy's rolling head. He picked it up and tossed it onto the pile of dead animals and then went off into the trees after the other two. On the other side of the clearing, closest to the road, Anna could see dark figures lining the trees, some with torches. She didn't know how many were there. They were watching. Then suddenly, they began to retreat back towards the town. She could see there were many, stretching all the way back to the road. Anna closed her eyes. The shock and loss of oxygen was too much for her, and everything went black. When she woke up, she breathed in some cold air and sat up. The sky was starting to lighten with the day. Her ties were cut, and she sat up and saw her father was crouching next to the rotten pile nearby. She looked at the pile of animals and saw the heads of the three boys neatly lined up on top, their faces eternally frozen in screams. Father and daughter regarded each other. His eyes were his. He seemed afraid of her, ashamed maybe. She crawled to him put her arms around his neck and hugged him gratefully. He wrapped his arms around hers and hugged her back. Looking over his back, she could see a ring of more carcasses, deer, dogs, cows, and more bloody meat sacrifices that she couldn't identify. Didn't dare try to identify for her own sanity's sake. They were littering the tree line where the townspeople had stood their own yearly offerings left to be collected. He picked her up and carried her back to the house, 
their duties for that year's harvest complete. Pop? She looked up at him with tired eyes. He looked down at her. Those boys, she started. They won't be missed. Their parents should have taught them the rules. You're a woman now. It's time your mother and I teach you too. It's time you know what you are. Anna closed her eyes and slept. I am a private contractor who specializes in investigations, meaning people hire me to investigate and deal with troublesome tasks they can't quite handle themselves or doesn't want to get their hands dirty and wants someone else to take care of things. It has taken me to virtually all over the world's major hotspots in addition to numerous other countries you wouldn't expect. Upon being given a new assignment, I met my supervisors in a bland conference room where they filled me in. As usual, they were all dressed in overpriced business attire that looked good but did not justify the price tag while they sat around a mahogany table that was polished to the shine that was bright enough I could practically see my reflection in it. Your objective is this man. Dr. Longstreet. The guy at the head of the conference table said before he flipped to the picture of a man in his late 40s with a widow's peak and penetrating green eyes. He is working on a project that is of great interest to many people. What kind of project? Genetic engineering. Okay, and what's the problem? The good doctor has contracted out to work on a research project, but for one reason or another, his employers lost contact with him, and his employers are people who never normally need help, and they want our help on this. You don't say. I do, and that's where you come in. Your objective is to reach the island where Longstreet is holed up, and report back what you see. Once that has been achieved, we'll have a better grasp of the situation and what to do about it. Understood. Your contact for this is Gazelle. Rendezvous with her within a few days and she will help you the rest of the way. The dossier file on Longstreet and other background materials will be provided to you when you leave here. Good luck. Thank you. Said background material was indeed provided, and I spent the journey to the island parsing through it. Dr. Longstreet was an interesting character to say the least. Born to a well-off family, Charles Longstreet had gone to the best boarding schools and graduated top of his class at Harvard and Harvard Medical School. After that came the usual litany of internships, residencies, and other assorted professional milestones, each more prestigious than the last. That was why when it came time to put a professional in charge of a big-time project, Dr. Longstreet was the top choice. At first, he exceeded their wildest expectations, delivering encouraging results time and time again. But somewhere along the line, something went sour. The reports weren't quite sure what happened, but the why didn't matter so much as the what. And at some point, he had abandoned his assigned tasks and had just invented his own. Then they stopped being able to reach him altogether. That made certain people nervous. And people who aren't used to being nervous don't like it which meant he was now officially a problem. Flipping through the various reports, memos, and other notes in the files, it was clear that whatever was going on with Longstreet had truly disturbed them. It was a sight seeing the notes and communications go from mild irritation 
to full-blown concern. But the unwritten thing that screamed off the page was that it disturbed them because it should not have happened, as the doctor was one of the best and the brightest. But that was no surprise to me, as people can live with something going sour so long as it's something that makes sense. But when something bad happens that defies all logic, that rattles people. That's why the whole mad scientist thing had been a staple of stories for so long. The entire reason I have this job, for which I am incredibly well compensated, is when illogical things happen, and it rattles people who never get rattled. And boy, were they rattled over whatever Longstreet was up to. Or more specifically, they were rattled whatever he was up to was now out of their direct control. More interesting to me personally was the fact I wasn't the first person being sent the check on the doctor. First, they sent in another doctor. But when he didn't check back in, they sent in someone else. Some in-house guy who handled security issues for them in the past. But when he went the way of their previous effort, that's when they decided someone else should handle it. And when I got there, my objective was to find my way to Longstreet's lab and report back my findings. From what the dossier said, the doctor was holed up on an island all alone and maybe one or two other people. That was bad news. Of all the things you could do to someone to slowly drive them insane without much effort, solitary confinement is number one on the list. What makes it so powerful is that you think it's easy. It's not an overt form of torture or punishment. In fact, some people think spending all your time alone would be heavenly. But it slowly gets to almost everyone. It's just a question of how long it takes. I was eventually dropped off at my rendezvous point. An old freyer stationed off the coast of a chain of islands in the Pacific. There, my contact, Gazelle, was waiting for me at the spot near the water. With her soft brown hair and knowing smile, she looked like any other content beachgoer on vacation. But it was her eyes that gave her away. Almost unnaturally blue. And I could see them studying everything and everyone around her. And not in an arrogant way, either. She was simply observing and studying what was occurring in her vicinity a trait I knew quite well myself. Carter? she asked. Correct. I reached out to shake her hand. Nice to meet you. Likewise. Thank you for coming. Of course. So, what's the story? I heard he's working on some kind of genetic engineering project. That's one way to put it. I tend to put it another way. He's becoming a cliché mad scientist. She took a large tablet in hand and swiped through it. After a few moments, she handed it to me. At first, the footage was grainy, but then I could see and hear several people frantically running for their lives from a camera suspended from the ceiling above a giant tank of water so I could see the entire massive space. The water was deep blue and I could see in its depths was a massive black shadow. But then the camera zoomed in on something farther down the room, and I could see what looked like a giant glass greenhouse filled with trees and other plants. But unlike most greenhouses, the plants inside this one looked overgrown and wild. And for one brief moment, I saw a giant shadow leap out from behind some trees and maul something lying on the ground with a giant roar. Then the camera's feed went out. I stood there in shock. I had seen more than my fair share of disturbing things in this job, but this was unlike anything I had ever heard of before. In fact, watching that footage didn't even seem real. It was like watching a movie, and one with less production quality at that. 
but that's often how life goes. What isn't real can often look more plausible than absurdity that can be reality. I gave her the tablet back. What exactly is he working on? Charles was always fascinated with mythological beasts, but nothing held his interest like werewolves. Interesting. Why werewolves? Part of it was how the idea of a werewolf was so widespread across cultures and civilizations, but the majority of it came from the idea that it was treated like an actual disease that would manifest symptoms at certain times. I see where this is going. I'm sure. He kept remarking how the fact that the idea was so present in cultures made it hard not to think that there was more going on than just the metaphors or scary movies. Like there was some underlying basis for it all. I see. So how do you know so much about Longstreet? I used to be one of his main lab assistants. That's how I got the layout of the island and all the facilities. Interesting. So how do you feel about what I've been asked to do? Fine. She shrugged. The long street I knew died long ago. I don't recognize the person he is now. What happened to him? She ran a hand through her hair and studied me. I can't tell you how long I've thought about that question. Maybe longer than I've ever thought about any one question in my life. The best I could say is that I don't think it was a clear-cut thing. More of a slow evolution. But the short answer is... I truly believe the line between sanity and insanity is far thinner than we care to believe. And sometimes the line gets moved closer without us even realizing it. Sometimes people even move the line by their own behavior. That was Charles. He got a taste of true power. The power of life and death. And it was not a good result. I see. And now you can see for yourself. She said while giving me a piece of paper. Here's the map of the island. Everything is on here. Good luck. I thanked her for all the help before I got ready to head to the island. Once my gear was all set and the boat was properly equipped for the voyage, I studied the island map and steered out to sea. There was a slight breeze that got more powerful as I cruised along. I occasionally passed a sailboat or yacht filled with happy ocean travelers. But apart from that, it was quiet on the sea. I arrived at my destination about an hour later. The humidity was so strong it hung in the air like a wall. It gave the atmosphere a surreal, almost dreamlike quality. Everything was like a mirage. For Dr. Longstreet, it seemed to be exactly that. The island's appeal for the doctor was obvious. This was no lush tropical paradise with white sandy beaches like something out of a travel brochure. This place was a mass of jagged rocks sticking out of every direction. There looked to be a few palm trees here and there, and who knows? Maybe there was a beach in there somewhere, but it was not a welcoming sight, which I'm sure was part of the plan. The island's layout showed that all the labs were underground and could be accessible on foot once you had gotten to the proper location via boat. According to the map, the way to get there was through a massive rocky passageway. Getting through it took serious time and effort. Everywhere you looked, there were jagged rocks and stalagmites descending from the ceiling and it didn't take long before the passage was pitch dark, and I needed to turn on the boat's lights just to see. As I slowly went along, I felt that the boat was being swallowed by a monster. It wasn't hard to understand why Longstreet had changed out here in particular. Isolation is a bad influence on anyone, but when you add in power on top of it, that could be a uniquely awful combination. Out here, Longstreet wasn't just a suit with an MD. He was the king of the castle. And suits with MD have a lot of influence to begin with. 
Since navigating the sea cave took so long, I had plenty of time to study the map of the island. I was currently in the series of interconnected caves that went from the ocean to the island's interior, where Longstreet's underground lab was. All I had to do was follow the cave until it ended, and I would eventually reach the labs. And many minutes later, I arrived at the metal door that was set in the rock wall. After I carefully stopped the boat and dropped anchor, I got all my gear ready, including my weapons to defend myself if need be, climbed over the rock ledge containing the door, checked to see if it was unlocked, and when I found it was, I gingerly pushed it open. I found myself facing the vast expanse of lab I had seen on the video footage. Seeing it in person was an entirely new experience and it seemed like every inch of space was taken up by some project that was sitting there incomplete. The room was one long corridor that allowed you to walk past and glance at everything going on, but all the various stations did was sit there, and that was the giveaway that the whole place was deserted. I could feel it in the air, which was heavy and silent. This should be the heart of the island, brimming with activity. Instead, all the lab equipment felt abandoned here. There was no whirling or clicking of computers, no liquids simmering away. It all looked more like a film set that had been forgotten and had a sad, neglected air. That meant something had happened. It wasn't pretty, and I was just now finding the aftermath with no idea what came before. That's something that applies for much of life in general. So many times we just stumble into the aftermath of something that had happened. We simply aren't aware of it. And we also aren't aware that we are cleaning up the pieces of a mess we don't even know exists. That's my job in a nutshell. With the difference I typically know what happened before. Or at least I have a clue about what happened before. After I passed a bunch of brand new computers that were sitting there with the screens off, it didn't take me long to find the wreckage of the greenhouse type structure. The glass had giant cracks in it, and when I got closer, I could see the glass also had giant claw marks embedded in it. That was my cue to take out my camera and get plenty of pictures and footage for those who had contracted my services. Once that was done, I kept exploring while my findings were reviewed. It didn't take long for me to receive contact to check elsewhere and see if there was any sign for what may have happened and where the doctor may have gone. So I stealthily crept through the maze of other lab buildings that also held living quarters and the seemingly endless expanse of vegetation that covered the island's interior. After about two hours, I eventually came to a hidden dock, and what I saw made my jaw drop. It was a cavernous space completely filled with boats. They vary greatly from small boats to yachts that were probably worth the GDP of entire countries. Some were decaying and rusted, while others were in flawless condition, but they all sat there silently. The effect was more than a little spooky. It seemed every inch of space was taken up by a boat with one exception. A gap near the end of the road near the hidden opening of a rock wall that led to the sea. I had no doubt the missing boat was where Dr. Longstreet and his associates were. So that was my cue to go back to my own boat and see what I could find. Steadily, I followed the same path I had taken, and eventually, I was back on board and ready to go. But by now the sun had set, and the island was rapidly fading into darkness. I was pleased to be leaving, as it seemed either there was no outdoor illumination, or it was not being activated for one reason or another. I quickly started the boat and steered my way back through the caves mentally trying to decide where to search first once I was back in open water. As I finally found myself heading out the sea, 
I looked up at the sky and saw it was a cloudless night. That meant I got a crystal clear view at the moon, which was full. I had to appreciate the irony. Maybe that was the essential truth about the werewolf story. The idea that a full moon does things to people. The term lunacy and lunatic come from the word lunar, which means moon. The correlation between the moon and human behavior has been studied and debated. But when you're dealing with ideas and folklore that transcend cultures and go back centuries upon centuries, arguing there is no clear connection doesn't quite hit home. Besides, just because people aren't sure how the full moon impacts humans doesn't give the full picture, because there are all those other creatures like wolves living on this planet as well. And sometimes we just don't know everything, because deep down, I don't think any person is meant to know everything. Just look at Dr. Longstreet. There's a huge difference between being knowledgeable and thinking you know everything. He clearly thought he knew everything, and from what the shape of his lab says, turns out he didn't. The sea is like life, an endless mystery that although we are a bit closer to understanding, still remains unfathomable in many ways. With the moon hovering above, I decided that Longstreet would take the boat to a location where he could presumably spend more time without anyone finding him. That meant another island or some kind of cove. According to the maps, the nearest thing to Longstreet's island was 15 miles away, and it was a lagoon. So that was my goal for now. With that decided, I settled in for a comfortable ride. The water was calm and lacked waves, so I got to relax and sail along. I spent a large piece of my life on boats. Going from one assignment to another means a lot of time traveling, and oftentimes it requires going to remote locations on water. So boats and I were very well acquainted. And while seeing the sun shimmer on the waves is stunning, nighttime was always my favorite time while out at sea. It's quiet and there's nothing but you, the sound of the ship, and the open sea. It helps you think and focus on the essentials. Because water is a witness to the entire scope of human history, and not just as a casual observer either. The Nile River, the English Channel, and countless other names on the map have helped decide which civilizations rise and which ones fall. And unlike fire, Water is eternal. The darker side of human existence is as steady and eternal as the sea. The appearance might change just like the ocean's rhythms and tides. But they're always there in some form. And it's not the sea itself that makes you think. Because people are creatures of habit, and telling stories about things they may or may not have happened is one habit. People think tales of pirates are just some bit of ancient history or ghost stories designed to scare travelers, but they're not. The age of cannons and the Jolly Roger may have gone away, but piracy went exactly nowhere. If anything, the Jolly Roger got an upgrade. And now pirates have automatic weapons instead of flintlock pistols, and instead of using a compass, they have sonar. And they don't hide out in some charming tourist trap where hotel employees are paid to dress up as pirates and walk around with a peg leg and a parrot on their shoulder. In reality, they have far more in common with drug traffickers than something sold at a Halloween store. Being out there on the open sea pursuing Longstreet reminded me that I was following in the footsteps of countless sailors going back centuries. I remember the first time I ever thought about the sea. I mean, when I truly sat and contemplated its depths. It's astounding when you think about it. The earth is far more water than land, about 70%, not to mention what inhabits the sea. Just think of all the shipwrecks that have occurred over the centuries. The sea is the largest graveyard on this planet. The salt water dissolves everything it touches. Just drinking the salt water could kill a human. 
That is the cruelest irony of it all. Imagine being surrounded by water and dying of thirst. The planet really belongs to the sea in all its contents. It's easy to forget until it isn't. Nature has a pesky way of reasserting itself. I was less than one mile from the lagoon when the ship came up on my sonar. The sound sent a shot of adrenaline through my body and I quickly slowed down as I approached the ship's location. Eventually, the ship in question appeared on the water and as I got closer, it seemed to grow larger with each passing moment. Despite the distance, I could tell the ship was either completely abandoned or had been mostly abandoned because something had happened. I was still a careful distance away when I grabbed my binoculars to grab a closer look. And what a sight it was. Because before airplanes were a thing, ships were the way to travel across the sea, and for the rich, no expense was spared. These things were essentially luxury hotels that floated. The boat that sat there silently in front of me was like that. Its impeccably polished surface gleamed in the moonlight with a shine that seemed almost unnatural. And the wooden deck looked so well cared for that for in any other situation, you would be beyond excited to relax on it while looking out at the water. But I wasn't in any other situation. And in the present one, the sight of the massive yacht all alone on the sea at night with no activity not only wasn't pleasant, it was a downright uncanny sight. It sat there silently like a sleeping animal. What bothered me most of all was the fact that there were numerous ships Longstreet and whoever else may be on board could have taken. I have no doubt there were faster and certainly far more suitable boats which means this one had specifically been chosen for a reason, whatever it may be. Traveling like I do, I spent a massive amount of time hanging out with people, often in bars and restaurants close to the water. Many times listening to stories as part of my job, but sometimes it's just fascinating to do. It's easy to see why all throughout history, Sailors and pirates have told stories in bars and in ship holes about what may be encountered on the sea. And a favorite type of tale was of ghost ships that had vanished and perhaps miraculously reappeared. They made for a fun story, but I never took it seriously. Seeing a giant yacht stationed out here in the middle of nowhere at night, seemingly abandoned and gleaming white in the glow of the full moon, was as close to a real ghost ship as I was likely to get. Especially because unlike the vast majority of ghost stories about abandoned ships, this one was real, and I could be pretty well confident something terrible had happened. So once I got as close as I dared, I slipped on my diving suit, carefully swam over to the giant yacht, and climbed the boat using the shiny metal ladder that spanned the back of the ship. I took each step with as much caution as possible, and when I finally touched the luxurious wooden deck, I walked over to the door of the ship's interior and opened it. That was when things got truly creepy, because the impeccable exterior couldn't hide the chaos inside. Everywhere I stepped, something expensive had been smashed, shattered, broken, or ripped. Chandeliers and dinner plates that probably cost more than my apartment was lying on the floor. The crystal beads now shattered everywhere like marbles. Crystal glasses so nice you would be afraid to pick up were ground down in the shards and beautiful red curtains were barely recognizable, as it looked like they had been ripped the ribbons one uses to wrap Christmas presents with. But the worst was the blood. It was scattered intermittently on walls and floors. By now it had dried, and it had coated the expensive wallpapers and polished wooden floors and spots with thick black smudges, and it was coupled by numerous scratches on the floor and walls. Deep scratches. One far deeper than human fingernails could cause. 
I took a deep breath and tried to focus. If there was this much blood, that meant there had to be bodies somewhere nearby. I was just about to take a final look around when, without warning, I heard the sound of movement from below deck. The footsteps were slow, careful, stealthy. The kind belonging to someone taking their sweet time and looking for prey. With my heart pounding in my chest so hard I thought it would explode, I quickly went back towards the way I had come in. If they found me, odds are good it would be all over. I was only one man with the gun, and there was no telling how many there were and what they were armed with. Going as fast as I dared, I moved to the small wooden staircase I had climbed down on my descent from the top deck and moved up it until I was hidden from the floor I had just departed. And I managed this not a moment too soon, because soon there were shadows moving up from below deck somewhere. From where I was, shadows were all I could see. I had no idea what was causing them, only that whatever the source was, it seemed huge. But somehow, that all became irrelevant when I heard the unearthly roar come from somewhere that made the hair on my neck stand up. I've heard numerous animals roar in many different circumstances, and I had never heard anything like that before. And whatever it was, apparently it didn't mean anything good for the occupants of the yacht, because there was a brief commotion from some other people who had apparently been following the shadow because several people started shouting before frantic yelling was quickly followed by gunfire. That was my cue to exit and exit fast. Fortunately, the gunfire continued and masked my footsteps as I climbed the stairs, moving past the wreckage, pushed open the door I'd come in, and found myself on the deck. Then I swam back to my boat. The swim felt like it took an eternity, and when I finally flung myself back on deck of my boat, I saw that a fire had somehow started on the yacht, and it spread with an alarming quickness I had never seen before. And it wasn't long before I could smell and feel it, even from the distance I was at. I had been in and around numerous fires, but nothing like this. The fire burned with an intensity that wasn't normal. It sizzled and spat sparks in a way that telegraphed that it wasn't your cozy fireplace fire gently burning firewood. I had no idea what was now being consumed by flames, but good riddance to whatever was now burning up with a vengeance. All I could do was continue to quickly document and record what I was seeing for my associates. There wasn't much else for me to do at this point, but watch as the expensive boat turned to a shell before it sank to the bottom of the ocean, with a loud hiss as the flames were extinguished and all that was left was a thick cloud of smoke. Then my job there was officially over, because there was nothing left of Dr. Longstreet, his suspected associates, and his work. All that was left for me was to return home and meet with those who had dispatched me. When I finally did return, I was met with uniformly stunned and demoralized faces. They had always thought that at least something could be retrieved from his work. But now there was nothing. Nothing but the money they would have to spend retrieving the yacht wreckage and whatever other expenses were awaiting them. I couldn't really blame them for being so stunned. Truth was a hard thing to come by anymore, but a story like this, it just seemed too outrageous it had to be made up. But the footage didn't lie, and deep down, they knew it would end like this, no matter what they had hoped. But despite all the complications that were only beginning for them, whatever Longstreet was up to was over, and not only was I well compensated for my services, I got one heck of a story to share with people. And I couldn't ask for anything more than that. So once the check for my job cleared, I wasted no time in going out to a local bar in town nearby that I have never been before, and chatted with whoever was hanging around. You never know when you'll find the perfect audience for your story. 
and you'll never know when you'll hear some undiscovered gem. Some charred wreckage at the bottom of the ocean was one of two things left of that yacht, while my story is the other. Personally, I much prefer the latter. Darkness had settled over the landscape like a heavy shroud, and I found myself wandering the forest alone, my breath visible in the cold night air. How could they leave me, my friends? They ran at the first sign something was wrong. We had been camping, like we had several times before in these woods, but this time something was off. We had heard strange noises in the distance, like a howling, but it didn't sound like any animal we could recognize. We brushed these things off as wolves in the distance. They sounded quite far away, but we pitched our campsite a few miles in the opposite direction just to be safe. When the tents were all set up, we set about our usual activities, drinking, talking, and telling ghost stories. We took turns telling the scariest stories that we could think of, but on this night, the tales seemed closer to reality than ever before. We all seemed on edge, and a general sense of unease settled over us, no longer feeling the same buzz and enjoyment that we normally do. We decided to get some sleep and be ready for the hike further into the woods tomorrow. I was wrenched from my slumber with a start. The sounds of screaming and howling, much closer now than before, were suffocating. Struggling with my sleeping bag, I flung back the cover of my tent to see my friends fleeing away from our campsite in a frenzy, leaving me here in the dark. I could also hear the terrible howling, closer than ever as though whatever was responsible for it was hiding just out of sight. Grabbing a flashlight from my tent, I began to give chase to my friends. But they were out of sight now, thoroughly hidden in the dense foliage of the forest. I ran for what felt like hours, the thick trees and overgrown roots flying past as I darted between the dense foliage. Exhaustion began to take over me, and my legs began to burn. Heeding my body's cries for me to stop, I slowed to a walking pace, taking in my surroundings. I was lost. The trees and bushes all looked the same, stretching on in a never-ending mirrored scene. There was no sign of my friends or the path that they had created in their frantic fleeing. I was alone. I walked deeper into the heart of the forest, my flashlight casting feeble beams of light that barely pierced the inky blackness. Every rustling leaf and distant hoot of an owl sent shivers down my spine. I was aware of exactly how vulnerable I was and I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. My heart raced, and my footsteps quickened involuntarily as if some primal instinct was urging me to flee. It was then that I saw it. As my flashlight swept the darkness before me, it highlighted a figure standing amongst the trees, partially obscured by shadows. My breath caught in my throat as I trained my flashlight on the form. Partially obscured by the trunk of an aged tree, I could make out a silhouette that seemed almost human but grotesque. Its eyes glowed with an unholy light, reflecting the beam of my light in a menacing gleam. Its lips curled into a malevolent smile that seemed to stretch too wide revealing sharpened canines. My voice quivered as I called out, Who's there? 
The figure remained motionless. Its malevolent gaze fixed on me with an intensity that sent waves of dread coursing through my veins. I took a cautious step back, my fingers trembling around the flashlight's grip. The wind carried a whisper, a voice that seemed to emanate from the very trees themselves. Come closer, it beckoned. Its voice a distorted blend of human and something far more sinister. My heart pounded in my chest, a relentless drumbeat that matched the rhythm of my fear. Despite every fiber of my being screaming for me to flee, I found myself taking hesitant steps towards the figure. It was like it was compelling me. As I drew nearer, I could see its features more clearly, illuminated by the brightening light of my flashlight. The face seemed almost familiar, yet so wrong. Its skin was stretched taut across its bones, so tight that I worried it might split. Its limbs were unnaturally elongated, resembling the arms of some kind of horrific ape. A thin layer of fur covered the majority of its skin, matted in several places with a deep red liquid. My mind struggled to comprehend what I was seeing, a living nightmare that defied explanation. And then, in an instant, the figure's features contorted, shifting into an even more grotesque form. It began the hunch over in pain, letting out a horrific scream that seemed to almost sound like the howls we were hearing earlier. Bones snapped and the taunt flesh ripped as the creature's body began the altar, rebuilding itself. The fingers on the tips of its elongated limbs began the split, revealing sharpened claws that glinted in the glow of my trembling flashlight. The spine contorted to allow the use of all four legs with ease, giving it a strange semi-quadrupedal stance. The face began to elongate and split from the mouth, revealing the bones underneath as they stretched and morphed into a snout filled with those jagged, sharp canine teeth. My pulse quickened, and the air grew fidget as if the very essence of the forest had turned against me. The darkness seemed to close in with the oppressive weight. I found myself rooted in place, unable to tear my eyes away from the horrific transformation occurring before me. Its lips moved, but the words that emerged were not in any language I recognized. They were a cacophony of discordant sounds that seemed to pierce through my thoughts like a blade. You're mine. It seemed to growl, its voice sending ice tendrils of terror down my spine. Start running. My mind raced, thoughts of scattering like leaves in a gust of wind. I needed to escape, to break free of the grip of this malevolent presence. But my limbs felt very heavy, as if bound by an invisible force that was slowly tightening around me. With a surge of desperation, I forced my legs to move, stumbling backwards, nearly tripping over the undergrowth as I turned to flee. As I ran, the forest seemed to close in around me, the trees twisting and contorting in ways that defied reason. Shadows danced at the edges of my vision, and the very ground beneath my feet felt unstable as the earth itself was shifting. A chilling howl ripped through the air, joined by a chorus of screams that seemed to come from every direction at once. The figure pursued me, its form flickering in and out of the trees like a ghostly apparition, slowly gaining on me. My breath came in ragged gasps, and panic threatened to consume me whole. My lungs burned and my muscles screamed in protest. I sprinted through the underbrush, branches clawing at my skin and grazing my face, 
but the figure was relentless in its pursuit. Its howling grew louder, mingling with the sounds of the forest until they were one and the same. I could hear its thudding footsteps and the snapping of twigs behind me, getting ever closer. My mind felt like it was unraveling, the boundaries between reality and nightmare blurring into a twisted tapestry. How could this be happening? And then, just as I felt my strength waning, I burst through the tree line and into an empty clearing bathed in moonlight. I collapsed to the ground, my chest heaving as I struggled to catch my breath. My muscles were on fire and unresponsive to my commands. I lay there, waiting, expecting to feel the vicious claws or teeth of that horrid abomination tear through me. But they never came. Slowly, and with great effort, I lifted myself onto my side and looked back in the direction of the forest I'd fled from. The creature had come to a halt at the edge of the forest its distorted form contorting in frustration. It was glaring at me with intense rage. I could feel the hatred in its gaze, but it didn't move any further. It was as though it couldn't leave the edge of the tree line. With a final chilling howl, it seemed to retreat into the darkness of the forest, leaving behind only a lingering sense of malevolence. The forest was silent once more, the night air carrying only the rustling of leaves in the wind. Relief washed over me as I realized I had escaped the clutches of a creature beyond comprehension, a being that existed on the fringes of our reality. But what was that thing? I could feel the weight of the ordeal and the fatigue of fleeing catching up with me. My vision began to blur and I passed out. From that point on, things were a little hazy. I don't know how long I was in that clearing before I stumbled upon a pair of hikers. They found me curled up and crying before bringing me back to the ranger station. After I'd calmed down enough to realize I was safe, I was interviewed by the police. Two officers came out after being called by the ranger. They sat me down in what I assume was a waiting area on a large sofa where I went through in detail what had happened, knowing full well how crazy I sounded. When I began to describe the creature, the officers both looked at each other, exchanging an almost knowing glance. After I would finished my story, they didn't seem as doubtful of my story as I expected. They asked a few follow-up questions before thanking me and getting up to leave. Just as they were turning to leave, a sudden moment of clarity shot through me, and I proceeded to ask about my friends. If anyone had seen them or heard anything from them after they fled. There's been no reports of anyone else in these woods. Was all the officers could say. My heart sank. Although they had abandoned me, I still cared about them. No one had seen or heard from my friends, not even the rangers. The police sent out a search party to the location I gave them for the campsite, but all they could find was the tattered remains of our tents, as though a wild animal had torn through them. It wasn't until I overheard the rangers and the officers talking that another chill ran through me. It was only a small sentence, but it horrified me nonetheless. That's the third of these in as many months. We had best find something else before the next full moon. There is a wolf in these woods. December 13th. The Woods. As I'm looking at the body of the dead hiker, I have more questions than answers. My name is Alex, and I'm a police officer in Maine, and I'm a little busy at the moment. Looks like a wolf, Alex. At least that's what the claw marks suggest. 
Oh, and the tracks. Pearl. Another officer gives me her opinion. Have you ever seen a wolf in Maine? I retort. No, but we are right next to Canada. Wolves are like their whole thing. Wolves in syrup. And I guess like Justin Bieber. Sure. The cleanup crew arrives, which means I get to go back to the station and fill out paperwork. Exhilarating. Pearl and I take the surely traumatized hiker who called in the body of the now dead hiker with us. January 3rd. Police station. We're calling animal control. This is ridiculous. Pearl invades my morning silence. We don't have an animal control branch, Pearl. Alex, yesterday makes five people dead by a wolf. People are starting to get worried in town. Do you not care? We're calling in a unit from Bigsby. All right. How long is it going to take them to get here? A few hours. Come on, let's check this latest one out. We leave the station and get in our car. It's a fairly long drive and short walk. I take a moment to think about Pearl. She's 25 years old, but incredibly strong. She's relatively new on the force. I remember being 25. I admire how she's stuck with us. If I had to endure this at 25, I think I'd leave the force. But I guess resilience is part of the job description. When she's seen as many dead bodies as I have, I think she'll eventually get used to it. We arrive on the scene and sure enough, a dead hiker. I don't want a victim blame here, but we did advise the population to be wary of the woods. The worst part is the eyes. Even though he had been dead for a while, his eyes still showed visceral, pure, complete fear. I guess that's why people in the movies often close the eyes of the dead. I don't understand it. Pearl breaks the silence. What's on your mind? I question. I mean, look at him. All things considered, he's pretty intact, Pearl says. What do you mean? I respond. Well, we're looking for a wolf, right? Yeah. Wolves are hunters. It seems out of character to not at least take a few bites of the things you kill. I mean, it's leaving a perfectly good meal on the floor of the forest. Well, this perfectly good meal used to be a human pearl. Plus, it was probably planning on coming back at some point, I say. Well, I've never known a wolf to do that. The wolf is toying with us. Luring us into the woods to eat us all one by one. The hiker who called in the body interrupts our conversation. A man I recognize as Bill Carton. I've never known a wolf to lure humans, Pearl assures Bill. Have you ever known a wolf to do anything? I asked Pearl. January 4th, police station. Pearl walks into my office. Alex, we have two animal control guys. They're going out tonight for a manhunt or wolf hunt. They're asking for a couple of cops and some volunteers. And good morning to you too, I respond. All right, let's put it in the newspaper. January 5th, police station. I'm standing in the entrance of the station. And in front of me are two animal control workers, Pearl, Officer Jimenez, Officer Johnson, and five civilians. Vivian Hurdleton, Paul Carpenter, John Pendleman, Henry Phillip, and Casey Brown. I feel I should say something. Good evening. I don't need to explain why you're all here. I will not be joining you, as the group is already very big. I hope you find this dang wolf causing all of this. Officer Pearl Frederick will take it from here. I retreat to my office. January 6th, 
police station. Officer Jimenez and Johnson are conversing in the entrance to the station. I could hear them from outside as I walk up. I swear to God I had that effer. If you had him, we wouldn't have been having this conversation right now. I walk into the station. Okay, what happened yesterday? I question. We heard it. We, we heard the wolf, Jimenez says. Well, Johnson chimes in. We saw it too. It got one of the animal control guys. What? We have another casualty? I reply. Suddenly I'm less tired than a second ago. Yeah. Hartley was taking up the rear and before we could even react, we heard something running at us and Hartley was gone. Jimenez fills me in. We tried to track it. We ended up finding Hartley. Johnson finishes Jimenez's recount. This time, Pearl walks in, interrupting Johnson. It took a bite. A whole part missing from Hartley's abdomen. You're just in time. We're checking in with the volunteers at their houses, talking to them about what they saw. You're going to Mr. Pendelmon's. Pearl leaves. Jimenez and Johnson follow her. I get in my cruiser and I'm off. I arrive at Paul's house, a secluded cabin on the edge of the woods. I walk up the creaky steps and knock on the heavy wooden door. As if on cue, I heard a car pull into the driveway. The car is playing a song. I recognize it as Evil by Interpol. A man steps out of the car. John Pentelmon. Good morning, John. You're out early. Ah, well, no rest for the wicked, right? Anyways, I could say the same about yourself, officer. John walks up the steps of his house to where I am. What could I do for you? Well, I'm supposed to interview you about the patrol yesterday. Can I come in? Why, sure. We walk into the house and John takes me to the living room. There are mounted animal heads all over the off-white walls. Deers, bison, and a wolf. I walk over to the wolf head and stare into its eyes. Cold. Dead. Emotionless. The fur looks off too. Oh yeah, I caught her in Canada on a research project, John says. Interesting. Can I ask why it kind of smells like meat in here? Well, I was just in the middle of breakfast when you arrived, John responds. You were driving when I... I could feel my heart beat faster. Alex, pick up. Damn, Alex, come in. Pearl interrupts me from my radio. I pick it up. Uh, what's wrong? I ask her. They're dead. The volunteers are all dead. We're not looking for a wolf. We're looking for a man, Alex. My heart at this point might as well be loosening my rib cage at this rate. Meet me at John's house. I say before I switch off the radio. I turn to John and try my best to get out my words. What did you say you do for a living? Me? I'm a wolf biologist and practicing taxidermist, John says, a smile on his face. All right, I think I'm going to put you under arrest. Before I finish my sentence, John had tackled me to the floor and runs for the wolf head. I noticed a fork sticking out of my stomach. He takes the head off the wall to reveal a compartment housing of a wolf costume and a pair of custom claws. He picks up the claws, costume, and wearable head and heads to the door. I am glad this happened in the morning, because if I had any substantial food already, it would have been excavated from my body one way or another due simply to my level of fear. I may have been on the force for a large part of my life, but no amount of experience can stop fear or adrenaline. Couldn't leave well enough alone, huh? See you later, Alex. 
And just like that, he is gone. I managed to get to my feet and stumble to the door. Squad cars have shown up in numbers. I tell them John was in the woods. I try to keep it together, but I just know I look shell-shocked. I am carted away to the infirmary. Police scoured the forest and we have yet to find John. I have lived these last few weeks constantly checking my surroundings. I know he will be back, and I don't know if I will be able to stop him. There's something that screams at the bottom of my garden, and it's not the foxes. I know it's not because I've seen it. A month ago, I moved into a new house with my wife. We had been living in another town for a few years as it was closer to my work, but now that I'm working from home, we decided to move closer to her parents. They were getting older and she was worried about them being alone. Although it was further away from my family and friends, I agreed as I knew how much it meant to her. We spent some time viewing houses in her hometown until we settled on this one, located at the bottom of a cul-de-sac on a small hill which was just on the border of the countryside. It seemed ideal. The house itself was beautiful, and as soon as we stepped outside, we fell in love with the garden and the views. The garden was a large, open face covered in grass. At the bottom was a waist-high fence, leading to an overgrown patch of land that looked out across the rolling hills and the town below. There was a small public footpath that led through it, but the current owners assured us that it was quiet. No one used that old path. The view was just gorgeous. We both imagined waking up to that each morning, the sun rising in the distance. I remember saying to her that I think this could be our forever home. Without much more thought, we snapped up the house there and then, putting in an offer and making our plans to move in. Then last month, we finally got the keys. We were so excited as we turned the key into the lock, taking the obligatory pictures outside of the house for social media. After a hard day of moving, we both made our way out into the garden to sit down and watch the sunset. It was beautiful. The sky was filled with yellows, reds, and purples as the sun sank below the line of hills on the horizon. We both smiled, pleased at our new home, and the fact that we would be able to see these sunsets every day. We spent the rest of the evening relaxing as best as we could, when most of our possessions were still in boxes, before deciding to call it a night and get some sleep. We had already unpacked our bedding, knowing it was going to be needed. Settling down, I was reading a book on my phone, a horror novel about a group of people trapped on a snowy mountain. It was my nightly ritual before going to sleep. My wife, on the other hand, had no such rituals. She was asleep almost as soon as her head hit the pillow. I smiled to myself. She must have been exhausted from the move. After what seemed like only a few pages, I could feel my eyelids starting to become heavy as sleep called to me. Turning off my phone and putting it on charge, I got up and made my way over to the window to close the curtains. Taking one last look over the garden, I couldn't believe how beautiful it was. The sun had long since set and had been replaced by a bright full moon, illuminating the whole garden in a pale white glow. Sliding the curtains shut, careful not to make too much noise to avoid waking up my wife, I slid back in the bed and pulled the covers over myself, ready for a good rest. I don't know how long I had been lying there with my eyes closed, but out of the darkness, I was startled by a sound that set my teeth on edge. A scream. 
I sat bolt upright in bed. Then I heard it again. It was loud, terrifyingly loud. It sounded like a woman was screaming at the top of her lungs. A cold sweat broke out across my forehead as I turned towards the window. The curtains were still shut tight, but the sound was still forcing its way through. It came again, a screeching, desperate scream like someone being attacked. I had not heard anything like it before and I was terrified. Then another sound came. This time it was lower, more guttural and animalistic. It was still a scream though. The same ear-piercing screech, but with something more behind it. I was too scared to look out the window at whatever was making the noises. I felt stupid. It was probably just foxes or something like that. I had seen videos online where they make all sorts of noises you wouldn't expect them to. I bet there was a den of them in the overgrowth somewhere. They were probably calling to each other. I tried to rationalize it in my head. I had grown up in quite an urban environment, so this house bordering the country was going to take a bit of getting used to. Undoubtedly, I'd hear other animal noises as night as well, I thought. Still, it was unnerving to hear that screaming, followed by the retort from the more animalistic scream. This went on for several minutes. Lying back down in my bed, I covered my ears to try to block it out, but they were so loud. Then they just stopped, abruptly. After the higher pitched scream, they seemed to stop dead. They were finally done yelling at one another. I tried to shake off the unease that I had felt, but I was too awake to sleep, too spooked by the sounds. Looking over at my wife sleeping next to me, I could see her chest gently rising and falling. She was still sound asleep, unperturbed by the horrific screams I had just heard. A selfish part of me wished they had woken her up. That way I wouldn't have to sit here alone. I felt quite vulnerable here in the dark in this new house, but I decided to let her sleep. I'd tell her about the noises in the morning, I thought to myself. They had stopped anyway. Morning broke and I was awakened by a very short sleep by the bright sunlight pouring into the room as my wife threw back the curtains, revealing the morning sun cascading over the hills and town below. She asked how I had slept, her face hosting a chipper smile, ready for another day of unpacking in our new home. She had always been a morning person. It was irritating sometimes, but she always looked so happy the first thing. It was irritating sometimes, but she always looked so happy first thing. Groggily, I rolled over, meeting her gaze. I must have looked like hell as her face dropped. She gently sat down next to me on the bed, holding her hand in mine and asked what was wrong. I proceeded to tell her about the sounds I had heard last night, about the high-pitched scream, about the guttural one that followed it. She looked at me with concern before explaining that it was most likely foxes. There were loads of them around here, especially in the kind of overgrowth area like the one behind our house. If you hear them again, just try to ignore them. Or if not, just lean out the window and tell them to pipe down, she said. That might scare them off. Chuckling at the thought of leaning out the window to shout at a couple of foxes like they were naughty teenagers. I kissed my wife and got out of bed, ready for a day of unpacking. After another tiring day of moving boxes and putting things in cupboards, my wife and I made our way out into the garden again to watch the sunset. The same glorious view as the day before sprawled out before us, the sun dipping just below the horizon. I couldn't seem to enjoy it, however. Staring into the overgrowth at the end of the garden, my mind was replaying the noises that I had heard the night before in a loop. I couldn't seem to shake them from my mind. After a while, we went back into the house and went about our evening before making our way to bed. 
A nervous energy tingled at the base of my spine as I sat there reading. What if the screaming came back again the night? I didn't want to have to sit through that again. Even if it was Fox's, it was nerve-wrenching. After reading for a short while, my wife turned out the light and rolled over to get some sleep, kissing me goodnight before she did so. I stayed up a while longer, sitting there in the darkness, illuminated only by the light of my Kindle app on my phone. I was being stupid, I thought to myself. It was just foxes. They were just making noises to one another, probably having a dispute over territory or something. There was nothing to be scared of. I waited a while longer in the silence, ears pricked for any sort of sounds from the outside. There was nothing. Maybe the odd hoot of an owl in the distance, but certainly nothing like last night. Finally allowing myself to relax, I slid further under the covers and pulled them up to my chin, rolling over. After a while, I entered a soft, dreamless sleep. Nothing happened after that night. There were no strange noises. No screams of foxes or anything like that. I began to let myself forget about the sounds I had heard on that first night. God knows I had enough to worry about without thinking about those odd noises constantly. It wasn't about a month afterwards that the thoughts of them came flooding back. It was a Saturday afternoon. The sun was beating down and my wife and I were in the garden. We had unpacked the majority of our things now, and the house was finally looking like a home rather than a storage unit. A couple of our friends had come over to see the new place. They had even brought their pet Alsatian with them, Thor. He was a beautiful dog, always full of energy and super friendly. We were in the garden tossing a ball for him to fetch, when suddenly he stopped dead. His body was rigid and his ears were twitching as though he had heard something coming from the bottom of the garden. As my friend shouted to Thor to try to snap him out of his trance, he bolted, leaping over the waist-high fence in one bound and disappearing into the overgrowth behind it. I'll go get him, I shouted back to my friend, noting the look of concern on his face. I hopped the fence and followed the path that Thor had trotted through the brambles and weeds. I could hear him off to my left somewhere, crushing his way through the dense foliage. It wasn't until I was a good distance into the overgrowth that I realized exactly how much of it there was. It seemed to stretch on and on. Looking back over my shoulder, I could see the house. It looked so far away, obscured by the large brambles. I need to get Thor and get back as quickly as I could. I did not want to spend longer here than I needed to. I pushed on through the overgrowth, forcing brambles and ferns aside as I gained momentum, getting closer and closer to the sounds of Thor. Bursting through the particularly large fern bush, I found myself standing on the footpath that ran behind the back of the house. Being closer to it now, I noted how strange it was. Considering it hardly saw use, it seemed well kept. The rampant overgrowth on either side was cold back, leaving a relatively clear path stretching off to my left and right. The gnarled trees overhead seemed oppressive, knitting their branches together in a tight mess that distorted the sunlight. The whole atmosphere was oppressive and silent. No wonder people didn't like walking down this path, it was eerie as hell. A low growl from my left snapped me back into my senses. Thor stood in the middle of the path, staring off into the dense trees further towards the right side. His body was rigid, the fur on his neck and back standing on end. His teeth were bared as he growled again, his eyes fixed on the point deeper in the trees. He looked vicious like he was ready to destroy whatever was in that overgrowth if it dared to come near him. I called him, but he ignored me, not even registering my voice. It was unnerving watching him. 
A shiver of unease gripped me as I couldn't help but wonder what it was that had spooked him this much. Even following his gaze, I could not make out anything in the trees. A sudden sense of vulnerability washed over me as I looked around, realizing just how overgrown and dark this path was. The foliage on either side seemed suffocating, and I could only make out the top of my house from here, the garden well and truly hidden. Anything could be watching me from within the overgrowth. I made my way towards Thor, calling out his name as not to startle him. He was still fixated on the patch just beyond the path, his low growls rolling in his throat. As I drew level with him, I could better see the patch of foliage he was staring at. It looked like it had been recently disturbed. The ferns and brambles were less dense than the thickets on either side of it, as though they had been frantically pushed back to allow something through. The trees on either side had large gashes in them, as though someone had taken chunks of them out with an axe, but left them before the job itself was finished. They were lined in threes, looking like large scratch marks. Odd, I thought to myself, making my way over and brushing my hand against the bark. I wonder why they would leave these trees rather than just finishing the job and cutting them down. Still, something was unsettling about the entire thing. The overgrowth seemed to absorb the light, and I couldn't help but feel I was being watched from just beyond the bounds of my vision. Come on, Thor, let's get out of here, I said, my voice cracking slightly. Thor didn't budge, just staring at the patch of overgrowth just beyond me with malicious intent. I made my way towards him and hooked my fingers under his collar. He gave no resistance, but still, he didn't move. As I went to stand up and lead him back towards the house, something brushed against my hair. I leapt back with a start. I was already uneasy, so this unexpected interaction tipped me over the edge. Thor didn't react to my startled yell. He was still fixed on the spot, growling at the darkened overgrowth. Taking a second to regain my composure, I looked up at the object that had caused me such harm. Hanging from a tree branch was a small object, circular and wooden. It looked as though it had been made from sticks all bound together. It was around the size of a small coaster. Scanning the rest of the tree, my jaw dropped. There were loads of them. I had not seen them before, the gloomy overgrowth masking them. They looked like a small totem, something that a child would make. I assumed that they were made by some of the local children who used to play around here. Maybe a marker for their den or something. It was odd, but that was the only rational thing I could think of. Either that or some kind of bird-scaring device. Still, looking at them creeped me out. Right, now we are getting out of here, I said to Thor, grabbing his collar again and leading him back towards the house. As I pulled, he came willingly. All the while, he allowed me to lead him. He was looking over his shoulder at the same patch and growling. When I got back to the house, we put Thor inside so he wouldn't get out again. But I could still see him, staring out the patio window at the same spot that he had been fixated on before. He didn't move for the remainder of the time that our friends were here. He just stood by the back door, staring. It wasn't until he was in the car as my friends were leaving that he seemed to finally forego his obsession, although he was staring all the while until the car engine started. My wife and I went into the house and I went about our nightly routine. All the while, I couldn't shake how Thor was acting from my mind. He had been genuinely spooked. I had never seen a dog do that before. Had he heard something down there? As if dredged from the recesses of my mind, the memory of those screams of the first night were moved and surfaced. I couldn't help but wonder, could they be related to why Thor was so on edge? Had he sensed something down there? Shaking the thoughts off, 
my mind trying to make connections where there were none, we decided to go to bed. I was sitting there reading my book as usual, the room illuminated by the pale light of the full moon outside, when I heard that god-awful sound again. My scalp tightened as I registered what it was. That same screaming I had heard on the first night we moved in. It resonated in my ears, bringing back all the feelings of terror I had felt on that first night. Only this time it sounded different somehow. It still sounded like a woman screaming, but the tone and pitch were different. As silly as it sounds, amidst the chaos of fear in my mind, my wife's words surfaced. Just lean out the window and tell them to pipe down. It was stupid, I knew, but I couldn't go through with another night of that terrible screaming. Fumbling my way through the darkness of our bedroom towards the window, I could see the garden below bathed in the same pale light as last time, the overgrowth also illuminated with the brilliant moonlight. As I scanned it, looking for any sign of the foxes, I saw something that made my blood drain from my face. There, on the path through the wasteland behind my garden, was a woman. She was bound with what looked to be a thick hempen rope. Her eyes were wide with terror as they darted around, her blonde hair falling across her face as she turned frantically. She was screaming at the top of her lungs. Carrying her what, what looked to be a group of tall, darkly dressed strangers. I couldn't make out many of the specifics around them, try as I might. They were dressed in thick black overalls that covered their entire person, leaving no discernible traits visible. Each appeared to be wearing a mask. I couldn't tell what it was supposed to be. It looked like a strange dog, almost like a fox, but the proportions were off, and so was the shape. I ducked down under the window, leaning against the wall. My heart was pounding in my chest. What the hell was this? What was I seeing? Panicked, I went to wake my wife. The overwhelming need for someone else to tell me this wasn't happening racing through my mind. I was inches away from shaking her awake when I heard that woman let out another ear-piercing scream. Stopping dead, my attention snapped back to the window and a new wave of fear rushed through me. I shakily made my way back over to it needing to know the fate of this woman and her captors. I knew I needed to call the police, to call someone who could help, but I was transfixed on the scene below. The sight before me paralyzed my limbs. I was frozen with fear as I noticed what the group of masked people were wearing around their necks. It was a totem, the same round disc made of sticks that I had seen hanging from the tree on the path when I fetched Thor. They each had one, wearing it like some kind of religious medallion. I dreaded to think about what these people wanted. What were they going to do with that poor woman? I didn't want to look, but I couldn't turn away. They stopped part of the way down the path, in a place before the tree branches started knitting together. I could see them clearly from my window as they gently laid the woman down. They placed her in the center of the path, then slowly began to back away. I had no idea what was happening. Why had they gone to the effort of tying her up and carrying her down here only to leave her? Still transfixed on the scene, I was unable to move a muscle. Watching as the masked group backed away, their gazes set not on the woman in front of them, but on the darkness further down the path behind her. I couldn't help but feel a sense of unease welling up in my stomach. Then I saw something. From the patch of darkness further along the path, towards where I had seen the totems and the marked trees, I could just about make out movement through the undergrowth. It seemed to be slowly making its way towards the woman on the floor. The group were still backing away as whatever it was approached. 
there was an almighty cracking of branches and twigs coming from the direction of the movement, as though something large was making its way through the overgrowth. Images of that disturbing section of the path, the totems and the trees and the claw marks filled my mind. The overgrowth there had been disturbed, as though something had made its way through it regularly. I couldn't help but shudder thinking about how close to this thing I could have been. Mixed in with the sound of a large branch snapping was what sounded like a guttural rolling growl. The noises seemed to be getting closer. I could see the odd flash of leathery gray obscured by the thick branches. Occasionally, what looked like red too moved between the trees. There was a clawing at the back of my skull. I didn't want to see what this thing was. I was happier not knowing what lived in that space behind my house. As it proceeded past the tangled branches and out into the uncovered path, I could make it out clearly. What I saw made me question my sanity. The thing was large, taller than a man, walking on its hind legs. It must have been at least eight feet tall, but it looked as though it could quite as easily walk on all fours if it wanted to. Its thick arms, coated in thin, sparse red fur, were long and tipped with what looked like razor-sharp claws. Its chest was thick, covered in the same thin fur that coated its arms and led to a thicker mane that ran down its back. Its head looked like that of a fox, but warped into some kind of sick mockery of the animal. Its snout was long and scarred, lined with large, razor-sharp fangs. Its eyes were wild and yellow, fixed on the now screaming woman with intense hunger. Saliva appeared to be dripping from its open jaws. A new jolt of terror coursed through me as I realized that the face of this thing, the warped, grotesque face, looked like the masks that the group were wearing. The masked group had all dropped to one knee when the creature made its way out of the tree line, almost as though they were bowing to it. These people couldn't worship that thing, could they? Just as my gaze was fixed on the creature, a shrill screech snapped my attention back to the woman laying bound on the ground. In the time that the group of the figures had moved away, she had obviously been able to turn over, where she had seen the grotesque thing standing on the path in front of her. She was frantically thrashing against the rope that bound her now, trying as hard as she could to break free. Her eyes were unmoving, fixed on the terror before her. As if the mocker, the thing crouched its enormous frame down on its haunches and brought its face close to hers before letting out a shrill screech. It was uncannily similar to the one that she had just made, only with a more guttural, animalistic undertone. The woman rolled onto her front, wriggling away from that thing as best as she could. Panic fueled what was only the only method of escape she could think of. I felt so helpless, just watching her futile attempts. But there was nothing I could do for her. Even if I was to call the police, what would they do against a creature like that? She managed to make it a few feet before one of the figures got to their feet. They purposefully walked over to the bound woman before rolling her back to where she started her journey. Back before the feet of the monster. The way they moved, it was like this whole thing was a ceremony to them. With a burst of speed so quick I nearly didn't register it. The thing wrapped its clawed hand around her ankle. She let out one last scream before she shot into the undergrowth and out of my sight, dragged deeper into the foliage by that horrific thing. I felt sick as I heard the creature scream again in response, mocking her final plea for help. Then everything went silent. I stood there dumbfounded as the masked figures began to file out of the path, each moving quickly as though they didn't want to wait around to determine the fate of that poor woman. 
as though released from some kind of spectral grip, I could feel myself shaking. Unsteadily, I made my way over to my bedside table and grabbed my phone, punching in the number for the police. In less than an hour, I was on my doorstep, telling two uniformed officers exactly what I had seen. I didn't mention the creature, thinking they would just write it off as the ravings of a lunatic. But I told them about the masked figures and the bound woman, explaining that they had taken her further into the woods but came back without her. The officers exchanged perplexed, slightly disbelieving glances before saying that they would walk down the path behind the garden to check it out. As soon as they left, I ran upstairs into the bedroom in my haste, waking my wife, who looked at me with a mix of both concern and annoyance. I ignored her questions as to why I had decided to wake her up in the middle of the night. I was too concerned with the officers. I could see them making their way down the path now from my window, their flashlights banishing the oppressive darkness of the path. Watching as they made their way further along, a sense of anxiety washed over me as they disappeared beneath the knitted branches of the overgrown trees. I stood there, staring with bated breath, my heart pounding in my ears. What felt like hours passed before I saw the beam of a flashlight returning along the path. I breathed a sigh of relief as the two officers emerged from the overgrowth. But seconds later, my heart dropped as I noticed they were alone. There was no woman with them. Rushing back downstairs, I hastily questioned them as they got to my front door. They explained that their search hadn't turned up anything. No footprints, no marks from giant creatures, no nothing. Just the overgrowth and a silent path. I asked them about the totems, to which they replied that they had seen them but they were something that some of the kids in this area liked to make. Some kind of superstitious thing, one of them said. Nothing to worry about. A wave of despair washed over me. I looked at the officers. They must have picked up on the way I was feeling, as one of the officers put a hand on my shoulder and with a look of pity on his face said, It's probably just foxes, mate. You probably had a bad dream. And mixed with the noise those things make, it's hard not to think of someone screaming. Try not to worry yourself about it. I appreciated his attempt to calm me, but I knew what I had seen. It hadn't been a dream. Deeply disturbed by the night's events, and disheartened that the police couldn't find anything and were dismissing my account, I bid the officers goodbye and went back inside. It's been about another month since then, and I don't know what to do. What if it happens again in a few days? I can't go through it again, and there's nothing I could do to stop it. Maybe I should just move. When I was a sophomore in college... My friends and I went on a ski trip over Christmas break. I'm not sure if ski lodges and ski lodge parties are popular anymore, but they were a thing when I was younger. That was back in the 80s. But after 1989, ski lodges were never the same for me and several others. The first thing that comes to mind about that weekend isn't death, fear, or even sadness. It's cold. It was bitterly cold that weekend. So cold, it was like the ice sliced through the air and attacked every inch of flesh it could, just like a knife will. But no matter what came after, nothing will ever ruin that view of the mountains. The majestic stone ridges, plush white mounds of snow, and the velvet green pines were stunning to see. They were a dangerous place long before we even got there. No telling how many lives had been lost over the centuries on those cliffs. By that standard, what happened to us was just another little footnote. We all arrived a few days after Christmas on December 29th. 
After spending Christmas with our respective families across the country, we made plans months in advance for this little vacation. I was beyond excited for it. We all were. Our group was spending the days leading up to the New Year's Eve at Spruce Ridge in Colorado. Justin's parents had chipped in for our weekend as a Christmas slash birthday gift since Justin's birthday was December 27th. The cabin we were staying at had been in their family for decades. While there was technically a ski lodge about 10 minutes away or so, the place was more like an exclusive getaway since the cabins were so far away from each other. While I arrived via plane from Cincinnati, my best friend Jill Conroy had arrived earlier from Tampa. Justin, who was Jill's boyfriend, came by the way of Minneapolis, and his roommate Peter was coming in from Charleston with his girlfriend Yvonne. But the person I was most eager to see was Charlie Hightower, the guy I had a crush on since I first laid eyes on him in Psych 101. He arrived from Indianapolis about the same time as me, and I had just picked up my baggage when I laid eyes on that handsome athlete with deep hazel eyes and a superb jawline. Hey, Trisha. He greeted me with a smile. Hope you had a good Christmas. Can I help you with your luggage? Thanks, it was nice. I've always loved Christmas. Hope yours was good too. And I got it all pretty much taken care of except for this one bag. I gestured to the small tote. Could you grab it for me? Sure thing, he said without hesitation. Shall we share a cab? We'd sure save money that way. I felt a rush of excitement at the prospect of time alone with Charlie. Then on our way it is. We walked out of the terminal and found a cab to take us to the cabin. On the drive out of the airport, we talked about our respective Christmases until we fell into a comfortable silence. I can't believe the 80s are coming to an end, he said eventually. I know what you mean. Not just a new year, a new decade, a whole new ball game. It was a surreal thought. My friends and I had all grown up and come of age in the 80s. I had some fleeting memories of the 70s, but the 80s were the only decade we really knew. The 80s weren't just a decade, it was an attitude. Like an item of clothing that seemed to become a part of you. Pac-Man, MTV. Ghostbusters, Miami Vice, and Star Wars were all milestones to us. Some people loved the poke fun at the fashion back then, but I wouldn't change it for anything, especially considering some of the trends that have came and gone since. It was a great ride, wasn't it? I smiled at him, a grin he returned. Yes, it was. At that moment, I noticed we had arrived at the cabin but calling the building a cabin was an understatement. It was more like a chalet. Large wooden beams, cobblestone structure, and tall, narrow windows on the second floor looking out over the dense trees that were sagging with snow. Despite the intense snow, everything looked immaculately shoveled and salted. The sight was stunning. Charlie gave the guy driving a generous tip and we hauled ourselves out of the cab and into the house. Once inside, I felt immediately at home. The wooden entry led to a massive great room with a stone fireplace that looked big enough for me to stand up in. A large pine mantelpiece displayed a set of deer antlers was set in the fireplace at my eye level. When I saw the large fire crackling in the grate, I had to fight the urge to sit down in one of the massive leather couches clustered around the fireplace. I could almost feel myself sinking down into the warm leather cushions. But then everyone came rushing in to see us when they realized Charlie and I had arrived. In an instant, I was swept up in a flurry of greetings and hugs. At some point, Peter introduced Yvonne, who I had never met before 
and she and Peter were in a long-distance relationship. She was pretty, with thick curly black hair and elegant blue eyes. I thought we'd go to the video store for some movies, Justin said at one point. Keep us entertained and all that. It was a good idea, and once Charlie and I got our stuff put away, we headed out to the video store and the rental car Justin and Jill had on hand. When we arrived, we browsed up and down the aisles until we picked out a few movies. My selections were The Terminator and Aliens. By that point, it was already getting dark, so we headed back to the cabin and Jill, Yvonne, and Peter all went into the kitchen to get dinner started while the rest of us watched Back to the Future, one of the movies Justin had picked out. Dinner that night was delicious. A big spaghetti dinner complete with homemade meatballs and garlic bread. It was followed by a surprise for Justin, as we had prepared a belated birthday cake for him, complete with 20 candles. Once we had all sung to him, Justin blew out the candles in one breath and we all had a piece of cake. It was his favorite, yellow with chocolate frosting. After dinner, we all headed into the sitting room to watch another movie we had rented. Good Morning Vietnam. When it was over, Jill went into the kitchen and took out some chocolate, graham crackers, and some marshmallows from the cupboard. Then she grabbed some metal roasting sticks from a drawer somewhere so we could make s'mores over the still crackling fire. In the end, they were so good we all had at least three. Then we all sat there. Lazy and content in the amber glow from the fire while the wind rattled outside on a pitch black night. Some time passed before Justin sat up, an eager grin on his face. Well, he rubbed his hands together. We're in a cabin in the country. It's nighttime. We have a fire and we just had s'mores. I think now it's scary story time. The mention of scary stories had given the room a slight buzz of excitement. There is nothing like scary stories by a fire at night. It's your cabin. I guess you should go first, Peter said as the rest of us sat up straight and prepared to listen. All right. I don't have many good stories to tell, but there was a couple that vanished out here last year, about 15 minutes from here at another cabin. No one ever found them or figured out what happened, but when they investigated the cabin they were staying in, the cops found giant rips and tears in the furniture and the curtains. This was met by complete silence. The rest of us all looked at each other, uncertain of what to say. So, who's next? He looked around eagerly. Jill gave him a look. Sweetie, you're joking with us, right? She asked. No, I'm completely serious. A wealthy couple that comes out here every year vanished. My dad says no one has a clue about what happened. I'll tell the next story, Justin. Peter jumped up while Jill rolled her eyes. As much as Jill and Justin loved each other, they could argue like nobody's business. The rest of us took turns telling the corniest stories we could. Then we watched another movie before Jill, Justin, Yvonne, and Peter were so tired they could barely keep their eyes open. Hey Trisha, guess it's just you and me now, Charlie said after they had gone to bed. Care to join me in the hot tub? Sure. Cool, I'll go get it ready before I change. While my heart thudded in my chest, I managed to say something about going to put on my bathing suit before I headed upstairs to get changed. I had been instructed to bring a suit for the hot tub, but I never imagined I'd share it with Charlie alone. As I walked downstairs with the towel around myself, I was simultaneously nervous, excited, and self-conscious. What if Charlie didn't like the way I looked? What if he did? ignoring the frantic thoughts racing inside my head. I pressed on and eventually found the door to the glass-encased patio and stepped inside. 
The hot tub looked spectacular. The heavy smell of chlorine hit me the instant I stepped inside the patio. The steam rose from the hot tub in thick plumes, billowing at my eye level. The dense bushes outside the glass walls were covered with beautiful blue lights, which sparkled against the glass. Despite the steam beginning to fog up the dense glass walls, there was a clear view of the backyard, the mountains, and the massive white and clear icicles hanging from the patio roof. It was like we were in our own little snow globe, watching the snow glistening and blowing just beyond the glass. Charlie wasn't there yet, so I took off my towel and decided to get comfortable. Sliding down into the hot tub felt amazing. A hot shower is nice, but sinking into a pool of hot water is beyond comparison. I leaned back, sighed with contentment, and waited. Fortunately, I didn't have to wait long, as a few minutes later, Charlie walked in and gave me another million-dollar smile. Don't you look comfortable and in need of company? Then he dropped the towel he had on, and my jaw almost fell to the ground of the hot tub. I knew Charlie was a swimmer, but I had never seen him in a swimsuit up close before. He looked amazing, and I did everything I could not to stare. I was grateful that I could blame the water for already being bright red in my face. But even for someone who swam regularly, I thought I could feel a flicker of nerves on his part as he climbed into the hot tub. Thank God it wasn't just me. But that was nothing compared to what happened next. He didn't sit on the opposite end of the tub. No. Charlie slid over and sat right next to me. Now the heat in the room was feverish, like a sauna. Is this okay? He asked with a shy smile. Yeah, I managed to say. Neither of us said anything for what seemed like a long time. But at some point, I felt myself move closer to Charlie, and he did the same right before our lips touched. It felt amazing. Slow and warm, affectionate. Everything a kiss with someone you're attracted to could be. I'm not sure how long it lasted, but it felt like an eternity. Then Charlie slowly pulled away. I hate to stop, but if we stay any longer, we'll be dehydrated. I knew he had a point, so I let him get out before I followed. Feeling blissfully tired, I eased myself out of the hot tub and grabbed my towel to wrap around myself. As I glanced around the room, I noticed something. On one of the thick panes of glass, there was some sort of imprint. At first, I thought it was just condensation from the heat and the water against the cold outside. But then I took a closer look. Standing with my nose close against the glass, I thought it looked uncannily like a handprint, but the handprint of someone wearing gloves or something that made the fingers look unnaturally big, as the digits were all wider and thicker than a normal hand. Thinking it was nothing, I toweled off and caught up with Charlie in the hallway. His hairs was adorably wet from the hot tub. We made sure to be quiet because everyone was already asleep. Let's do that again sometime, he whispered. If you want to, of course. Sounds good to me, but now we need the shower and get the bed. I suppose we could always save water and do it together, he winked at me. I wouldn't mind that, but the big shower is in the master bedroom, and that's currently occupied. Our rooms have tiny showers which are barely big enough for one. You're right, but rain check? Consider yourself scheduled. He gave me a quick kiss before he was in his room and out of sight. Feeling giddy, I hopped in my bathroom shower quickly before I went to bed and fell asleep in good time. I woke up to sunlight streaming in through the windows. I could see the sky was a bright cold blue. Time for breakfast. When I threw on my bathrobe and headed downstairs, I found everyone else had the same idea. Cereal sounded good, 
so I made my way towards the boxes already set out on the counter. As I grabbed the Cheerios, I saw Charlie was sitting at the kitchen table eating scrambled eggs and toast with Justin. I caught his eye and gave him a smile. Jill, who was standing near the coffee maker, saw it and gave me a knowing smirk. Hey, did any of you step outside last night for some reason? Justin asked while I was pouring the cereal into one of the white porcelain bowls set out for breakfast. We all looked at each other and shook our heads in return. Weird, because there's footprints in the snow leading to the cabin, he said. Someone probably got lost or something. It happens, especially with the snow everywhere, Jill reasoned. We didn't know it at the time, but footprints in the snow would be our warning. It's the biggest difference between our situation and one of those scary summer camp movies. Snow, much like blood, never lies. After breakfast, we all got ready and headed to the neighboring ski resort. I had some skiing experience, so I wasn't brand new to it like Jill, Peter, or Yvonne. There's nothing like flying through the cold air while down a hill or mountain. It's what I imagine riding a motorcycle would be like. The time went quickly, and before long we were having lunch at the Lodge's local restaurant. We all had burgers and fries while the greatest hits of the decade flowed through the restaurant's stereo system. Duran Duran, Billy Idol, Madonna, Pat Benatar. Our lunch that day was one of those moments in time I wish I could bottle. Once we were all done with lunch, we headed back to the cabin since our muscles were now sore from our time on the slopes. We all headed back to the cabin since our muscles were now sore from our time on the slopes. We limped back into the house, changed into something more comfortable than our brightly colored ski gear and crashed in front of the TV where we watched the Terminator. But instead of sitting next to Peter like he had last night, Charlie wasted no time in grabbing a spot on the couch next to me. As he sat down, he gave my hand a gentle squeeze. From across the room, Jill gave me another knowing grin. As the movie ended, the sun was beginning to fade. The setting sun looked beautiful on the snow, which was still immaculate and unbroken in spots. Charlie, Jill, and Yvonne had nodded off during the movie and were stretching as they got off the couches. As Charlie had fallen asleep halfway through the movie, he spent the other half sleeping while pressed right up against me. I can't say I minded at all. Hey, I left something outside in the car. Yvonne said. Something fell out of my purse on the way home. I'll go grab it now. Bundle up, I said as she huddled towards the hallway closet to get her coat. We all heard the door slam shut and went about our business. A few minutes passed, then a few more. Yvonne still wasn't back yet. I'm going to go check on Yvonne, Peter said after 15 minutes had passed. Make sure everything is okay. This time we all followed him into the hallway and watched him bundle up and step outside. But when he did, there was no sight of Yvonne. Not by the car, not in the driveway, or anywhere else. The only thing we could see was the moon, which was full and seemed to shimmer in the frigid night air. So naturally... We all took a step outside as Peter walked out into the driveway and called for his girlfriend. Then, when he noticed there were footprints in the snow leading away from the garage and towards the wall of pines, he began heading that way. But Peter had only taken a few steps when his girlfriend emerged from the trees and began running towards him. When she was halfway to the cabin, she suddenly fell waist deep into the snow and Peter ran out to help her. But then I noticed there was someone else right behind her. It's ironic, really. The sight of someone in a black ski mask in literally any other setting would set you on edge. 
But at a ski lodge in the mountains, it would not be just appropriate but encouraging to protect yourself from the elements. The figure was wearing a black coat, black pants, and black combat style boots to match. The only thing that didn't match was the knife. It was gleaming in the moonlight. I was vaguely aware of Yvonne telling Peter to run and get back inside the house. I also slowly became aware that Yvonne was clutching her side and was bleeding. But before Peter realized what was going on, the stranger was on top of them, knife in hand. Despite a valiant attempt by Peter to fight the stranger off, he was no match, as the stranger was well over 6 feet and must have weighed 230 pounds. But just as it looked like everything would be over in a blood-soaked mess, Peter threw a punch and it landed right on the stranger's face and left him stunned and immobile. Yvonne and Peter immediately sprinted towards us, and we all ran into the cabin and slammed the door shut. Only when that was over did we pant and try to catch our breaths. Seeing something like that happen almost puts you in a trance. Even when the figure with the knife showed up, it didn't quite seem real. At least at first. For a moment we all just stood there, unable to move. The only thing I can compare it to is watching a movie in a language you don't understand with no subtitles. But then the fear set in and reality came crashing back in a split second. I tend to think of fear like alcohol. It comes in a million varieties and no two people have the same tastes. I had been afraid before, but seeing the worst almost happen to Yvonne and Peter was my first taste of true, unadulterated fear. Moonshine level fear. Fear that reaches out, grabs you by the throat and rips at you. While Peter, who had experience with first aid, checked Yvonne, we all double-checked to make sure the cabin was secure. What do we do? Jill whispered out. Call the police? Without waiting for a response, she hustled over to the phone in the sitting room and picked it up. She held it to her ear for a second before tossing it back down. Dad. There was so much in those four little letters. Okay. Charlie took a deep breath. We need to stay calm and think. He's out there, and we're in here. Unless he breaks in, he can't get to us. And if he does, we need to be able to fight back and subdue him. There are no windows big enough on the first floor, and the first floor has a deadbolt. So the only way in is through the glass walls of the patio. Barricade that door and we should be okay. Without saying a word, we ran to do just that. We shoved a bookcase, some chairs, and a table in front of the door to the patio. It was completely silent both inside and out. The adrenaline of everything began the register. The sudden strain on my body, which was already aching from skiing, was not pleasant. Fortunately, Yvonne only had the most superficial scratches, and the bleeding had already stopped. I don't get it. He should have been able to toss me aside like I was nothing. Why did that punch work? Maybe it was your ring, Yvonne suggested. It was that hand that you punched with, right? Peter held up his hand and looked at the ring on it. It was an old silver ring that his father had given him for his high school graduation. Yeah, you're right. It's always been very heavy. Probably hit a nerve or bone. Thank God for that, Yvonne muttered warily. We all murmured our agreement. All right, Justin whispered. We're safe in here for now, but let's not kid ourselves. Whoever this is has probably been watching us since we got here. If he really wants in, he will. But I suggest we go hide in the attic and pull up the trap door. That's the only way in or out. Is everyone all right with that? We furiously nodded our agreement. It was a good plan. Oh, and I suggest we get ourselves some weapons, some knives or something. There are no guns here, so I'll run to the kitchen and get some knives. Charlie, 
Go get a fireplace poker or two. Charlie did and came back what seemed like seconds later with one of the thick black antique pokers. Justin did the same with several large kitchen knives, handing one to Jill and me before he turned the Yvonne and Peter. Now we were all armed. It made me feel better. Let's go, Justin said before leading us up the wooden stairs to the second floor. We crept up in silence, which was unnerving. Each step made me nervous, as if the stranger in the ski mask was going to be right around every corner or was hiding in every shadow. After what seemed like a painfully long time, we arrived at the trap door to the attic. Justin carefully pulled it down, revealing the narrow stepladder leading up. I'll go first, just to check, he said bravely. With the knife held out in front of him, Justin slowly ascended the steps and vanished out of sight. Then there came a flash of illumination from above, one of the light bulbs dangling from the ceiling. Okay, come on up. Ladies first, Charlie nodded at the two of us. Jill went up before I did, and then it was Yvonne, with Peter and Charlie going last, bringing up the trap door as they did. Once it was firmly in place, Charlie and Justin managed to barricade it with some of the countless things stashed in the attic. It was the most packed room in the house, with boxes on top of boxes everywhere you looked. What do we do next? Jill asked. It's cold out. It's not like it's a warm summer evening and you could just stay out there all night long. If he can't get in here, he'll eventually have to go somewhere to warm up, Charlie said. Justin nodded in agreement. That's right, and if he does go through the patio glass, we barricaded the entrance. On top of that, we're up here, armed, where he can't get to us. Which is great, Charlie continued. But we can't stay up here indefinitely. You got the keys to the car? Sure do, but I'm not even considering making a run for it. I'll bet money the tires are already slashed. Fortunately, I made an appointment for us to go in the town to have some fun. Since tomorrow is New Year's Eve, I even rented a car for us. A limo with a phone and a driver who will be here in the morning. I knew I loved you for a reason. Jill gave him a quick kiss. So we wait until morning. That's the plan. They're supposed to be here at 9. I was going to tell you guys tonight. We could sleep in shifts if you like. Charlie and I both have on watches. I muttered a feeble yes before fumbling around in the boxes up here and pulling out some old blankets and pillows to put on the floor. Charlie was nice enough to cuddle with me to help me relax, but it was all pointless. Every time I closed my eyes, I saw what almost happened to Yvonne and Peter, and I expected to hear the shattering of glass or the splintering of the front door at any moment. But the only thing we did hear was the occasional howl of a wolf out there in the snow. For some reason, the sound made my hair stand up on end. Not only did it sound frighteningly close, the howl sounded angry. I'd never heard a wolf sound like that before. Eventually, I gave up and sat upright so Justin and Jill could try the same thing. We spent the next 12 hours or so in a state of frazzled nerves and tense moods. I sat with my arms holding my legs, making sure to try to stretch my limbs occasionally so they wouldn't fall asleep. The others did the same. By the time morning came, we were beyond exhausted. Justin got us ready to head downstairs at exactly 8.57 a.m. After he and Charlie moved the barricade on the trap door, he turned to face us. Let's move as a group, facing different angles so we don't have any surprises. With that, he gingerly moved the trap door down and one by one we walked down the stairs. I gripped my knife tightly in my hand as I did. This was even worse than the walk up the stairs. Each footstep seemed far too loud. I was expecting the stranger to leap out at us at every step we took. 
We made it to the front door after an eternity and waited. And waited. When it was 9 a.m. precisely, Justin gingerly slid open the peephole and looked. It's all clear. Then we heard the most beautiful sound I had ever heard. The sound of a car pulling up to the house. Justin undid the deadbolt. Let's get his attention and make sure we get the hell out of here. He said before he flung the door open and we ran into the blinding white morning towards the massive black limo. I don't remember all of what happened next but I faintly remember my heart pounding in my ears while I screamed and waved my arms. I think the other three did the same. The poor limo driver bolted out of the driver's seat and looked like we were something out of his worst nightmare. But the guy, who looked just a few years older than us, heard us out, especially when we pointed out the human-sized imprints in the snow. The driver, whose name turned out to be Steve, called the authorities for us on the phone while we waited, and waited vigilantly with our backs to the limo facing the scenery. The fear and tension somewhat lighter but still there, just as cold as the air. After that, we got into the mercifully warm limo before we heard police sirens screaming towards us. By then we had calmed enough to explain what had happened, and walked them through everything. But about halfway through Justin's explanation, one of the cops standing by the rental car called out to his colleagues. Hey boys, come here, he said before drawing his weapon. Moments later, everyone there saw a track of human footprints leading around the cabin. That was unnerving enough, but things took a turn for the downright weird when those human footprints turned into much larger footprints footprints that I had never seen before. And unlike the previous ones, which were clearly left by some kind of boot, looked like they were made by bare feet. Everyone there just stood there in shock, unsure of what to do or think. Eventually, someone there decided to refer to our unwanted guest as the Abominable Snowman. The next few hours passed in a haze of questions. Cops asking us questions about what happened. Doctors and nurses making sure everything was in order. Yvonne was perfectly fine. She eventually revealed that the stranger had chased her into the woods after ambushing her outside the cabin. That was where the scratches had come from. But the doctors did note they looked uncannily long and deep for a human hand to be able to leave such marks. But there was nothing they could suggest and all the tests showed that Yvonne was fine. Eventually, we were free to go, and we headed over to the hotel rooms Justin's parents had arranged for us when he called them and explained what had happened. It was a cozy place downtown. It was late afternoon by the time we checked in and limped up to our rooms. Despite the warmth of the hotel, the cold from the past 12 hours had seeped into my bones. But we couldn't have asked for better arrangements. Four massive bedrooms with separate bathrooms connected by a massive sitting room, which contained another bathroom. But after I put my things down and sat on the couch in one of the rooms, I felt something inside me shift and I started sobbing. Charlie immediately came over and quietly held me in his arms. I don't know how long I sobbed for but I felt a lot better when I was finished. Next door, I thought I could hear Jill doing the same thing. We were all alive and safe. There was nothing else I could have asked for. We had just settled in and changed into our pajamas when there was a knock at the door. It was the chauffeur, Steve, who was holding an expensive-looking bottle. I'm truly sorry about your night, but me and the cops chipped in and got this for you. Y'all have earned it. Without a word, we all buried Steve in a group hug before cracking it open with him. It was champagne. Dom Perignon. By now, we were all too wired to sleep, so we just relaxed until it was time to ring in the new year. With glasses from our minibar holding expensive booze, we toasted. 
two surviving. Jill toasted with weariness and pride. We all sipped. And to thriving, Yvonne added. We all sipped again. Somewhere in there, we had some food and watched a few movies we had retrieved from the cabin. Steve was more than happy to join us. Then we tuned in the Dick Clark to watch the end of 1989. It was a far easier wait than our time in the attic. Happy New Year! We all managed to yell out when the moment arrived. Then Charlie and I kissed. From the corner of my eye, I saw Jill and Justin do the same. Yvonne and Peter also weren't about to be left out of the festivities, especially after what had happened. Happy New Year, babe, Charlie whispered. Happy New Decade, babe, I said affectionately. That moment is one of my favorite New Year's Eve memories. Mere hours before, it seemed like we may not make it to the next year, but we did. While everyone on TV sang Old Lang Syne, chauffeur Steve bid us good night, and we all went to our respective rooms. Right before I went to sleep, Charlie wrapped his arms around me. Do you have a New Year's resolution? He whispered in my ear. Get out of here and go somewhere warm. It was a warm night as I parked near the multiplex located inside the Forest Valley Mall. The weather was perfect, not a cloud in the bright blue sky, which was slowly fading into a deep purple with splashes of red. Up ahead, the mall's gleaming white facade loomed over the horizon. Fireflies drifted through the air and dotted the parking lot with glowing yellow specks. Ready to go? I asked Erica. Sure thing, Casey. She smiled at me and I tried to act like it didn't make my insides do backflips. Erica was one of the most beautiful women I had ever seen. Long brown hair, piercing blue eyes, a beautiful smile and perfect golden skin. She was dressed casually, but nicely in a red blouse and classy jeans. I nodded and we both got out of my car, a beige 1981 Chevy Malibu, and headed towards the massive glass double doors facing the parking lot, which was packed with cars. When we stepped inside, I was immediately hit with the flawless temperature that was just cool enough, the neatly soothing background music, and the oddly calming smell of suburban retail. We strode past the massive fountain splashing in the atrium, the escalator leading the way to the second floor, the food court with the vendor's name spelled out in neon lights, and walked towards the theater which was located by Sears, one of the anchor stores. When we passed the fountain, the pennies lying at the bottom gleamed in the fading daylight. As our shoes clicked quietly on the white tile floor, you could feel that it was a Friday night. The air crackled with that unique mix of adrenaline and excitement that only a Friday night in summer creates. Toys R Us was jam-packed with overexcited kids and their frazzled parents. While the older kids were busy down at Sam Goody's or greedily gulping down drinks from Orange Julius. School had just let out, and no matter what your age was, it's a reason to celebrate. Since Memorial Day had come and gone again, summer was here. It wasn't long before we arrived at the theater. The lines stretching out in front meant that we weren't the only ones who wanted to see Return of the Jedi, which was spelled out on the marquee in tall black letters. Erica and I got in line, which hummed with a pleasant buzz of chit-chat, the usual inconsequential stuff you talk about in lines anywhere. 
I'd been looking forward to seeing this movie since 1980, and now that it was here, I could hardly believe it. I could also hardly believe what had happened in the world since 1980 either, or since the first Star Wars film came out in 1977 for that matter. But I guess that's the entire point. No matter what happens, Star Wars is always there for you, waiting to be picked up and experienced. Just like no matter how cold and dark a winter is, summer always comes. Standing there amidst the sea of blue and purple neon lights of the mall, I was on top of the world. There's something inherently nostalgic about summer. Perhaps it's because summer itself is so memorable. Summer sears itself in memory with electric blue skies, brilliant white sand, and grass so green it doesn't look real. With long heady days and balmy nights, summer literally sears your flesh if you don't slather on enough sunscreen. Or maybe it's because summer is irretrievably connected to memories we all have about summer vacations when we were young. The vacations we took and the fun we had, going to the movies to see the latest summer blockbuster. There's a reason a summer romance is something special. I've never heard anyone talk with longing about a spring romance or a winter romance. There's no denying summer is a magical time of year. The last summer before you went off to high school or college is a lot like the last Halloween you went trick-or-treating. There were good times before it and good times after it, but there's no denying that things were different after. Summer is also the most euphoric of seasons. That roar of energy you feel when school lets out. The giant shimmering promise of tomorrow being all your own. The only assignment for summer is to get out, enjoy every day, and make it count. It's practically in our blood as Americans to cherish summer, as the country was created during the hot, sticky summer of 1776. Although this summer my assignment was getting to know Erica Ashton. I'd met her last week at a Memorial Day cookout at my friend Drew's house, and I knew the instant I saw her that I had to go talk to her. Approaching her, I can't remember the last time I was that nervous about anything. Even though she was sitting outside by the pool while eating a hamburger and some potato salad, she may as well have been on another planet from me. But when she started talking, Erica was so friendly and warm that it put even a nervous wreck like me at ease. I was shocked at how much we had in common. And when I mentioned I wanted to see this movie, she mentioned that she did as well. And despite the nagging voice in my head saying that she would never come with me, I went through and asked. To my eternal surprise, Erica said yes. Quite frankly, that's more surreal to me than any science fiction movie. The lines steadily moved up until it was our turn and we got two tickets for the 9pm showing. Let's grab seats first and once that's over, we'll head to the snack bar. She nodded. Good idea. We walked past the ticket booths, the snack bar, and the restrooms before we entered our theater which was theater number three. We managed to find two seats in the middle on the left section. Row 12 still had two free aisle seats, which I was happy about. Which one do you prefer? I gestured towards the chairs. Doesn't matter to me. Then I'll take the aisle seat. I stood back and let her slide in before I sat down beside her and checked my watch. It was 8.45, 15 minutes to showtime. The buzz of excitement was starting to fill the theater, which was slowly filling up. From the way it looked so far, I suspected we'd have a full house, which made me happy. 
This was the kind of movie you needed to see with the packed theater. Just like sports fans, movie fans speak a second language and feed off of each other's excitement. Want some snacks? I turned to Erica. I'm planning on getting a medium popcorn. Don't worry, I'll share. She laughed. I promise I won't sneak at all when you aren't looking. I'll take a Coke. Coming right up, try not to let anyone steal our seats. No, I'm totally going to be a pushover and let them just kick us out of our seats. Funny. Be right back. I walked back into the lobby and headed towards the purple concession stand, the line for which was small but the area was humming with activity. The area was filled with the buttery smell of fresh popcorn and the sounds of people talking, the popcorn popping, and the cash register clanging away. Two Cokes and a medium popcorn. I ordered when it was my turn at the register. Five bucks, the teenage guy manning the front said. Like the other employees, he was dressed in a red vest with a silver name tag clipped to it. After making change, he filled two paper cups with soda and placed them on the counter before turning to fill a paper bag with popcorn. He eventually placed the bag on the counter with the drinks. Would you like a drink holder for these? Please. I nodded, and he quickly put both drinks in a cardboard container before I grabbed it and the popcorn and headed back to my seat. Thanks, Erica said as I handed her a Coke and sat back down. The chair creaked slightly as I sat. No problem. As soon as I sat back down in my seat, I started munching on popcorn. It doesn't matter if the movie is on or not. Popcorn needs to be eaten fresh. Otherwise, it gets stale. For the last few minutes... The anticipation in the room built up and the minutes the lights on the deep red walls went out, the crowd started to cheer. I didn't blame them one bit. No matter how many times you see it, there is nothing like it when a screen goes from blank to a full-fledged picture in the blink of an eye. Everyone is instantly a kid again. For the next few hours, Erica and I experienced the final of the great cinema event of our era. Once the ending credits came on, the entire theater, which included the two of us, burst into applause and gave the movie a standing ovation. As I clapped along with everyone else, I smiled with both a sense of happiness and a touch of sadness. I thought of who I had been when the first Star Wars came out, and who I'd gone with, my best friend Jimmy and his siblings. Jimmy and his family had moved away, and while I still had his address, we lost touch, but I thought of him often. I silently hoped he was somewhere having as much fun watching this movie as I was. I need to use the restroom before we leave, I told Erica as we made our way to the exit. Me too. I'll wait for you near the snack bar. Sounds good. When I was done, I found Erica where she said she'd be. By now, the theater had quieted down and the mood was much mellower than when we had arrived. Two uniformed ushers were sweeping the floors while patrons were steadily trickling out of the mall. We made our way out in relative quiet until we reached the front doors we came in through. Thanks for inviting me. I really enjoyed the movie. Erica said as we stepped outside and walked to the car. It was chillier now, and the light breeze gently shook the few trees that were around. I enjoyed it too, and I'm really glad you came with me. I'm thrilled you invited me. Definitely one of the better summer memories I've had recently. Well, I'm glad you had a good time. But I'm sorry to hear you've had a rough go of it recently. Oh no, don't worry about it, Casey. She paused while we both got in my car. I was just thinking out loud. It happens. 
I slammed my door shut and started the car. I'm just really glad that Donna made me come to the Memorial Day cookout. Me too, I laughed. Without saying a word, she reached over and quickly gave my hand an affectionate squeeze, a gesture I returned. Did you not want to come? Believe me, I get Ray can be a bit over the top at times. He can, he can, but that wasn't it at all. Last summer, something bad went down at a summer camp I was a counselor at. I'm sorry to hear that. Thank you, believe me. There was no guy in a hockey mask or anything. Can you watch those movies after what happened? Oh, absolutely. Not a problem at all. For starters, I know it's not real. The only one that's even remotely realistic is the first Friday the 13th. Right. But aside from that, what happened at Camp Chestnut bore no resemblance to the movies at all. That didn't stop people from telling campfire stories about it, but it's not what happened. Of course not. Do you mind me asking what did happen? Right at that moment, I passed a streetlight, and the orange light briefly illuminated her face. She smiled a wry, knowing, sad smile. Not at all. I wouldn't have brought it up if I didn't want to talk about it. One of the counselors went missing one night. It was towards the end of camp, right before Labor Day. Everyone went to bed one night, and the next morning, we found that Megan had just vanished. There was no sign of struggle, no sign of an intruder, no nothing. They searched the lake and found nothing there either. Since there was nothing for the police to go on, the search was over fast. Megan's parents hired a private investigator, and even he couldn't find anything. That's wild. It sure was. The camp hadn't done anything wrong, but that didn't stop it from being shut down immediately. Fortunately, camp was due to let out in a few days anyway, so it's not like the whole thing went down and ruined the kids' whole summer. But still, it shook the rest of us up pretty bad. I'm sure it did. Megan was the kind of girl who never met a stranger. In all the time I was there, I never heard her say a bad word about anyone. She was responsible, caring, and hilariously funny. That's one reason why it shook us up so bad. There are a few counselors there who wouldn't have shocked me one bit if something happened to them. Megan was not one of them. I could imagine. That's awful. Where's this Camp Chestnut at? Way down on the south side of the state, past Philadelphia and close to Maryland. Wild. Sure was. Erica added as I pulled up in front of her house, which was only a five-minute drive from the mall. Thanks again for tonight. I had a really nice time. You're welcome. I'm really happy you came. Without saying another word, she leaned in and kissed me on the lips. Her lips were beyond soft and gentle. But before I knew it, she pulled away with a knowing smile. And thank you for that as well. My pleasure. She smiled again before we both got out of the car. I stood there with my hands in my pockets as she dug through her purse for what I assumed were her keys. Do you want to see what Megan looked like? She asked without looking up. Sure. She pulled out a Polaroid and handed it to me. The photo showed a dozen people standing in front of a stunning lake on a beautiful summer day. I could practically feel the humidity in the photo. Everyone in the shot was wearing blue shorts and white shirts with blue lettering that spelled out Camp Chestnut. That's her. She pointed to the far left side of the picture. When I saw who she was pointing to, I felt like I had just been sucker punched. 
The person in that photo was a little bit older and a lot taller than when I had last saw her, but I knew exactly who she was. Megan Cartwright, my old friend Jimmy's sister. I stood there silently as I took the piece of information in. Jimmy's sister, who I'd spent time with in countless family cookouts, holidays, and even other possible events, had just vanished one day, and no one had ever said a word to me about it. Erica could tell something was up, so I swallowed hard and told her what was going on. She too stood there speechless when the realization washed over her. What are you going to do? She asked after what seemed like a long time. I don't know. I guess I'll give Jimmy a call. That's a good idea. Erica nodded before we called it a night with the hug that seemed to last both an eternity and no time at all. On the way home, the radio was nothing but indecipherable white noise as I was alone with my thoughts. The car seemed to be on autopilot as I wove up and down the streets and finally parked in my driveway. My house was dark as my parents were already asleep for the night. It was only 10, so it wasn't too late. I knew from experience that Jimmy stayed up late like I did. We'd spend countless nights up late watching movies at the Twilight Drive-In. Careful not to make too much noise as I came in and switched on a few lights. I crept over to the kitchen and grabbed the address book where we kept all the contact information for family, friends, and everyone in between. Once Jimmy's info was in front of me, I dialed the number. I stood there awkwardly as the phone rang. I had no idea what to say if anyone even picked up the phone. But on the fifth ring, someone answered. Hello? A slightly out of breath male voice answered. Jimmy? I heard myself ask. Yes? He said in a hesitant voice. It's Casey. Casey? Casey Flanagan? That's right. Well, this is a surprise. His voice was a lot warmer than it had been a few seconds ago. Been a long time. It sure has. How are you? I'm good. It's just good to hear from you. But I'm more than a little curious as to why you're calling me. Of course. Well, I just got back from a date, and the girl that I was with said she was a counselor at the same camp your sister went missing at. Camp Chestnut. I'm so sorry, Jimmy. He was silent for a few moments. Mind if I ask you the girl's name? Erica? Always liked her. Although I have to admit, I'm shocked she went out with you. You and me both, but I'm truly sorry to hear about your sister. Thanks. It was rough for a while, but we're doing better now. The worst part about it is not knowing what happened. No one has a clue. I'm sure. But we haven't given up looking. My family and a few others have been doing our own detective work and we have a place to check out in the next few days. It's an island off the coast of the Carolinas. You're welcome to join us. I... I'd really like to see you again. For old time's sake. We're even going to be taking my dad's boat. Remember it? Do I ever. Remember the time he took us out fishing and we couldn't catch so much as a piece of seaweed, so we spent the rest of the trip home watching Scooby-Doo? Absolutely. So will I see you in a few days? Yes. Looking forward to seeing you again. You too. And Casey? Thanks for joining us. And thanks even more for calling. You're welcome. Here's where to meet us at. He added before he listed the address and time. It was a Maryland boat harbor. See you then. Good night. Good night, Jimmy. I hung up the phone and stared out the back porch. 
I was really going to go on a search party to find my old friend's missing sister. Years ago, we would have invented some sort of game like this. Now it was all too real. After a drink of water, I went to bed and slept soundly. I woke up the next morning to the smell of eggs and bacon, and while I ate with my parents, I told them about what I had discovered and how I would be joining the search party in a few days. My parents were shocked at the news, but they were supportive of me joining the effort to help. The day of searching for Megan arrived sooner than I expected. Once I grabbed a flashlight and some other gear, I was heading down the road to the tail end of Maryland. The sun gleamed high in the sky as I eased through woods and weaved down highways. It was stiflingly hot by the time I arrived at the location the boat was anchored at. It was late afternoon, and the salty sea air was sticky and humid. Seagulls squawked loudly overhead as they circled for food and the waves lapped against the various boats docked at the harbor. Jimmy was there to greet me the minute that I parked my car. Despite my sunglasses, I had to shield my eyes from the sun to see him. He looked good. He had put on some muscle since I last saw him, and he was a bit taller than I remembered. But despite that, he still looked like my old friend. He immediately ambled over for a hug that I swear made my shoulders pop. Take it easy, son. We need Casey to be able to lift a flashlight. I heard his father say with his usual dry sense of humor. Mr. Cartwright. I turned to face him and held out my hand to shake. Good to see you again. You too, Casey. Always liked you. Thanks for coming to help us. Mr. Cartwright was a bit grayer and a bit bulkier than the last time I saw him, but he still had the same mustache and beard he had always had. Sure thing, glad to help. Then Mr. Cartwright took a moment to introduce me to the other four men joining the search party. Simon Boncroft, Jim O'Malley, Pete Jennings, and Mitch Portman were old family friends and had joined the Cartwrights on numerous outings like this to find Megan, or whatever had happened to her. We're going to Green Cove. It's just off the coast of the Carolinas. We should be there in a few hours. There's plenty of food and entertainment aboard, so settle in and enjoy the ride, gentlemen. Mr. Cartwright clapped his hands and led us aboard his massive boat which was unsurprisingly named Megan. There was indeed plenty of food laid out in the sitting room, which was equipped with a TV and radio. Once we were all settled in, Mr. Cartwright went up to start the boat and steer us out to open water. The rest of us grabbed paper plates and loaded them up with potato chips, pretzels, several kinds of dips, and some cheesy potato casserole that we ate while we debated about what movie to watch. I was pleased when we decided on Raiders of the Lost Ark. Once we popped it in the VCR next to the TV, we all settled down on couches and relaxed as we cruised down south on the open water. Sipping soda and eating chips while watching one of my favorite movies made me forget about what we were up to which I suspected was the whole point. I had no doubt this was a way for them to decompress and relax despite everything. We arrived off the coast of the Carolinas just as the movie was ending. Green Cove was stunning. The views of the water around it were spectacular, and the sand looked soft and comforting. I could easily see myself curled up there with a paperback for the afternoon. The beach was dotted with palm trees, and there was a pleasant breeze that made them all flutter in a calming rhythm. But something was off about Green Cove. By the looks of it, the island was deserted. Everything was unnaturally still. But that didn't make sense, since I could see plenty of small boats parked on the shore. So where did all the people go? Do you see the boats, Mr. Cartwright? 
Sure do, Casey. He said before he grabbed a pair of binoculars and peered through them. There are people there, or there were. The question is, what happened? What do we do, Dad? Jimmy asked. He thought for a moment. Son, you and Casey stay on the boat and keep watch with Pete and Mitch. Jim and Simon, you two come with me to look around. The men all nodded and grabbed their gear before going the shore. Pete and Mitch stood at the top deck with Jimmy and me, and we watched as they set foot on the island. Jimmy's dad and the other two had walkie-talkies with them, so we could contact them if need be. But it was too quiet. Every moment they were gone felt painfully drawn out. I couldn't help but think about how if there were people out there, they would have heard us approach in the boat and knew exactly where we were. I did the best I could to push those thoughts out of my head as we waited. We had several pairs of binoculars that we took turns passing around, and we had been keeping watch for about 15 minutes when static suddenly started coming from the walkie-talkies and they crackled to life. Get the boat started and ready to go immediately. We're getting out of here was all Mr. Cartwright said before the walkie-talkie went silent again. We all stood there, unsure of what to do. But within moments, Jimmy's dad and the others bursted out of the greenery, sprinting towards the boat and climbed aboard. Without pausing to take a breath, Mr. Cartwright started the boat and we sped out of there. The water splashed behind us as we peeled away from the island and went out to sea. But as we pulled away from shore, Pete and I looked behind us and saw the shape of someone watching us leave. From that distance, I couldn't make out much, but I could tell they were wearing a burlap sack with eye holes cut in it as a mask. The figure just stood there and watched us as well. There is absolutely no way to confirm this, but I felt the figure's eyes on me as the boat roared away. I had no idea what was going on, but I knew something was deeply wrong, and I couldn't wait to be far away from here. I wasn't the only one either, because Jimmy's dad was going way faster than before, and the water splashed around us with a vengeance. I had to hold on to my seat to make sure I didn't fall out of it, but I wasn't complaining. As he piloted the boat, Jimmy's dad was also radioing for help. I could only make out a few words, but I would find out later what happened, as everyone who had left the boat was just sitting there in complete shock. That frightened me more than anything, and I was dying to know what they had found or what had happened. But nothing could prepare me for the story when it was finally told to me several hours later. When they came ashore, Jimmy's dad and the other two had found bodies strung up in trees and several heads impaled on spikes, with no sign of any human life around. By the time the cops were able to arrive and search the island, there was no trace of anyone there either. Nor was there any sign of Jimmy's sister. The only noteworthy thing the cops found on the island was the wreckage of a boat. It was an old wooden craft, and it had deep scratches made on both the outside and the inside. When analyzed, tests showed that they had been made by an animal, more specifically a wolf. Things got even creepier when they found the bodies the severed heads had been attached to inside the boat. They were not only also covered with similar scratches to the boat, the coroner declared the cause of death to be made by an animal attack, and the bite marks on the bodies were also matched as a large wolf. When the story was finished, I stood there in complete shock. I had been a lifelong horror movie fan and watcher of crime shows, but this felt beyond unnatural. Everyone involved, but especially Mr. Cartwright, was in complete shock. The situation had been crazy to begin with. 
but this was beyond anyone's wildest imagination. What had they found? What had we all inadvertently stumbled into? The police were just as shocked as we were. Eventually, they managed to connect what they had found to be several missing persons cases spanning several states in the Northeast and the South. But that's all they could do because there was absolutely no leads they could investigate. Things eventually calmed down after that and life went on. Erica and I went on a few more dates and things steadily got more serious. I had practically forgotten about that day on the boat when we went to see Indiana Jones in the Temple of Doom almost exactly one year later. Personally, I prefer Raiders of the Lost Ark, but Erica absolutely loved it. Jimmy, who had come along on a double date with his girlfriend Juliana, loved it as well, while Juliana agreed with me. Once we left the movie, we went to a local pizza place for dinner before we grabbed some ice cream at the place next door. It was a wonderful evening that we ended up at my house where Jimmy was due to spend the night. If there was one positive thing that came out of this awful situation, it was that Jimmy and I rekindled our friendship. Jimmy fell asleep quicker than I did, and I had to get up to grab a drink of water in the middle of the night. Once I grabbed my drink, I stood in the patio while looking out over our backyard. I was just about to head back to bed when I saw it. A shadow looking out at me from the tree line where our property ended. At first, I wasn't sure I saw it. But when I took a closer look, there was no mistaking it was there. My stomach clenched as I wondered what I was looking at. My eyes frantically tried to figure out what was there in the dim nighttime light. Moments later, I realized I was looking at what looked like a giant wolf's head. I thought it was a joke for a second, but if it was a joke, it was the best illusion I had ever seen. The wolf was the most authentic looking I had ever seen practically cinema effects worthy. But it was those eyes that convinced me that it was no joke. They looked at me with a restrained knowing that it was frighteningly real. And as my eyes adjusted, I saw it was attached to what looked like a giant humanoid body covered with matching fur. I had no idea how big it was, but even from this angle it looked huge. For what seemed like an eternity, I just stood there, watching the giant wolf watch me. It stood there equally still, not moving or doing anything besides studying me. Then, out of nowhere, it opens its massive jaws in a fang-bearing gesture that I could only stand there and watch. And in the blink of an eye, it leapt out from where it was hiding and went over the hedge and into the nearby woods. I shook my head as if to clear my mind. The whole thing seemed like a dream. I eventually walked back to my bedroom and drifted off to a restless sleep hours later. After breakfast, I told Jimmy what I had seen. He didn't know what to make of it either. What could I do besides just wonder and speculate? Eventually, the conversation moved on to what movie we should see next. Ghostbusters or Gremlins? He asked. I had to stifle a laugh. Ghostbusters. Jimmy stared at me for a moment before he realized what he had just asked. Oh, oh yeah, good point. So Ghostbusters was our next movie outing. And... It was a blast. I'm a longtime manager of musicians. And while I've managed several artists throughout my career, there is no doubt my career will always be best known for the band Rattlesnake Venom. 
I first stumbled upon the group that would be known as Rattlesnake Venom in the fall of 1997. That was back when I was a young agent and always in search of new acts to sign to the label. The band was playing a local event at a fairground. The people around were half listening as they were eating barbecue. I just finished eating as the band playing ended, took a bow, and then the next band took the stage. I half listened to the introduction, and they hit their first note and took up a song. That was when I knew. So I didn't hesitate for a moment in approaching them after their set was over. I introduced myself, presented my card, and invited them to join me for drinks at a local place where we could talk. I couldn't tell you how long we talked, maybe a few hours, but it was one of the best nights of my life, and it ended with them unanimously agreeing that they wanted me to manage them. I happily accepted, but swore to them the minute they wanted new management, I would step aside, and I agreed to it in writing. The early years were the most fun. We were all young, ambitious, and learning. When you're on the road with each other, you get to know people in a way that most people never do. Hitting up late night diners for coffee and food, the walls slowly start to come down and you see people as they are. Liam was the lead singer and the main songwriter. But Liam wasn't just a terrific singer. He was a true showman and entertainer. With a background in theater, he truly performed on stage and put on a show for the audience. He, along with Charlie, Tim, and Leland, who each played a variety of instruments, started to become something. Something special. But eventually, things began to come apart. The tiny little things became a million tiny little things, which became a few not-so-little things, and before too long, it's only a matter of time before everyone acknowledges the writing on the wall and calls it quits. And then one day, you hear the one sentence that's obviously been rehearsed. We're going in a new direction and would like new management. There it was. I nodded and immediately signed the papers in keeping with my promise all those years ago. After that, I kept busy with my label and other projects but I occasionally saw flashes of Rattlesnake Venom in the news. It was hard not to, because their new management had a bit of different philosophy than mine. Very different, but whatever. It wasn't my problem anymore. But then, five years later, my assistant Howard buzzed me from his office, which was located outside of mine. Liam is here to see you. He informed me over the phone. Howard didn't need to specify which Liam it was. Send him in in 10 minutes, I eventually said. Will do. I casually leaned back in my chair while Liam was waiting. 10 minutes later, there was a knock at the door and Howard poked his head in. Liam for you? Thank you. I nodded, and Howard stepped away and let Liam in before he closed the door behind him. The first thing I noticed was how tired he looked, worn, like he hadn't slept in a long time. Hi, Perry, he said while standing in front of my desk. Hello. I didn't stand up, shaking his hand or offer him coffee. The usual things I do when someone visits my office. I bet you're wondering why I'm here. Not really. I have an idea why. That shouldn't surprise me. You've always been scary smart. So get on with it. We're in trouble. Liam blurted out. You're in trouble? I repeated flatly. Yes. So why don't you have your management or any of your other people take care of it? That's what they're there for. We've tried. They can't really do anything. 
they keep looking into what we tell them to, but they swear they can't find anything amiss. How unfortunate for you. They're not you, Perry. I chuckled. Obviously, that's what you wanted, remember? I know, and we feel terrible about it. I can't imagine how it hurt you. Who said it hurt me? I certainly didn't. It didn't hurt you? Not like you think. I was angry and felt unappreciated for sure. But it was a business decision, and you're right. I accepted that, and here we both are. Well, we feel terrible about how we treated you. I'm sure you do. So stop patronizing me and get on with what you came here to say. Okay, I'm sorry. I just wanted it out that we feel terrible and you deserved better. I'm here because I'm afraid. We all are. Afraid of what? Someone is after us. We're being watched. No, we're not just being watched. We're being followed too. I can feel it whenever I go somewhere. So can the others. It's not like the usual stuff we've dealt with in the past. Then get some security. We did, but that didn't stop it. I could feel something bad is going on, and I'm afraid. We all are. I sighed. Why are you here? And don't tell me you're afraid. Tell me the real reason. You're the smartest person I've ever met, and we're clueless. Shoot, I'm not even here on hope. It's just something I felt like I needed to do. Now here's something I feel I need to do. Get out of my office, figure out what the problem is, and deal with it. Or have your management do it. That's literally their job. Now if you don't mind, I have work to do. Liam nodded his head silently and turned to leave. But just before he left, he turned around and said, I really am sorry, Perry. Truly. Okay, good luck. Then I put my head down to focus on what I had been doing and Liam left my office without saying another word. I got the news of Tim's death a few weeks after that. Car accident, and a nasty one at that. The car had so many deep dents and scratches on the surface it was barely recognizable. Of course it made front page news and was a big headline for a while. I attended the funeral. My presence there was noted by most who attended, and everyone who spoke to me was grateful for it. Not that they were surprised, as there was never any doubt I'd attend. It was my final obligation to the band, one I had planned long in advance. The other band members were there as well, and I took care to avoid them as much as possible. At some point, I looked over and saw them all looking at me with what could only be described as pleading, wistful looks. I rolled my eyes at them and looked away, but that didn't stop them from cornering me at the catered lunch. I was in the middle of a turkey sandwich on a croissant when I felt their presence. So I put the sandwich down and stared at them. I don't know what you expect from me, so please leave me alone. They all looked awful, pale, drawn, and exhausted. If I was still their manager, it would be literally my job to try to fix whatever the issue was. But now they were just other guests at a catering lunch. No one spoke at first. They just stood there awkwardly in front of the table I was sitting at. Leland took a tentative step towards me. We're not asking for a favor, Perry. We'll compensate you for your troubles, in full. And what do you expect me to do in return? Check under your beds to make sure no monsters are lurking there? No, we would just like your advice. On what? How to stop whatever this is. I don't have the slightest clue on what's going on with you all, and it's none of my business. I'm good, I won't argue with that but even I have my limits. Here's the best advice I could give you, and it's completely free. You all have talent, but you would have been nothing without me. Know why that is? 
You have no ability to see the big picture and plan ahead. That's why I know whatever mess you were in, it's because you got careless with something and couldn't afford to be careless with it. So figure out what that is and straighten it out. Now, if you don't mind, I like to eat in peace. I could tell literally everyone was trying to listen in to our conversation, but I didn't care. I was tired of being hounded for nothing. The three of them quietly left me alone and didn't bother me for the rest of the afternoon. So I went back to business as usual and thought nothing more about it. I wasn't sure when I first felt someone watching me. Not too long after Tim's funeral, it was subtle at first. That nagging feeling that something is slightly off. You can't quite place it, but somehow something is amiss. But then you forget about it until it happens a second time. Then a third time. That's when you really start to get uneasy. I started looking at everything and everyone with unease, thinking they were all potentially behind what was going on. That's one of the many unpleasant feelings that comes with feeling like you're being watched. You don't know who's behind it or who's in on it. One night after I had had enough, I picked up my phone and sent three identical texts to different numbers. The message was exactly one sentence long. Then I drove to the diner exactly an hour away, ordered a cup of coffee and a piece of cake, and waited. As I expected, all three people I messaged showed up exactly when I told them to. They all walked over to me with weird resembling hope in their expressions. Order something. I told Liam, Leland, and Charlie once they sat down. We're not really hungry, Charlie said. That wasn't a question or suggestion. I don't need to tell you all how sharing a meal helps the creative juices. And all three of you need all the creative juices you could get right now, so order up. They didn't need to be told twice. Leland ordered a tomato soup and grilled cheese. Charlie went with the roasted turkey dinner. Liam got a cheeseburger and fries, and I got an omelette. Once we all got a refill of coffee, I took a sip and looked at them expectantly. Okay, now spill. What's going on? I don't know, Perry. Liam began. Honestly, I know we're being watched, but I can't say by who or even why. Yes, you do. You know it has something to do with Tim. Right. The only other thing I could think of that one night soon after he died, I was out on a camping trip with some friends. It was late, and I was out by the campfire by myself, and out in the distance, I hear a wolf howl. Then I heard several more wolves reply. I found the sight captivating, went to bed, and then I forgot about it. Or at least I did until the next morning while we were eating breakfast. My friend Jonathan told me that he woke up in the middle of the night. When he did, he could see a giant shape from outside his tent. And when he went out to investigate, there was nothing there but some giant footprints leading away from the camp that suddenly disappeared. Weird. That alleged car accident? Leland spoke up. I don't think was accidental at all. Tim was a good driver, you know that. I do, I nodded. Okay, so if it wasn't accidental, there had to be a reason why. That's what we're all struggling with, Charlie sighed. You act like this is all a ruse to scare you, when it could be another reason. To get information or try to learn something. I can't imagine what that would be, especially if it was related to Tim, Liam said. Was it an art thing? I asked. All the members of the group had their various interests and passions. Liam owned a vineyard, Charlie was a car collector, Leland was all about planes, and Tim had been the group's resident art collector. All three of them looked at each other for a moment. It's possible. Liam finally nodded after a moment. 
It would explain why something happened to him and to him alone. So if that's the working theory, then there has to be a specific reason why this all started now. Tim's been a long-time collector as long as you guys have been successful, so why now? I don't know anything for certain, Leland said. But all this started not long after Tim returned from Europe. Okay, and we all know Tim never went anywhere like that without picking up something nice to put on his wall or shelf. This was met with silent nods before our food arrived. We all ate quietly for a moment while I was deep in thought. So, if Tim bought or obtained something, then the conclusion is that it's something that someone really, really wants. Which would make sense why we're being watched, to see if we know where it is or if we have it. We? Liam asked uncertainly. I gave Liam a silent look that immediately made him understand. If whoever wants whatever this valuable is, then it would make sense that if we knew about it, we would lead whatever it is right to it. But we don't, Charlie said while taking a sip of coffee. Not yet we don't, I explained after I finished my omelette. But we're going to change that. How? Liam asked. We just stopped by Ashley's house for a visit. Ashley was Tim's ex-girlfriend. They had an on-again, off-again relationship for years before it ended for the final time about a month before he died. She lived in an elegant condominium outside the city. I always liked her, and she very nicely agreed to see us. I'll get straight to the point, I said to Ashley once she let us in. We think Tim's death was no accident, and we're all being followed. And we wanted to know if you knew anything that might help us. She sat there quietly for a moment before she brushed a strand of her hair away from her eyes and turned to face me. I suspect the same thing, Ashley whispered. And I wish I could say I was surprised. No one's following me, but then again, whoever is behind it knows I wasn't involved and don't have anything. What do you know, Ashley? Charlie asked. You know how it is when even when you break up with someone, you know what's going on with them because of mutual friends. Not long before his death, I heard that Tim had gotten some new valuable, very rare. I don't know what it is specifically, just that it was some kind of statue, and he had picked it up while he was in Europe from some rare art dealer. But here's what's really interesting. I've kept in touch with the same mutual friends, and no one's found any statue since he died. So either it's been hidden somewhere, or someone took it. I suspect the former, hence why you're all being watched. Interesting idea, I nodded. Do you have any idea where it would be? No, but I know you'll find it. Valuable things always turn up sooner or later. That they do, I agreed. Thank you, Ashley. Wait, she said. None of us moved while she sat there quietly, clearly wrestling with something. Eventually, Ashley took a deep breath. I know I said that no one's been following me, but that doesn't mean nothing strange has happened. About a week before Tim died, I was looking out my sliding glass door where it looks down on the park. I was just about to get up and go get something out of the fridge when I looked over and saw something looking up at me. I only saw it for a moment, and this is going to sound insane, but I swear, I saw a wolf looking up at me. And it was a big one too, just sitting there near the light post. But then I blinked, and it was gone. I never saw it again, but it was the only other odd thing that happened to me recently. We understand. Thank you for telling us. Please let us know if you think of anything else. I will. Good luck. We left Ashley's and went to a local coffee shop to sit around and think. We bounced ideas back and forth about an hour before Liam suddenly sat upright in his chair. The studio. He blurted out. The studio? I asked. 
the recording studio that Tim owned near his house where he would occasionally work. There's soundproofing there and plenty of places to hide things, and no one would ever think to look there. I felt like the rug had been pulled out from under me as I thought it over. It was a good idea. Well done, Liam. Charlie slapped him on the back. Well done indeed. I agreed. Let's go. I looked up the recording studio on the way over. It had been a studio for a long time, but before it had used to be a bar going back to the days of Prohibition. That made me think that there was probably hidden tunnels or something there. Definitely a good place to hide something. Liam, Charlie, and Leland had keys, so getting in was easy enough. As I expected, the recording studio itself was in the basement. The layout was typical, if a bit older and dated. Once we were inside, we all walked to the recording booth and stepped inside. I knew from the layout of the place that there was a secret passage in here. Access would be somewhere inside the basement. So I started looking around for anything out of the ordinary. When I pressed against a panel of the soundproof wall, I felt something. So I examined further. I found a panel in the wall. When I pressed on it, a small door opened in the wall. The four of us looked at each other briefly before we stepped inside closed the door that had hidden it and looked around. It was nothing special, just a long walkway that was empty aside from dust and cobwebs. Then, without saying a word, we all followed the passage, which we all followed for about a mile until it opened up in front of a plain wooden door. I took a deep breath and gently pushed on the doorframe. It opened with a creak and I found myself standing in a neatly organized office. The door to the passage had been sealed behind a bookcase, which was situated amongst others that filled one of the office walls. When I saw the glass desk, the fireplace, and some awards, I realized immediately where we were. Tim's study. In his house. That meant he had probably taken the passage to the recording studio on several occasions. Who wouldn't? Okay, Liam said after a moment. If what we are looking for is still out there, it should be here. I agreed. But before anyone could say anything else, there was the sound of the front door opening on the first floor. Leland and I briefly glanced over the balcony and saw two men dressed casually enter the house. Panic shot through my body as I frantically tried to think of what to do. I quickly decided to go right back into the passage, and the others saw no reason to try anything else. So they followed me without hesitation. Once we were all inside, I quietly closed the bookcase-covered door and we waited in silence. I listened intently for any sort of sound or clue to what was going on. I tried to ignore the wave of fear that shot through my stomach, and one look at the others told me that they felt the same way. After what felt like an eternity, I could hear footsteps nearby. Then the sounds of the two men rustling through the office and looking for who knows what. The steps were slow, steady, and deliberate. This wasn't the frantic searching of someone in a hurry. Then the footsteps got eerily close to the passage's entrance, and I held my breath. I could feel the presence on the other side. There was no other sounds, no other signs anything was going on. For all I knew, the two strangers were staring at the bookshelf right on the other side, studying it. Any luck? One of them asked. No. Any leads from his former associates? None. We're not even sure where they are. They'll turn up. Just keep looking. We know it's not here. We've searched everywhere. We need to get it before the full moon. The speaker hissed. I know. The other voice snarled back. You think I can forget that? It's literally impossible for us to forget the full moon. 
and it never gets any easier, no matter how many times it happens. Then there was more silence. All we could do was stand there as whoever was lurking just a few feet away stood there. Then I finally heard both pairs of footsteps heading back downstairs before there was the faint thud of a door closing. Moments after that, I heard a car start and pull away. I took a deep breath of relief. Then I waited a moment before I opened the door to the office back up and we all took some deep breaths to relax. Once the adrenaline had tapered off, I looked at the three of them. They claimed nothing was here, but that only means they believe nothing is here. Right, Liam nodded. We know Tim. We know here is the most logical place he would keep something, but he'd be smart about it. So we split up and began searching the house. Tim always did have an enormous appreciation for all types of art, be it music, painting, or cinema, and the house was a reminder of that. Everywhere you look, there was some painting, photo, or antique. But the next question was where would a priceless item everyone wanted be kept? I passed the home theater and came to a stretch of wall that contained a massive fish tank that went from floor to ceiling. I had been past it before when it was brightly illuminated, but now it just sat there, dark and silent. I looked at it again with more interest. The fish tank would be an amazing place to hide something, as literally no one would think to look there. Plus, it would typically be hidden by the water and whatever was swimming in there. Come here, check this out. I called out to the other three. They wandered over to where I was, and I pointed to the fish tank. They looked at it without saying a word, but I could see they were thinking that I was on to something. So how do we get inside, aside from cracking it open? Leland asked. Something that big has to have a door or something. Because someone has to clean it, we just have to find where it is, Liam said. Good point. So we all tried to find the aquarium's door. After a few minutes, we found it behind the door to the bathroom. It looked like any other door in the house, and after carefully testing it, I gingerly opened it. It opened just like any other door, and when I flipped the light on, we were facing a big open space. It was completely empty, and after we paced around it and looked around, there was no sign something valuable might be hidden in there. So we walked back out and switched the light off. Then we all walked to the sitting room and sat down. It was a good thought, Perry, Charlie said. It really was, Liam agreed. Thanks, but if it wasn't there, where is it? We all sat there in silence for a few minutes. I took the time to relax in the chair, which was quite comfortable. I eventually peered out the nearby floor to ceiling window, which looked out over Tim's backyard. That's when I sat upright in the chair. What is that? I pointed to something that looked like a pond near the back. I'd been in Tim's house before, but it had been a few years, and whatever that thing was, it was new. Or at least, it was new to me. Liam looked out the window where I pointed. Oh, that's the crocodile pen. I looked at him in shock. What? The crocodile pen. Tim got a few crocodiles several years back and made a special enclosure for them. Top of the line, like something out of the zoo. Tim's manager had someone occasionally come in and make sure they were taken care of for the time being. Then he looked at me in shock. You don't think? I do. I nodded my head quickly. I absolutely do. Let's go. All four of us immediately headed outside. Once we made sure to leave the back door propped open and unlocked, we trekked across the backyard past the swimming pool, and arrived at the crocodile pen. It was enclosed in a building with a roof and well-maintained, 
Walls cordoned off the pen, which was filled with rocks and water so that no crocodile could get out, and no one could get in unless you really wanted to. When I noticed the light switch, I flipped it on, and lights came on inside the pen. Now you could really see how well designed it was. Plenty of water and land for the crocodiles, which we could now all see. There was five of them, and they were massive. Three of them were laying close together on a bank of land. One was sitting on some rocks near the water, while the final one was in the water, its eyes barely visible. But I could feel them watching us, and somehow, I could feel something was in there. Okay, so where would something be hidden? I asked. I got something that could help us. Leland said as he took off the small backpack he had been carrying, and I had thought nothing of it before. I had been using this to see if I could find out who's been following us. Never had any luck. Maybe now it'll be more useful. He held up a small drone. I wasn't surprised. Leland was always the gadget and technology fan in the group. We all waited while he got the drone ready. And once everything was set up, he got it up and into the pen. The crocodiles watched as it carefully hovered over their area, carefully scoping the area out while we all watched from the camera's feed. I think I found something, Leland said a moment before we all saw what he meant. On top of a tall column of rocks that was about four feet tall, the top contained a large rock that wasn't like the others, as it looked as if it had just been placed there, as opposed to just being cemented in place. Good find, I nodded. Now the next part. How do we get it? We just give the crocodiles plenty of food to feed on while two of us go to investigate, Charlie said. And where do we get the food? Charlie chuckled and held up his phone. We just order it. It is the modern era. We all immediately placed orders for some food. Since we all already knew Tim's address, we told them exactly where to go, and all we had to do was sit and wait. Once all the food we had ordered arrived, and we paid for it in addition with giving the people who delivered it generous tips, we gathered it up and took it to the backyard. The minute we arrived with the food, you could feel something shift in the air. The crocodiles moved slightly as they could smell it. It was an eerie feeling. Charlie and Liam got into position as we discussed while we waited. While Leland and I kept an eye on the crocodiles and distracted them using the food and the drone if need be, Charlie and Liam would get inside and see what was under the rock. Hey, hey there, I called out from the right corner of the pen. Over here, I called to one of the crocodiles while I tossed him some chicken. The crocodile immediately opened wide and swallowed it whole. Then the crocodile slowly lumbered towards me while the others were paying attention. That's right, come over here. Leland repeated my gesture with some fish while we slowly lured them towards the area that was the farthest away from the stack of rocks. Fortunately, the area Liam and Charlie needed to explore was on the far left side of the pen, so we simply had to keep the crocodiles distracted and on the other side. My heart was pounding in my chest as Leland and I made plenty of noise and lured the crocodiles while Liam and Charlie climbed over the wall and carefully walked to the column made of rocks. Step right up, come get some food! I kept yelling while I hurled pieces of chicken and fish to the crocodiles, who by now had gathered on the other side of the wall, and were watching us intently and jumping in the air as we tossed the food at them. Inside I was screaming for Liam and Charlie to hurry up, and I watched out of the corner of my eye, as they removed the top rock and took out a small metal case. Leland and I exchanged a small nod as we kept up the motion, 
making sure to make plenty of noise as we kept tossing food to the crocodiles. Time seemed to take a painfully long time as Liam and the Case and Charlie followed carefully behind as they walked across the pen and carefully tried to climb out. When one of the crocodiles turned and saw the two of them and stared for a moment, I felt my throat tighten before I immediately lobbed a massive amount of chicken into the pen. Without missing a beat, the crocodile caught it and ripped it apart in moments. But by now, Charlie and Liam were safely out of there. The two of them immediately collapsed on the grass with exhaustion, the metal case lying beside them. I don't blame them one bit, as I was exhausted from just my small part. Once we finished going through the stuff we had brought, and the crocodiles were lying there contently, I turned the light off and we took the case inside. But then one of the crocodiles moved on the edge of the water and there was a splash. When that happened, something hidden in the water came to the surface. At first, I thought it was a piece of chicken that wasn't eaten. But then I realized what I was looking at and felt like I was about to be sick. It was an unnaturally pale human arm attached to what looked to be a human torso. Or more specifically... It looked like what was left of a human torso after numerous bites and claw marks. Do you see that? I managed to say. The others slowly looked at where I was pointing. Is that? Liam began. I quickly nodded my head. Let's get out of here. Charlie whispered. We'll discuss this later. He didn't need to tell us twice because we sprinted out of there and back into the house. That's the most frightening thing I have ever done in a while, Liam panted once we were sitting down. And that was before the whole body being found in the water thing. No kidding, I nodded. That's why you should do the honors and open it. They didn't need any more prompting from us, because Liam and Charlie carefully opened the metal case, and moments later... We were staring at a small statue of a wolf that was made of gold. The wolf was in a howling pose. It shimmered in the dim light we were sitting in, and it was decorated with diamonds and rubies. But while it was beautiful, it was also somehow unnerving. Like something about it was off. Either way, I knew this was what the people following us wanted. As I looked at the statue... The quote about the full moon returning to my mind. Acting almost on autopilot, I took out my phone and looked up the lunar calendar. My stomach clenched when I saw that Tim's accident had taken place on a full moon. Since I had no idea what that meant or what to do with it, I kept the information to myself. Okay, so we found this. What do we do now? Leland asked. And what do we do with what we found in the pen besides the statue? I thought about this while we were waiting. We know these people are watching us, right? So why don't we just leave a note for them at our respective properties about where this is, and that they could just have it as long as they leave us alone? As to the other thing, I propose we call the cops, claim that we were here for another reason, and report it. That's actually not a bad idea, Charlie nodded. But where do we leave it? Why not here? I gestured around. We already know that they could get in and out of here. So we just leave it on the dining room table, leave a note saying, Tim's table at all of our houses, and it's theirs. The three of them agreed. We left the statue on the dining room table before leaving through the office passageway. Then once we finally got back to our respective cars, we called it a night and went back to our homes. Once I got back inside, I scribbled a brief note saying, It's on Tim's table. Then I put it outside my front gate, texted the others that I had done it, and got similar responses, then I went to bed. 
I got up the next morning and had my usual breakfast. As I left for an appointment I had, I saw that my note was gone. But as I looked, I saw that there were faint scratches where the note had been. Long scratches, like claw marks. I told the others this, and they all confirmed that the same thing had happened to them. Over the next few days, it was clear that whoever had been in our mist was gone. The feeling of unease had lifted for everyone, and that was it. As to what we found in the pond, the police arrived and searched the whole place. Along with the arm and torso, they found everything else besides a head. But things got really weird when they did the autopsy. According to the coroner, along with numerous animal experts, the claw and bite marks that covered the body and resulted in the limbs being removed were not made by a crocodile. In fact, there was no sign of any of them had ever gone near it. They said the markings were made by a large canine, and that was it. The body was eventually matched up with the missing persons case on the other side of the country, but there was never any leads as to who put it there and why. Despite our experience, I had no desire to act like we were all old friends again. I even made sure that they kept their promise and sent them each a bill for my services that night. They all paid in full and on time. After that was done, I had plenty to do, and I trusted they did as well. Besides, we'll always have the story of what happened, and in the end, isn't that what it's all about? I've worked for the CIA for the last 20 years. My jobs vary, ranging from torture to weapons smuggling to chemical weapons manufacturing. When an insurgency begins in a hostile country, like Syria or Libya, my job sometimes requires me to traffic in guns, ammo, and money. So I had seen a lot of things and I felt a sense of relief when I was told that, from now on, I would only have to work within the United States. When my superior, Agent White, called me to his office one hot summer morning last year, I went right away. Sit down, Agent Black, he said to me, motioning to the chair across the desk. Do you want coffee or anything? Sure, I said, and he called his secretary to bring us both coffees. She hustled in, dropping the steaming hot cups in front of us and leaving immediately without a word. So, he said, we've been hearing a lot of chatter lately about the Chinese starting a mind control program. I nearly choked on my coffee when he said that. That stuff is all bullcrap, sir, I said dryly. You know it and I know it. The CIA tried that in the 60s, and they had no results. MK Ultra, MK Often, and Chickwit already covered that ground unsuccessfully, I might add. He smiled slightly at this. They had no results that they publicized, you mean, he said. The truth is slightly more nuanced. MK Ultra was not run with the kind of scientific vigor that we would bring to a modern experiment, however. They were basically just dosing people with huge doses of LSD or injecting them with amphetamines and barbiturates until they became drooling idiots. This is not the experiment we were interested in funding. So what is? I asked, genuinely curious. We want to see whether certain people can see the future, keeping them under controlled, scientific confinement and the process to rule out any kind of fraud. Also, we want to see if the psychics can see military secrets in the present. 
secrets that we don't currently have access to. Any advances and in interrogation techniques achieved from this use of new drugs would also be funded. We are particularly interested in the potential of Bromo Dragonfly and Alpha PVP and test subjects. Both have caused nightmarish hallucinations in people accompanied by visions of hell, which could be useful for getting hardened subjects to talk. He paused for a long moment after this, looking thoughtful. And psychic research, of course. I scuffed. Psychics? I said scornfully. Like from the circus? Are we bringing in tarot card readers too? He laughed. Sure, why not? He said, handing me a slip of paper. Report here tomorrow morning. It will be your first day with the researchers. We've decided to call it Operation Raven. I went to the address written in Agent White's tiny copper plate handwriting. By the time I pulled up to the front gate, the sun had just started to rise. I'd always liked getting an early start. Two armed guards sat at a booth a red and white striped metal gate blocking the way inside. Behind them, I saw massive brown buildings with no windows. The architecture looked brutalist. The buildings stood tall and imposing, forming perfect cubes of smooth concrete surrounded by row after row of razor wire. Identification? A guard said, coming up to the window and pulling out his left hand. He kept the other near his holstered pistol. I opened my wallet and flashed my CIA credentials. After staring at it for a long moment, he nodded, going back to the booth and allowing the thick metal gates to slide open. I had never been in here before, and I was amazed by how many cars filled the parking lot. Hundreds of them stretched out in front of my eyes and I drove around for five minutes before finding an empty spot towards the back. As I started the trek towards the door, I felt like eyes watched me from all directions. I signed in again at the front desk of the complex. An armed security guard eyed me mistrustfully as I pulled out my identification and badge. When I told him who I was and what I was doing there, he said to take the elevator to the bottom floor, then pretended to go back to reading his newspaper. Behind the rustling edges, though, I caught him glimpsing everyone that walked past with a soldierly intensity, ready to react at a moment's notice. I got in, seeing the building went all the way from negative five to five. I pressed the bottom for negative five. Feeling the elevator quickly descending, my stomach rising with the motion. When it dinged and the doors rolled open, I found myself standing in front of a large laboratory. A team of doctors, scientists, and lab workers stood 20 feet away, forming a semicircle around the steaming hot coffee pot in the corner. They discussed something in hushed tones and when they saw me approaching, they all went silent. Hello, I said calmly, stepping forward. I'm Agent Philip Black. The director sent me here to look at your work. A female doctor stepped forward. Even though I towered over her five-foot frame, she exhibited a kind of self-confidence that made her seem larger. Her black hair framed her thin face and her eyes gleamed with intelligence. She smiled, showing straight white teeth. Her stylish glasses reflected the bright fluorescent lights overhead. Nice to finally put a face with the fake name, she said, grinning. My name is Dr. Lander. I didn't react, simply looking around at the chemistry equipment and computer setup. Where do we keep the subjects? I asked. She nodded at a narrow hallway at the far end of the large laboratory. I'd like to see them. 
You could see them all you want, Dr. Lander responded. But we're about to start an experiment. Perhaps it would be better if you saw our research firsthand before talking to the subjects. Things will make more sense, I think, if you watch. Sure, I said, tearing my gaze away from the narrow hallway. It seemed to beckon me, cool and dark in the corner. I suddenly felt very hot, and the light seemed too bright overhead. Dr. Lander turned and headed towards a room in the corner. I saw a chair welded to the floor with straps hanging down from both sides. A bag of saline and a syringe filled with blue fluids stood on the metal tray next to a box of latex gloves. Two lab assistants stood at attention, one on either side of the chair. Dr. Landon chatted with one as we waited for the guards to bring the man in. This stuff, Alpha PVP, they call it Flocka on the streets, she said to the assistant. In some subjects, it has caused visions of demons and hellfire. I think this is the same stuff that caused someone to eat another guy's face with his bare teeth. We could also use amphetamine psychosis and weakening the subject's will for interrogations. But the problem is they start to get delusional in their information. I stopped listening as the two black suit officers brought in a very hairy man. He was stout, barrel chested and only about five foot six. But his arms and legs looked like tree trunks covered in thick black hair. He had a unibrow and his eyes looked nearly black. A massive wizard beard hung down to his belly button. He wore a bright orange prison jumpsuit. This is kidnapping, he said in a thick Eastern European accent. You can't just come and tie people up like this and take them out of their homes. Dr. Lander ignored his outburst. Instead, turning to me and the assistants as the guards strapped the man down to the chair. She raised the syringe filled with the blue liquid so we could all see it. Now this here is a special combination of drugs we thought might be a good starting point. It is a combination of potent hallucinogens, including LSD-25, ALD-52, Bromo Dragonfly, and the more potent purified isomer of Alpha PVP. We will be feeding the substances intravenously to the subject during interrogation and observing his reaction. Are there any questions? F you, American pig, the man said in the chair. The doctor ignored him. That's not a question, I said, trying to break the tension. No one laughed. Okay, so let's start by running the solution then. For the recording, this is subject 102202, Vladimir Greca. She nodded at the lab assistant who stood next to the IV line feeding into the man's arm. Go ahead. The lab assistant, a thin man with large glasses and a balding hairline, took the syringe and gently screwed it into the plastic tubing taped off to the man's arm. The blue fluid mixed with the clear saline as it fed into the man's veins, the dark cyanotic color lightening as it went. The subject, Vladimir, continued the hiss and scream at the doctor and her assistants. His eyes met mine, and I noticed they looked rather strange. When I first saw him, I remember thinking about how dark his eyes looked. But now the iris had turned a muddy yellow, like a tiger's eye gemstone. His scowl had turned into a grin, and his teeth appeared to sharpen and lengthen. They looked dark and stained, with the serrated points covered in a thick yellow film. Where were you during the massacre of your family on April 10th in 2022? Dr. Lander asked Vladimir. His muscles seemed to grow before my eyes, ripping through his clothes. He gnashed his teeth as foamy saliva dripped from his mouth. 
She sighed. Okay, prepare round two of the drug combination on my... I was with my family, of course, you stupid bitch. Vladimir said, his voice deepening and turning into a growl. The black hair on his body looked like it had grown, and even his hands and face were now covered. I had changed. I was hungry. So hungry. They tried running through the forest, but I could see far better in the darkness than they could. I took them one by one, ripping them apart as they screamed and begged for mercy. That was my own wife and three daughters. He leaned forwards in his chair as claws sprouted from his fingers as white as ivory and as sharp as scalpels. So what do you think I'm going to do to you when I get out of this goddamn chair? With a roar, the beast in the chair pulled against the straps. For a few moments, it looked like they would hold. And then, with a ripping noise, they all gave way at once. The man had fully transformed into a wolfish abomination, and silver streams of saliva ran from his grinning mouth. Code Silver! Cold Silver! Dr. Landon screamed as she began the run towards the door. The thin male lab assistant stood there, quivering and trembling, the bald spot on his head turning a bright red. The other assistant, a young blonde woman, sprinted past me. I stood there shocked for a moment, not knowing what to do. But my instinct screamed at me to stay with Dr. Lander. Without waiting to see what would happen, I turned and started sprinting for the door. Shut the door! Shut the door! Dr. Landon cried as the three of us ran out of the room. I looked at the heavy steel door with its shatterproof glass window. What about your assistant? I said. She shook her head. It's too late. He's already dead. Close the door before it gets out. She shoved me aside as her and the blonde assistant each grabbed an edge. With a groan, they slammed it closed. Dr. Lander bent over double, hyperventilating. She looked up at her assistant. Good job, Casey. Quick thinking. I looked in the window pane and saw the male assistant running towards the door, covered in blood. He definitely was not already dead. It gave Dr. Lander a skewed, mistrustful look. Let me out, please! The assistant pleaded as he slammed his bloody fist against the small window. With glowing yellow eyes and greasy black fur covering every inch of his body, Vladimir looked like something straight out of a medieval textbook on occultism. He leapt high into the air and came down on the assistant's back, clawing and gnawing his teeth as shreds of fabric and drops of blood flew everywhere. Dr. Lander stared into the room, her eyes as emotionless as that of a marble statue. The blonde assistant shifted nervously from foot to foot, her face flickering from Dr. Lander to the window and back again. Aren't we going to help? Casey, the blonde assistant, asked. A moment later, the wall shook as the werewolf slammed into the male assistant again, knocking him to the floor. I saw the assistant smear his own blood all across the white walls as he tried to crawl away from the beast, holding one side of his neck with his left hand. Bright red blood spurted between his fingers and soaked his lab coat. The beast jumped and flew across the room. The assistant twisted his body so that he was laying on his back, putting his arms out in a defense posture. In a blur... The werewolf landed back on top of the prone man. It began clawing at his chest and face as the assistant put his hands up and shielded his eyes. I saw its claws slice through his fingers like a sharp knife through hot butter. The four digits fell to the side, the man's spurting hands still raised high in the air as he laid on the ground. 
I heard his gurgling breaths as he began choking on his blood. I heard Casey gasp and suppress a cry of horror as she watched the final moments of the brutal attack. In a show of mercy, the beast knelt down and placed his ivory white teeth over the male assistant's throat. Then he bit deeply into the man's neck and, with a sickening spray of blood and a ripping sound, finally killed the poor bastard. Well, that was a massive failure, I said spitefully as we walked away from the gruesome murder scene. Why would you say that? Dr. Lander asked politely, her large brown eyes turning to regard me. I mean, your guy is definitely dead, I responded. Is that not a problem? Do you go through assistance like toilet paper? Sometimes to make an omelet, you have to crack a few eggs, right? Dr. Lander answered, smirking. Casey was sweating heavily and shifted uncomfortably from leg to leg. I think she may have been reassessing her career choice at that moment. That was actually the most information we had gotten out of Vladimir so far. Normally, he just blacks out when the topic of his family is brought up. So the hallucinogenic drug mixture is already exceeding expectations. I think we need to try it again on a few more people. But anyways, we have another experiment planned within a few minutes. We'll put a pin in this for now. The werewolf continued to shred the dead body in the interrogation room behind us. I heard bones cracking and ripping, squelching sounds. I hope the next one isn't so... wet, I inquired. Dr. Lander only gave me a cryptic half-smile. Once the notice for cold silver got relayed to the ground floor, chaos broke out. A team of men in bulletproof vests and military gear came running out of the elevator, heading in the direction of the interrogation room. I saw they carried special long-barreled tranquilizer guns rather than automatic rifles. What do you use to put down a werewolf? I asked, genuinely curious. I watched as one soldier flung open the door and a few others stuck their guns in. I heard soft popping sounds as they fired. Within seconds, they pulled them back out and the door slammed shut again. Oh, it's a special blend we developed here, she said. Normal tranquilizers won't work on them. A super potent opioid like etorphine that would take down an elephant just slows them down. So we use a combination of etorphine, carfentanil, and fencyclidine. Even that is sometimes iffy, and it takes a massive dose just to sedate them. They have a very strange neuropharmacology compared to normal animals. For some reason, they're highly susceptible to synergistic effects from NMDA antagonists, yet a pure opioid agonist has little effect. Yeah, I really don't know what that means, I said. We came to another cell with a clear plexiglass shield covering the entire front entrance. I peered through, wondering what other oddities laid down here in the heart of Operation Raven. I looked back down the steel reinforced halls just in time to see three men in SWAT gear dragging Vladimir's uncautious body along the floor. He had partially returned to his human state. He now looked more like a Neanderthal covered in thick black hair, his strange claws fused to the stubs of his fingers. His face was saturated with coagulated blood. Pieces of gore and shredded skin stuck to the entire front of his now naked body. Remnants of his orange jumpsuit littered the hall, small pieces of bloody cloth falling to the sides as they pulled him by the arms towards another nearby metal cell with a bulletproof glass front. Okay, our second experiment for the day is a little different, Dr. Lander said as she stepped in front of another cell. Looking down the hallway, 
I saw that each of the rooms on both sides had prisoners. Most were men, but I saw some women and even a few children locked behind the glass walls. I estimated that at least 50 people must live here as subjects in hellish experiments. Dr. Lander pointed at a woman laying on her steel bed. Her face turned away from us towards the wall. I saw a few photos on the walls, mostly pictures of small children grinning for the camera in their best clothing. Mrs. Weber, Dr. Lander said politely, her light voice echoing off the cold metal and concrete walls of the building. Can we please talk to you? The woman continued to ignore us. Okay, well, we're coming in. You know the rules. Dr. Lander nodded at Casey, who quickly took a massive ring of keys out of her pocket. With a click, she turned the lock in the ballistic glass front. The clear glass door slid to the side. I looked down the hall and saw a couple armed guards watching us with consternation. They're probably afraid of another Code Silver, I thought to myself as I entered the cell. This is Subject 171041, Mary Weber for the recording. Dr. Lander began. Mrs. Weber, still just staring at her wall, refused to talk or turn her body. All I could see of her was her auburn hair and an orange prison jumpsuit. I wondered if she was dead, or perhaps in a deep catatonic state, like some schizophrenic's experience. What's the point of this? I asked in a low voice to Dr. Lander. Can this woman even talk? Yes, she is physically capable of speech, Dr. Lander said, which didn't seem like an answer to the question. We just have to get it out of her. What are we testing? I asked. Psychic research, she answered. Mrs. Weber here is capable of seeing events occurring in other parts of the world. Remote viewing, I believe they call it. Her powers extend beyond that, but I'd like to see if we could get any results on smaller details before moving on to larger ones. Dr. Lander turned away from me towards Casey. Okay, let's flip her over. Mrs. Weber, we're going to move you so that we could have access to you during the experiment. She nodded at Casey, and with a grunt, they spun Miss Weber around to face us. When I saw her face, I gasped. Her eyes shone a bright red without pupil or iris. Covered in a film of blood, they looked demonic, vampiric even. Yet the blood, if that's what it was, didn't overflow. No crimson tears flowed down her face or stained her eyelids. She didn't look old, perhaps in her late thirties. She might have been pretty in her own way, autumn hair and creamy white skin. Yet the bloody demon eyes and blank expression on her face ruined whatever beauty she possessed. Mrs. Weber, if you ever want to see your family again, you have to cooperate with us. Dr. Lander said, her tone cold. I thought the use of the word see in politic under the circumstances. When Mrs. Weber's face continued to show as much expression as a statue's, Dr. Lander turned to the assistant. Please give the injection. Casey took a needle out of her pocket. It had a colorless liquid inside of it. Is this stuff similar to the last experiment? I asked nervously, taking a step back. LAD whatever and Alpha PCP? Casey lifted the plastic tubing taped into one of Mrs. Weber's veins and began injecting the drug before pulling out a saline syringe to flush the line. She exhibited a degree of nonchalance I could only characterize as outstanding, especially for someone whose work partner just got murdered by a werewolf a few moments ago. This stuff is a new experimental substance, Dr. Lander said proudly. 
we have had some results using it on people with latent psychic powers. You won't find this on the streets. What is it? I asked nervously. She paused for a long moment, as if lost in thought. You know what DMT or dimethyltryptamine is? It occurs naturally in the brain, and it also causes out-of-body experiences and mystical experiences in most people. Of course I know what DMT is, I said. You know when the Soviets did their own version of MK Ultra back in the day? They mostly used DMT instead of LSD. Well, this stuff makes DMT look like ginger beer, she said confidently. The lab used DMT as a starting point, but with tweaks of chemistry, we found something far stronger. She pulled out a clear sealed vial and threw it to me with an underhand toss. I read the label carefully. 4 Flora Ho DMT, it read. Experimental drug, not approved by the FDA or DEA, not for human consumption. I gave it back, and she tucked it into a random lab coat. I looked back over at Mrs. Weber and gasped. Translucent white light flowed out from her body, from every pore on her skin and every hair. It circulated over her like water, flowing and reforming. Her mouth formed an O of horror and fear, a silent scream dying in that gaping black hole. Casey stood next to the woman, her eyes wide as she backed up a couple steps. She looked like she wanted to turn and run. I think we've just turned the lights on, Dr. Lander said. And now it's time to see if anyone's home. She checked her watch, counting down the seconds. After about 30 seconds, she sighed, turning to Casey. Give her another dose, please. Casey seemed to grow paler, but she took another syringe filled with the clear liquid and began to inject it into the line. By the time she had flushed the last of the substance out of the line with saline, the light swirling around Mrs. Weber had become blinding. She suddenly sat up on her thin mattress, her face still formed into a silent scream. Her fingers began to twitch, her arms jerked, then her face smoothed into a placid statue expression. Her head slowly turned until she was staring directly at me with those blood-red, sickly eyes. Whatever you do, don't touch her. A voice said from behind me, sounding like it came from far away. I felt like I was drifting off as I stared into her eyes. I realized I was becoming hypnotized. A hand on my shoulder ripped me back to reality. I spun backing up into a metal wall. And don't stare into her eyes. I looked and saw Casey standing there, a look of empathy on her young face. Mrs. Weber, I'm going to ask you a few questions, okay? Dr. Lander said in a falsely cheerful voice. Mrs. Weber's mannequin-like face turned to stare at Dr. Lander blankly. But Dr. Lander didn't return the stare. What is your full name? I didn't think she would answer, but after a moment, she did. Mary Louise Weber. She whispered in a blank robotic tone. Okay, good, she said, writing something on a clipboard. And do you have knowledge of things happening outside this cell at this moment? Yes, Mrs. Weber said simply. I can see all of it. Give me an example, Dr. Lander pressed. I know you haven't changed your underwear in two days, Mrs. Weber said. Does that suffice? Dr. Lander scratched something down on a clipboard. That's technically something inside this room. 
Dr. Lander said unperturbed. Can you tell me something happening in China right now? Xi Jinping is discussing three potential Taiwan invasion strategies with his staff, Mrs. Weber said. They want the invasion to start by 2025 at the latest. Does that count? Dr. Lander scribbled something, frantically writing out a much longer response on her clipboard than any of the other answers elicited. And Mrs. Weber, do you know why you're here? Because I killed a school full of children, she droned. They told me 70 of them died. Dr. Lander made a few quick scratches on her clipboard. And do you know how you killed them? Dr. Lander asked. The floor vibrated, as if an aftershock had passed underneath our feet. I looked worried at Dr. Lander, but she didn't respond. Mrs. Weber's face formed into a wide smile. It reminded me of the death mask of a tetanus patient, an insane rictus grin that showed no compassion. Slowly, she said, drawing the word out. Like I'm about to do to you. As she finished speaking, the light around her body expanded into a blinding flash. I backed up towards the door instinctively. I saw Casey doing the same. Once the light had cleared, Dr. Lander still stood there, but she wasn't alone with Mrs. Weber anymore. Thousands of writhing black spiders began appearing and falling off her body, like a bubbling stream overflowing its banks. Dr. Lander looked down in astonishment for a fraction of a second before turning to run. The stream of crawling predators swarmed around her, however, running up her sneakers and legs. I saw large brown lacluses covering her chest and countless tiny black widows sneaking into her clothing. She began to shriek in horror and pain. Close the damn door! I screamed. Casey and I both started pushing on the sliding glass door as spiders swarmed towards us. A few crossed the threshold, and a rising sense of panic began to overtake me. Then, with the bang, it flew shut, slicing some of the large brown lacluses in half. A small stream of the few black widows skittered towards my shoes, but I began stomping them, seeing their tiny bodies squishing onto the concrete floor below. Next to me, I heard Casey breathing hard, muttering some incomprehensible prayer. I looked back in the cell and saw Dr. Lander stumbling around, a sprinting human pillar of spiders. They swarmed in her mouth, in her ears and eyes and nose, biting, skittering, and jumping all over her body. She shrieked over and over, trying to pull them out of her mouth and nose, trying to smash her body against the wall to kill them. But after a few more seconds of countless bites, her voice began to give out. She tried to walk towards the door, putting her arms out towards us, then stumbled and fell. Her arms and legs still twitched as she died on the cold floor below us. We better call a code black for this, Casey said regretfully. Yeah, yeah, you're right, I said. I'm sure the guards will love this one. Casey shrugged. They're used to it, she said. This project is going to need a lot of work, I said, turning to face Casey. Do you still want to be a part of Operation Raven after all this? As long as you're in charge... She said, smiling. Always.